So the first algorithm I want to cover is Cadane's algorithm. I'm actually not sure how it's pronounced because I've only ever seen it written before, but it's named after a person. And while this algorithm is definitely not a hard algorithm, especially compared to the other algorithms we're going to look at in this course, it's such a fundamental and important algorithm because there's so many things that we can learn from it. And that's really what I'm gonna be focusing on. This algorithm has a lot of overlap with a lot of other algorithms that we're gonna look at in this course, particularly two pointers and sliding window. And it's also technically a dynamic programming and greedy algorithm. The problem is that we're given an array of integers. They could be positive or they could be negative. And in this case, we want to return a non-empty subarray from this entire array that has the largest sum possible. Now, what if we actually had all negative values? What if all of these were negative? What would the answer in that case be? Would we just return an empty array? Well, first of all, we're going to return the largest sum. We're not actually returning the subarray itself. We're returning the sum. But what would the largest sum in this case be? Would we just say zero? Well, this variation, we are looking for a non-empty subarray. So if we had all negative numbers, we can't return zero. We would just return the value that is the largest. It's still a negative value, but it's the largest. So we would, in this case, return negative one. That would be the largest sum. If we try to make the subarray any bigger, then our number is just gonna become even more negative. And we're trying to get the largest sum, even if it happens to be a negative number. And just to clarify, when we say subarray, that's by definition a contiguous subarray. This does not count as a subarray. It has to be contiguous. We can't just have a hole like that. So now that we actually understand the problem, let's try to look at some solutions. When you can't come up with a solution, the easiest thing to do is think of the brute force solution. To find the subarray with the largest sum, let's just go through every single possible subarray and keep track of what the largest sum we calculated was. And then once we've gone through every single subarray, we can return that result. And the way to do that is basically get every single subarray starting at the first position. So this is one subarray, this is another subarray, this is another subarray, and keep doing that starting at this first position and keep track of the sum. To get every subarray starting at the first position is going to be O of N, where N is the size of the array. And then to do the same exact thing starting at the second position, it would also be big O of N. And we of course would have to do that starting at every single position in the array. So the time complexity is gonna be N times N, which is gonna be N squared. The code for that would look something like this. Not super fancy. We're given an input array nums, which is this in this case. We keep track of what the max sum is so far. Now I initialize that to be the first element because remember, we can't have a non-empty subarray. If we could have an empty subarray, the sum of an empty subarray is zero. So that's what I would initialize the max sum to. But in this case, we can't. So I'm just taking some arbitrary subarray. In this case, the simplest thing to do is just take the first element and assign it to the max sum. Sometimes people will also set this to a default value of, let's say, negative infinity or whatever the minimum integer is in the language that you're using. We would set it to a really negative number because we're trying to find the max. So the first element we would look at in the array would end up being larger than negative infinity. And then max sum would end up getting reassigned at that point. Also, it's worth mentioning, in this case, I'm assuming that the input array is non-empty. If it was empty, we would not be able to do this. In that case, we would immediately return or maybe throw an exception because we're, our goal is to find a non-empty subarray. If we're given an empty subarray, that would be impossible. These are just some edge cases that I think can sometimes be important when you're discussing things with your interviewer. But back to the algorithm, essentially we're going to have two pointers. I is going to be the starting pointer. So starting at this position with our I pointer and J would then also start here and then J would be moved to every other position. And 
i and j basically determine that this is a subarray. We would keep track as we keep adding another i value. We would keep track of what was our sum so far. That's going to be our current sum. Initially, it would be set to zero, but j would start here. Then our sum would be four. We'd add this value. Then our sum would be four minus one, which is three. And we would keep doing that. And then by the time we got to the end, we would have the entire sum and then our inner loop would be finished and then our i pointer would finally be sh shifted over here and then we would have a j pointer that would go through the entire array so at every single subarray suppose this one we're going to have a current sum if at any point the current sum becomes greater than our max sum we're going to reassign max sum an easy way to do that in code is just take the maximum of these two and then assign it to max sum. Remember, we don't actually care about the subarray itself. We just care about what the max sum of it happens to be. And then at the end, that's what we're going to return. So this is a working solution, but the time complexity is n squared. The question is, can we do better? And we definitely can, but the question is how? Is there any repeated work that we're doing here or any redundant work that we're doing here? And the answer is yes. Let's take a deeper look. Just looking at this subarray, our sum would be 4. We're trying to get the largest sum, so a positive number, no matter how small it is, is good because it's contributing. It's making our sum larger. Negative numbers, on the other hand, do the opposite. They make our sum smaller. So we had a 4. Now if we make our subarray a little bit bigger, now we have 4 minus 1. That's a sum of 3. That's not good. But from the perspective of this 2, the 2 doesn't know what came before it. As far as it's concerned, there weren't two values that came before. As far as this guy is concerned, there was just a single 3 over here. It makes no difference to this guy, but we're pretty happy when we're over here because this is a positive number and the sum of all values that came before were also positive. It was 3. So 3 plus 2 is going to be 5. So now our sum at this point is 5. Now before we continue through the rest of this array, let's just focus on this. What's the max subarray sum of this array? It is definitely 5 because we take the 4 and the 2, but we have to subtract 1. It would be nice if we could just ignore this value. But remember, a subarray is by definition contiguous. So if we decided to not include this negative 1, we would also have to forfeit the positive 4. And then we would have a subarray sum of 2. Or we could do it the other way. We could forfeit this guy and we would only have a subarray sum of 4. It's worth including this negative 1 because by including it, we can add a positive 2, which counteracts this guy, but also gives us one value extra. So it's worth it to include this. This idea is going to be extended now that we get to the next value over here. So we know the max subarray sum of this is positive 5. By the time we get here, we don't care if it's three values or one value or two values. We can pretend like these don't even exist. There's a positive five before the negative seven. So we can add these two values and that will give us a sum of negative two. Now, negative two is definitely not the max subarray sum of these four values so far. As we keep track of our max sum, it would still be set to positive five. But the negative 2 is still important because it's going to be our current sum. The reason we have a current sum and also a max sum is because for the current sum, that is the sum that we can add to the next value as we go through the array. So this negative 2 will be added to the positive 3, or at least we're allowed to do that. We don't necessarily have to, and we can add it to the positive 3 because we know that this sum applies to the subarray that ends at this value. So whether it's just this itself or maybe two values or three values, it doesn't matter. We know that that subarray includes this guy. So if we take this subarray, add it to this value, they are still contiguous. That's the important thing here. But now my question for you is, we know we don't care about these values anymore. There's a negative two that came before the positive three. We're allowed to add this to the positive three, but we don't have to. And I just have one simple question for you. Why would we 
ever add a negative value if we don't have to. A negative value is never going to increase our sum. We're looking for the largest sum. So if we have a choice, we should never add a negative value, a negative previous sum to our current value. And this algorithm is really that simple. So now that we have a choice, we're going to say that the current sum which basically means the largest subarray sum ending at this value, it's either three or it's three minus two, which would be positive one. We're of course gonna choose the larger value. So we're gonna say, forget about this. The largest subarray sum ending here is positive three. And then we would go to uh, the next value here. By the time we get here, we don't care about all these anymore. We know that the largest subarray sum ending at this value was a positive three. So we have a choice. We can take this value by itself, or we can say four plus whatever the current sum before was. And since our previous current sum was positive, we are going to add these together. So our current sum by the end would be a three plus four, which is equal to seven. And our previous max sum, if you recall, was five. So at this point, seven is greater than five. So our max sum is gonna be assigned to seven now. And that would happen with this line of code. So the code for what I just talked about would look like this. This is the algorithm that we're interested in. It is a linear time algorithm. We don't need nested loops. Now this can make it a little bit confusing exactly what's going on because we're not even keeping track of pointers anymore like we were earlier. But implicitly, we still do have a window that we're looking at. It's just not obvious that that's what we're doing here. So we're initializing our max sum the exact same way. We're also keeping track of a current sum. So suppose our window is initially like this, where we go through every number in the input. We first start at the first number. Before we add this value to our current sum, we want to make sure our current sum isn't negative for the reasons I talked about a bit ago, because we have a choice. We don't have to include any values that came before this value. And we would definitely not want to do that if the previous current sum was negative because that's never going to increase our sum. So basically with this line of code, we're ensuring that our current sum is never negative. And then after we do that, we can take n and add it to the current sum. Now these two lines of code could be condensed into a single line. I encourage you to do that on your own. And if you're not sure how, feel free to ask in the Discord server. So at this point, our current sum would be positive four. And then we would possibly update the max sum. Initially, our max sum was also set to four just as a default value. So at this point, our max sum would stay as four. Next though, we would get to the next value, a negative one. Our current sum is not negative, so it's gonna stay as four. And then we're gonna add n to our current sum. We're adding the negative one to our current sum. So at this point, our current sum would be three. It got smaller, so our max sum would not be updated. Our max sum would stay as four, but our current sum got smaller. Isn't that a bad thing? Well, yes it is, but we had no choice here. We could have either had this as our current sum, which is three, or we could have had this as our current sum, which is negative one. Of course, three is bigger than negative one. But why not just set it back to zero? Well, by the time we get to this two, we have some more choices. We know that the max subarray sum from here was three. So we could say the max subarray sum ending here is equal to five by adding that three, or we could leave it as two. Of course, we're gonna add the three. We do have to add a negative one, but it can't be helped. We're sacrificing that to gain this. So at this point, our current sum would be five and our max sum would also be updated to five. Next, we would get to negative seven. So we would take our current sum and add negative seven to it. So that would give us a negative two. So now our current sum has become negative. We definitely don't like that our max sum is going to stay as five so far. Then we get to three. Our current sum is negative. 
So we're gonna reset it back to zero. At this point, we know that nothing that came before is going to help us. We would love to be able to include the positive four and the positive two, but to do that, we have to sacrifice a negative seven and a negative one, never mind the negative one, the negative seven is enough for us to be convinced that we shouldn't try to include these two values because the negative seven is gonna outweigh those anyway. So we just forget that any of these ever existed. We have a three so far, it's not bigger than our max sum, which was five, but we can continue. Now our current sum is going to be three. Then we get to the next value. Our current sum is three, we're gonna add four to it. Now our current sum is seven, that's bigger than our max sum, which was five, so now this is our max sum. And we went through every single value, we got to the end of the array, so we end up returning seven. This is an algorithm that's deceptively difficult. When you look at it like this, it just seems so simple and trivial. But this algorithm definitely has some complexity behind it. And if you were paying attention, you might have noticed that we were using a two-pointer technique. Well, definitely not from this code, but our two pointers essentially represent what the subarray is. We can also call that subarray a window. Cadane's algorithm has a lot of overlap with another popular algorithm called the sliding window algorithm. Well, technically it's more of a pattern than an algorithm. It's a category of problems and before we finish, I want to show you the sliding window variation of Cadane's algorithm, and we're going to go more in detail later on, but I think this will be a good introduction. What if we slightly change the problem? We were looking for the max subarray with the largest sum, and we were trying to return the sum itself. But what if we're actually trying to return the indexes of the subarray, the beginning and the end index, aka the left and the right index of that subarray. Well, the algorithm would be very, very similar, but in this case, we would use the sliding window technique, which is also based on two pointers. The idea is that we're going to have two pointers. I like to call them the left and right pointer, and I use a capital L in my code. I used to use a lowercase l, but then a lowercase l looks very similar to the one. So now I use capital just to make it very clear that this is a variable, not an integer one. And with these pointers, the left pointer is called the left pointer because it will always be on the left side of the right pointer. In this case though, the left and right pointer can be equal. They can be at the same position. That's perfectly fine because that just means we have a subarray of length one. But our left pointer should never cross the right pointer. And with that as our main restriction, we get the sliding window, which is basically a window that you know, potentially is shifted to the right. It can also grow in size. So the way we saw Cadane's algorithm run initially was that this was our max subarray sum. Then this was our max subarray sum ending at this position. Then this was the max subarray sum ending at this position. So you can see our window is not technically sliding. It's mostly just growing, but it still counts as the sliding window. And next, the max subarray sum ending at this position was this window. And then finally, when we got to this point where we were looking for the max subarray sum ending at this position, we had to slide our window from this to now be this. So our window went from this to now this. And at this point, our left and right pointers would both be over here. And then when we got to the next value, our window actually grew. So it's a sliding window. We have some window of values that we care about. We care about all the values that are inside that window. In this case, all the values inside that window represent our current sum, which is not necessarily the same as the max sum. So in terms of code, it's pretty similar. We initialize our max sum the same way we initialize the current sum the same way. We initialize our result pointers, which I call the max left and max right. These represent the positions of the window with the max sum. And we initialize our left pointer to be here. And we could also initialize our right pointer to also be zero, but I don't do that because we're iterating our right pointer through the entire array. So our left is here, our right is here. We check the same thing we did earlier. If our current sum is less than zero, we're gonna reset it back to zero. 
But before we did that with one line, because we could, but in this case, we can't do it with one line because if our current sum is less than zero, we also have to reset our left pointer. In this case, our current sum is not less than zero, it's equal to zero. So then we add the value here to our current sum. So now it's four. Is our current sum greater than the max sum? Yes, it is. So we're gonna set our max sum now equal to four. And this is the important part. We also have to update our max left and max right. So we're saying here that our pointers are zero, zero. That this window, which is representing this uh, subarray, is the one that contains the max sum. So then we would set our right pointer here. This would be the current sum. It's not bigger than the max sum. Then we would update the right pointer to be here. Then five would be the current sum. It is greater than the max sum, so we would update the max sum. We would also say that zero and two are the pointers that represent the max sum. Then we would move our right pointer here. This is, this is negative two, so it's not the max sum. Then we would move the right pointer here. At this point, our current sum was negative. It's negative two, so we would set the current sum back to zero, but we would also take that left pointer, which is all the way over here still, and we would move it to be where the right pointer is. That's essentially us saying that we don't care about all the previous values because they summed up to a negative value and we don't wanna consider that anymore. We want a fresh start. So we update the pointers like this and then we would end up shifting our right pointer over here and then we would find that seven is the max sum and the left and right pointers that give us that are I think this is four and this is index five. So that's what we would end up returning. Now this was a lot to take in because Cadane's algorithm just has a lot of depth to it. It overlaps a lot with some other really important algorithms, including two pointers, sliding window, greedy, and dynamic programming. But once the concepts sink in, it really makes a lot of sense. It's an efficient algorithm and definitely one worth learning. Now let's take a deeper look at the sliding window algorithm. Looking at a simple variation where the window is of a fixed size. Suppose we're given an array and we want to return true if there are two elements within a window of size k that are equal. And within a window of size k basically means that the window can be at most of length k. And the two elements have to be different elements. So we can't just say that this window has two elements that are the same because they're not two different elements because it's just the same position. They have to be in different positions. Now suppose our K is two. What would the answer be for this example array and how would we determine the answer? Well, the brute force would be to look at every window of size K. So this is one window. Are these two values the same? Nope. This is another window. Are these two values the same? Nope. This is another window. Are these two values the same? Nope. Only if our window could have been of size three instead of two, because then we would be able to have considered this window. And we know while these are not the same and these are not the same, these two are the same, but we can only have windows of size two. So this doesn't work. We try the next window. These two are again, not the same, but finally, when we get to the end, this is our last window. These two values are the same. So brute forcing this is not too difficult. It might not be clear with a window of size two exactly what we would do, because with a window of size two, we can just take the two elements and just check if they are equal. But of a variable window length, that's even bigger, suppose three, how would we do this and this and this? Well, we would do something like this, where our left pointer would represent the beginning of our window, and our right pointer in this case should never be at the same position as our left pointer, because then in that case, we might compare these two and say that we found equal values, but they're not two different values. And let's say in this example, our window is of size three, just to illustrate the entire algorithm. So in this case, our right pointer is always gonna be initialized to left plus one because we know our window is of size three, but here we're checking for duplicates. We're gonna check is this left value equal to any of these other values in this window. 
And to do that, we're gonna have a right pointer. So here, our right pointer is gonna be at this position. We're gonna check, are these two equal? Nope. And then we're gonna increment our right pointer here. Are these two equal? Nope. Well, we've gotten to the end of our window, right? Our right pointer can't be over here because if our right pointer was here, then our window is bigger than three. So to do that, what we're gonna do is shift our left pointer over here and then this would be our new window. We're gonna have right pointer here and then we're gonna have it here. And then we're gonna set our right pointer over here. These two aren't equal, increment the right pointer. These two are equal, so we can return true. So that's essentially what I'm doing here. We have nested for loops. The outer loop is gonna run as many times as how many elements we have in the array, which let's say is N. The inner loop is gonna run roughly K times, technically K minus one, but we still say it's K just for simplicity. K is a variable, it could be anything. It's safe to say though that K is going to be less than or equal to N because we can't have a window that's larger than the array itself. But that would mean our time complexity is going to be N times K. Now for small K values, for small windows, that's not too bad. But for large windows, it could be worse. And really quickly, if you're confused by this line over here, this can be a sort of common technique with sliding window problems. We know that we're, for every value here, we wanna check is it equal to any other values that go in the same window and do that for every single value. By the time we get here, we have our window ending at the perfect spot. Well, in this case, we would check is two equal to three? Nope, is two equal to three? Nope. And then we would want to still start our left pointer over here, even though we don't have enough values to create a window of size K, it's okay if we have a window that's smaller than K. So this window is still valid, even though it only has two elements. Then we would check is this left value equal to the right value over here? Yes, it is, so we would return true. When I iterate my right pointer, starting at left plus one, going up until the minimum of the length and the minimum of left plus K, I'm saying, in this case, the length would have us stop here, but left plus K would have us stop at one element after that. But we know we don't wanna end up going out of bounds, so we take the minimum of this and this, which would have us stop over here. So then we won't go out of bounds. That's what I'm doing with this line of code. But of course, it's not as efficient as we can have it. And what we're trying to do here is detect duplicates within a window. Detecting duplicates is something that can be improved with hashing. So we're actually going to use a hash set to optimize this to give us an optimized sliding window solution. And we could optimize it like this using a hash set to check for duplicates. Instead of having to manually compare every single element in the array to every single other possible value that could be in the same window, we can keep a rolling hash set of our window. Meaning that if this is our window, and we're gonna continue to assume that, let's say k equals three, if this is our window, then all three of these values will be added to the hash set. And as we go to the next position, because we just have a single loop here, we're iterating through every single position, that's our right pointer. By the time our right pointer gets over here, our left pointer is still going to be at zero. So what are we gonna do? Because we've gotten to a point now where our window, or at least the pointers representing our window, are greater than the K value. That's this line of code over here. So what we're gonna do is take the left value and remove it from our window, from our hash set, and then take our left pointer and then increment it to be over here. And so then this is what our new window is going to be looking like. First though, before we add this to the hash set, we're gonna check, does this value already exist in the hash set? And that is a constant time operation. Instead of having this value and comparing it to this and comparing it to this and doing that for every window with every single value, we can do this in constant time with a hash set operation. In this case, two already exists in the hash set so we can return true. Now, if it didn't, we would simply add this to the hash set 
and then continue the algorithm. We would then, you know, add this value, pop this guy, increment our left pointer to be over here, and then, you know, this would be the new window, and we would keep going just like that. And we would even get to the small window cases where we have a window of size two, we have a window of size one until we get to the end of the array. And if we never found a window that contained duplicates, we would end up returning false. This is the relatively simple sliding window case where we have a window of fixed size, but we know that's not always going to be the case. As we saw with Cadane's algorithm, the sliding window variation, our window could be a variable length, right? We showed a case where we had a window with one, then two, then three, then four, and then it skipped. You know, we, we removed all these and then we had a window of one again. So that's what we're going to be focusing on next. So now let's look at sliding window problems where we need a variable length window. And let's take a look at a really simple example. We're given some input array of numbers. We wanna find the length of the longest subarray that has the same value in each position. So essentially we're looking for the longest string of duplicates. Here we just have a single four. There's no duplicates next to it. Here we have two twos and here we have three threes. Of course, the longest window is this one. Now, the simple way to solve this problem with a sliding window would be to, you know, initialize the left and right pointers. In this case, they can be at the same position because this is a valid window. And then we would increment the right pointer. Now, at this point, we would see that the right pointer is not equal to the same value as the left pointer. So that's a problem. We want our window to have the same value in every position. So what we should do is increment our left pointer until it's equal to the same value as the one at the right pointer. In this case, we only have to increment the left pointer once because then it'll be at the same position as the right pointer. And of course, then they are the same value. And then we would increment our right pointer again and now it's here, it's the same value as the one at the left pointer, so this is a valid window. And by the way, we're going to be keeping track of the length of the longest window. Before the longest window was of length one, now we found one that's of length two. So now again, we're gonna increment our right pointer over here now, this is our window, is it valid? Well, the this value is not the same as this value. So this is not a valid window. We need to make it valid again. What should we do? Well, like I said, we want to increment the left pointer until the left value and the right value are equal. So now the left pointer would be over here, but these two values are still not equal. So our window is going to continue to slide. In this case, these two values were chopped off and this is the new window. So now that our left pointer is over here, this is our window, it's of length one. It's definitely not the longest because we earlier saw a window of length two. But now we're going to once again increment our right pointer. Now it's over here, these two values are the same. This is a valid window of length two. Now we're gonna increment the right pointer again. These are the same, so this is a window of length three. And that is the longest that we've seen so far. And then we would once again increment our right pointer, but now it's out of bounds. That's how you know we can stop. So what we would return as the longest length would be three in this case. And the code for that would look something like this, where we initialize our longest length to be zero, and we set our left pointer initially here, and our right pointer we could initialize to zero, but since we're iterating through the entire array with a for loop, you know, we pretty much get that anyway. And what we're trying to do here is take our window and keep increasing it until we get to a point where we can't grow it anymore. And at that point, we would start shrinking our window from the left side. But actually, what I didn't show when we were walking through the example is when we were at this point, we had a valid window. Then we found a new value that was not equal to the one over here. We actually don't need to take the left pointer and increment it by one because we know that if we just found a new value here, that all the other values here were duplicates. So instead of taking this left pointer and incrementing it by one, we can immediately set it to the right pointer. And that's what we do in the code. It doesn't really change the time complexity, 
It's just that this is such a simple problem that we don't need an inner loop, but I'll touch on that in the next example. And on every iteration, we calculate the length of the window. So if this was our window over here, we know that this is index zero, this is one, two, three. The size of our window is three. We can calculate that by taking the right pointer, subtracting the left pointer, which gives us two, and then we add one to it. That's just how we calculate the length of this window. Because we got a result of two, we know that's not the case. This window is of length three. That's why we have to add that one. And this problem is actually simple enough that we don't really need the sliding window. At least we don't explicitly need a left and right pointer. I'm just doing this to kind of show you the main idea behind the sliding window. I encourage you to try to rewrite this solution without even using left and right pointers. If you get stuck, feel free to post your code in the Discord. But now let's look at a more complicated sliding window problem. Now, given an array of all positive integers, we want to find the minimum length subarray where the sum is greater than or equal to some target value that we're given. And given a problem like this one, you would want to pay special attention to the fact that all values in the array are positive. When you're given a detail like that in an interview question, it's usually not arbitrary. Unless you have like a really evil interviewer who is just trying to trick you, usually a detail like this indicates something and it's sort of a hint at what the solution could be. And in this case, we're trying to find the length of the subarray itself. In this example, let's say the target is equal to six. Now the obvious brute force solution would be to go through every single subarray and find all of the subarrays that total up to six, and then among those subarrays, keep track of which one had the minimum length. So running through that quickly, it would look like this. This is one subarray, it's smaller than six. Let's add another value to it. This is five, it's still smaller than six. Let's add another value to it, six. It's exactly equal to the target. Well, what's the length of this subarray? We would just get the beginning and the ending index and easily calculate it, the window is of size three. So that's our minimum length so far. Now, paying attention to the fact that all values in this array are positive, we can continue to grow our window. Our window is starting over here. This is the left pointer. We can continue to increment our right pointer and grow this window. But let me ask you something. Starting from here, are we ever going to find a window that is smaller than length three that satisfies this condition? Definitely not, because all these values are positive. We already have a window that sums up to the target six. By adding more values, the window is gonna grow larger and larger. It's not gonna ever get smaller. We're never gonna reach the target starting from here. So at this point, we know we have to shrink our window for us to ever get another valid window. So what we're gonna say is starting from here, what's the minimum length window that would sum up to the target six. So what we would do is take our left pointer and then increment it. And after we've done that, we can go to the next iteration of the loop where our right pointer now is going to be shifted over here. And this is the next value that we're adding to our sum. By the way, when we uh, shifted our left pointer, our sum was six. But when we remove this value from the window, we take that value, which was a two, and then decrement it from our window. So now our window is a sum of four. Notice how we didn't have to go through every value to recalculate that. We were keeping track of the total sum. When we remove one value, we can just decrement it from the total sum. And now that we're going to another value and adding it to the window, we're gonna simply add that two to our total sum. So our total sum is now six. Once again, we reach the target, but the window is of exactly the same length. So our minimum window length is still three for now. But once again, we're gonna shift our left pointer by one to be over here now. And now our window sum was six, but we removed a three. So now our window sum is equal to three. So now once again, we're gonna go to the next iteration of the loop where our right pointer is gonna be incremented. So our sum is three, but we're adding a four to our window. So now our sum is going to be three plus four, which is equal to seven. So that is not equal to the target, but it's okay because we're only looking for sums that are greater than or equal to the target. So this is technically a valid window. 
but we want to find the smallest window possible, which is exactly why we're going to now take our left pointer and then increment it, but we're not necessarily only going to do it once. Right now we incremented, right now we just removed a one. So therefore our total sum is now going to be six and our left pointer is going to be over here. This is also a valid window. The sum is six, our target is six, and now this is actually the new minimum window. It's of length two. But since the sum is still greater than or equal to the target, we're gonna keep shrinking this window. We're gonna take the left pointer and once again increment it. Now it's gonna be in the same position as the right pointer. And our sum is now gonna be six minus two, which is going to be four. So now this window is no longer valid. And things have gotten a little messy, so I'm gonna clean it up a little bit. So our left pointer would be all the way over here, same as the right pointer. And then we would now increment the right pointer one more time. And this would be the new window. The sum would now be seven. It's greater than or equal to the target. So this is a valid window. It's of length two, which was the same minimum length that we calculated earlier. So now we would try to increment our left pointer, remove this. So seven minus four, our sum is three now. This is our window and it's no longer valid. So then we would try to increment our right pointer again. It's out of bounds. So that's how you know we can stop. So now let's take a look at the code and I'm gonna to explain to you why the time complexity is still big O of N. So we initialize our left pointer all the way at the beginning. As with most sliding window problems, our total is initially gonna be zero. You could also call that our current sum, like our window sum. Our length is initially gonna be positive infinity because we're trying to minimize it. So by setting it to a really big value, when we run our min function, we will end up reducing it. You could also initialize the length to be the length of the input array plus one. That would also be a good default value. And let's assume that in this example, if we never find a window that has a sum of greater than or equal to the target, we end up returning zero. And we would know that because our length would still be the default value that we set it to, which in this case is positive infinity. So if that was the case, we would return zero as us indicating we could not find a subarray. But if we do find a subarray, we return the length of it. Now the code isn't super crazy. We have a left pointer as we uh, take our right pointer and keep shifting it, we're adding that value to the total current sum. If the current sum ever is greater than or equal to the target, that means we have a valid window. So the first thing we're gonna do is take the length of that window and check, is it smaller than the current length that we've calculated so far, the current minimum length? If it is, we reassign the current minimum length. That's step one. Step two is where we try to shrink our window. That means we take the left value over here and subtract that from our total, just like I was doing earlier. Here, our total would be six, so we're gonna subtract two from it and now it's gonna be four. We're also going to take that left pointer and then increment it by one to be over here. So we're gonna to continue to do this until our window is no longer valid. The reason we're doing it is because remember, our goal here is to find the minimum length subarray. So as we keep shrinking the window from the left, we're finding the smallest possible subarray. And the rest of this walkthrough would play out just like we talked about a second ago. So this sliding window solution is a linear time algorithm, but the code can be confusing because normally when we have nested for loops, we're kind of trained to think that that is an N squared solution. But in this case, it's not. Let me explain to you exactly why. We have an outer loop. We know for sure that the right pointer is going to visit every single position in the input array. We also know that the left pointer is possibly going to visit every position. It's gonna start at the beginning and it's going to be incremented in some cases when the inner while loop runs. But the left pointer might not necessarily reach the end of the array. Let's suppose that in this case, our target was actually a really big value like 60. So in that case, our left pointer would start here and the inner loop would never run because our total would never be greater than the target. But in the worst case, as we showed a second ago, our left, when our target is six, our left pointer would have been in this position and in this position and in this and all of these. 
So what I'm saying here is that looking at this, it's clear that the time complexity is roughly two times n, which we know reduces to big O of n. So how can that be possible when we have an inner loop? Well, the thing with this inner loop is it's not always going to execute. When our right pointer is over here, our left pointer is still going to be over here. When our right pointer is over here, our left pointer is not going to be changed. It's going to stay exactly where it is. When our right pointer is over here, our left pointer is going to be incremented once because our, our, our total sum was equal to the target. So we had to shrink the window. So then we move it over here. When our right pointer is over here, once again, our sum was equal to the target. So we increment the left pointer and move it over here. When our right pointer was over here, our sum was once again, greater than or equal to the target. So we incremented our left pointer once, and then actually it was still greater than or equal to the target. So we incremented our left pointer twice. What we're starting to notice is in some cases, the inner loop ran once. In, some, in other cases, like over here, the inner loop never ran. And in some cases, like over here, the inner loop ran multiple times. Finally, when we're finished, when we get to this point, our left pointer was once again shifted by one, but our left pointer was still shifted only n times. That means the inner loop runs a total of n times, not n times for each iteration of the outer loop, but n times total. I hope this makes it clear why even though we have an inner loop, the time complexity is still big O of n. It's about the total number of times that the inner loop is going to execute. And as I just showed, it's only going to execute a total of n times. So this is the general pattern and generally what the code looks like when you have a sliding window solution where the window is of variable length. You usually have an inner while loop, but that doesn't mean the time complexity is worse than big O of n. Next, let's move on to two pointers. And we've technically already been talking about two pointers and many of the algorithms we talked about. That's because two pointers is a very, very large and general topic. Sliding window is pretty much a subset of two pointer problems. You might be wondering what exactly is a sliding window problem compared to two pointers? Like what's the exact distinction? Well, generally speaking with two pointer algorithms, we care mostly about the two individual elements that the pointers are pointing at. But as we saw with sliding window, we care about the entire window. It could mean, you know, we care about every unique value that's in this window, or we care about the total sum of all values within the window. That's generally the distinction, but I don't think it's a huge one. In my opinion, two pointers and sliding window are two sides of the same coin. But now let's look at a really, really simple example. Given some array or some string, Ring, let's check if it's a palindrome. Arrays are essentially strings, so we don't really care too much whether we're looking at integers or we're looking at some character or something else. We just want to know if it's a palindrome. A palindrome is something that once you reverse it, it's the same thing. So if we were to reverse this, we would get one, then we would get two over here and continuing. We would get something like this after reversing it. It looks the exact same as the original. So therefore it is a palindrome. So we could solve this problem multiple ways. We could, you know, build another array with by iterating through these elements in reverse. But an easier way is with two pointers because then we don't need extra space. We initialize a pointer all the way at the left and a pointer all the way at the right. We compare the two individual elements at each pointer. You know, we call these the left and right pointers. If they're equal, then we uh, increment the left pointer and we decrement the right pointer because we want to shift it this way and we keep comparing these values. Now, what if this two was actually a three? Then we would see that this is not equal to this. Therefore, we would return false. It's not a palindrome. But in this case, it is equal. So we would continue. We would increment our left pointer here now and then increment the right pointer here. These two are also equal. And at this point, our left pointer would be incremented here and our right pointer would be decremented over here. But since they've crossed each other, we know we can stop. I mean, we could keep checking if we wanted to, but we already know that these two values are equal. So by having the right pointer here and the left pointer here, we're just making the exact same comparison. If we moved the right pointer over here and the left pointer over here, then we would just be comparing these two again. We already did that. There's no need to do it again. 
So the code for that would look something like this. Suppose we're given some word or some array. It doesn't really matter. The algorithm will be the same either way. We initialize our left and right pointers at the beginning and the end. Now, while this is a really, really simple example, there are a lot of problems that follow this exact same pattern where you initialize a pointer at the beginning and initialize another pointer at the end. In this case, we just compare the characters. If they're unequal, we return false. Otherwise, we shift the pointers. And if our pointers ever cross each other, that means we checked every single pair of characters and therefore the input is a palindrome and we can return true. Now let's take a look at a more complicated example. Suppose we're given a sorted input array. As you might guess, that's gonna be important for this problem. We want to return two indices of two separate elements, meaning that they have to be in different positions, which sum up to the target value. In this case, for this example, let's say the target value is equal to seven. And let's assume that there's always gonna be exactly one solution. The obvious two pointer solution would be the brute force one. We have two pointers. We compare every pair of elements to each other. We take every single pair of elements, add them together and check if they're equal to the target. If they are, we return the indexes of those two values. And then, you know, with negative one, we would compare it with this guy, then this guy, then this guy, and then this guy, and keep doing that. That would be obviously an n squared solution because then we would have to do the same thing with this guy. Compare it with this, 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 and this. Well, not compare, but add it with that and then check if it's equal to the target. But again, it's an n squared solution. Now the, now the input array is sorted. So an easy thing to do would be to say, well, we know the largest element is gonna be over here. How can nine, which is greater than the target, ever sum up with some value to be equal to seven. How would that even be possible? Can we just go ahead and say, you know, this is definitely not gonna be a part of the solution and the same thing for eight. Well, we can't quite do that because as you can see here, we have some negative values. So it technically is possible that this nine added with a negative two would equal the target. In this case though, we don't have a negative two. So initializing two pointers the same way we did earlier, do we have any information? This is our largest value and this is our smallest value. We add them together, we get eight. That's bigger than the target. So what does that tell us? When we took the largest value and added it with the smallest value, we were still larger than the target value. That means that there's no possible element in the entire input array that we could add to nine that would equal the target because we tried the smallest value and that still didn't work. So that tells us that nine is never going to be part of a solution. So we would never consider nine. So in this case, we would shift our pointer over here. Since we know our array is sorted, this value is going to be less than or equal to the value over here. So we have to check now if we have a solution. We add negative one and positive eight, that's exactly equal to the target, so we found it. But to make this a bit more complicated, let's assume that this was actually a positive seven. In that case, we would add seven and negative one, that would be six. So at that point, we would say, our sum is smaller than the target. What does that tell us? Well, first of all, we know for sure that this nine could never be part of a solution. We talked about why earlier. At this point, do we know for sure that one of these values can never be part of a solution? Well, this is the smallest value we have and we added it with the biggest value available to us, except for this one, of course, but we added it with the seven and it was six. It was still too small. So since the remaining values over here are gonna be less than or equal to the seven, there's no possible value remaining in the array that we could add to negative one that would equal seven. It's just impossible, that's math. These values are less than or equal to seven, so therefore nothing we add to negative one is gonna be equal to seven. So therefore, we know for sure that this negative one is never going to be part of a solution. So very simply, we take our left pointer and we increment it by one to be over here now. At this point, I think we're ready to take a look at the code. We initialized our left and right pointers at the edges of the input array. 
and we're continuing the algorithm until our pointers meet or cross each other. We're guaranteed that there's a solution, so we know that this loop is actually never gonna exit, so we don't even have to return anything outside of it. We know we're gonna find a solution. But before we find a solution, when we have our total sum, and the total sum is larger than the target, as when we you know, initialize our pointers here, then we take the right pointer and decrement it. We know the input array is in sorted order. And by taking the right pointer and decrementing it, we're decreasing our sum. So that gives us a chance. Since our sum was too big, let's decrease it. If our sum is too small, let's increase it. So as we saw a second ago, when our left pointer was over here, we had negative one plus seven. That was six. That was too small. So we took our left pointer and incremented it to see if we could find a solution by increasing our sum, maybe we'll get closer to the target. So now our sum is two plus seven. That's still too big. Our sum is nine. So once again, we're gonna take our right pointer and decrement it. Now the right pointer is gonna be over here. We did that because we know for sure that this seven is never gonna be part of a solution because all the remaining elements are gonna be greater than or equal to two. And if two plus seven was still greater than the target, which is seven, then there's no other element here that we could add to seven that would be equal to the target. Now we have two plus four, that's smaller than the target. So we're gonna take our left pointer and increment it to now be in this position. Well, this is the last possibility we have, so it better be the solution. And in this case it is three plus four is equal to seven. So then we would return the indices of those two elements. I think it's pretty clear why this algorithm is big O of N because we initialize our pointers. And in the worst case, as we just saw, we would have pointers and we'd keep shifting them until they basically met each other. That would mean we looked at every single position in the input array. So this is a two pointer problem and it's definitely not a sliding window. I kind of call this the shrinking window because this is a pattern you see pretty often where you initialize two pointers at the end and then you start you know, moving the pointers towards each other based on some kind of conditional logic. But nobody else really calls this the shrinking window, at least not that I've seen. Now let's talk about a pattern that comes up a lot when it comes to arrays and that is prefix sums. Prefix sums actually aren't super complicated and they usually don't require any super crazy data structures or algorithms. The idea is that if we have some array, the idea is that if we have some array, a prefix sum is defined as being, first of all, let's talk about the word prefix here. A prefix is basically means that we're starting at the beginning. So prefix. So a prefix of this array is any subarray, any contiguous subarray typically, that starts at the beginning of this array. So this is one prefix of the array. Another prefix would be the first two elements, and then we could add another, and now this is a prefix, and then add another, and this is a prefix, and this is a prefix. The entire array itself is technically a prefix of itself. Now, this is not a prefix because it does not start at the beginning. And this is not a prefix usually because while it starts at the beginning, it's not contiguous. Typically prefixes are contiguous blocks that start at the beginning. And typically with prefixes, now extending that, a prefix sum would basically be any prefix of this array, would basically mean for any prefix of this array, we also calculate the sum of that prefix. And you'll see why we do that and why it can be helpful and make things more efficient. So this prefix sum would just be two. This prefix sum would be two minus one, which is one. And now there's a bit of repeated work actually, because if the prefix sum of this is two, the prefix sum of the first two values is one, how do we get the prefix sum of the first three values? Well, we already know the prefix sum of this, and then we add three to it. So we take one plus three and we get four. Now to get the prefix sum of the first four values, we can take three, we can take four uh, minus three, which is gonna give us one. To get the prefix sum of the entire array, we can get one plus four, that's gonna be five. 
Now, even though we're talking about prefix sums, generally under this pattern, you could do other things. Another common thing is prefix products. So what we did was the sums, but you could also calculate the product. So for this prefix, the product would still be two. For this prefix, the product would be two times negative one, that'd be negative two. The product for uh, the first three values would be negative two times three, that'd be negative six, and et cetera, et cetera. You could do that. And sometimes that's also a pattern. The main thing that we're worrying about here is the commonality between that is that it's a prefix. Now there's also another thing called postfix, which is sort of the opposite of a prefix. With prefixes, we have every subarray starting at the beginning. A postfix would be every subarray starting at the end. So this would be a postfix. This would be a postfix. This would be a postfix, et cetera, et cetera. Basically, prefixes and postfixes are two sides of the same coin. Because generally you because generally we use prefixes to eliminate repeated work, let me show you what I mean. The classic problem with prefixes is that we're given an array of values. So that this would be our array in this case. We wanna design a data structure that can query the sum of a subarray of values. That sounds more complicated than it is. Basically, that means that we could call some function called maybe query sum and pass in two indices left and right. So maybe in this case, this is our left and this is our right. And this function could calculate the sum of this subarray. Now, the naive way to implement a data structure that could do that is basically not worry about prefixes, just have an array given two indices. It's pretty easy to calculate the sum of that subarray. Just go through every position, add it to some total, and then return that total. So while this is an easy problem to solve, it can be done more efficiently because the way, the naive way to do it would be in the worst case, an n time operation every time we call query sum. But using prefix sums, we can actually eliminate pretty much all of the repeated work. Let me show you how. Now, while none of our prefix sums that we calculated will give us this uh, calculation that we want, and that's expected because we have an array of, let's say, n values, the number of subarrays we could have is n squared, right? We could have, you know, this subarray, this subarray, this subarray, right? These are prefix subarrays, but we could have other subarrays like that, like that like this, and our prefix sums only tell us the sums of every subarray that starts at the beginning. They don't tell us the sums of these. We haven't pre-computed that, but we don't need to actually. Because while we're looking for this sum, we can get pretty close with this value. This value will tell us the sum of all of these values, right? So that's what we want, except we want to chop off this value. So how do we do that? Well, we take the prefix sum of all these, which is this, subtract from it the prefix sum of all of these values, and there was only one in this case. So we'd take one minus two, and then we would know that the sum of this subarray is one minus two, which is negative one. And when you just look at the values individually, three minus one, that's gonna be negative one. So that is the case here. Doing the exact same thing for this subarray, we would get, uh, we would want the prefix sum of the array up until this point, which is five. But we'd also want to remove this prefix sum, the prefix sum of these three values. So we would take five minus four, because we know four represents the prefix sum of these values. So five minus four is gonna be one, and looking at the values individually, that is the case. The sum of this subarray is indeed one. Now, because we pre-computed these prefix sums, every time we're given any arbitrary subarray, we can get the prefix sum in O of one time, because we're just doing a single calculation. We're taking some value, subtracting another value, and that gives us the sum of that prefix. So this is one of the most classic prefix sum problems. There are many others just like this problem that kind of use a similar idea of pre-computing work using prefix sums, and then that makes additional work that we need to do a lot easier. Now, I also mentioned that prefix sums and postfix sums are just two sides of the same coin. And the reason is because we could solve this problem 
the exact same way using postfix sums instead of prefix sums. Maybe you can even think of how we could do that, assuming that the values that we computed here were actually postfix sums and not prefix. That means that the value here would represent the sum of this subarray and the value here would represent the sum of this subarray, the value here would represent the sum of this subarray, et cetera, et cetera. Then if we wanted the sum of this subarray, we would just take this value, which would represent this sum and then subtract from it this value, which would represent this sum. That's why postfix sums are pretty similar to prefix sums. But now let's take a look at the code. So the code for our data structure could look something like this, where our constructor is given some array of values. We're, let's assume we're only given a single array of values and that's it. We're not gonna be given a new array every single time so that when we pre-compute the work that we don't have to you know, continuously do that. We only have to pre-compute the prefix sums a single time. So given some array of nums like this one, we're going to initialize our data structure by computing the prefix sums just like we uh, have shown over here. So we'll have a member variable array called prefix We'll keep track of our total because calculating the prefix sums is pretty easy. Initially, our total is gonna be zero. We're gonna go through every number, so two, and then we're gonna add that number to our total. So our prefix sum so far is two. And then we're gonna append that to the uh, prefix array. Then we're gonna get the next value, which is negative one. We're gonna add that to our total so far, and that's gonna total to be one. We're gonna add that to our prefix sum array. And we're gonna just keep doing that. Three plus one is gonna be four, and then uh, negative three, plus four is gonna be one, and then four plus one is gonna be five. So we only do that once. Now when we wanna calculate the range sum of any subarray, we can do it in constant time. Because we did the pre-work here, we did an O of N uh, work to initialize the prefix sums, uh, now we can do the range sums a lot quicker. If we solved this problem without prefix sums, we just had a single array, our constructor would have been efficient because all we would have done is just copied nums into like a member variable. For that, that would have been a constant time operation, but our range sum would have been a linear time operation. And assuming that we're gonna be calling range sum very frequently and we're not gonna be calling you know the constructor very frequently, that's why solving this with prefix sums is more efficient because we're assuming that range sum is gonna be called more frequently. Now range sum is not super complicated. So assuming our left and right indices were this and assuming our left and right indices were this for one call to this, we would want the prefix sum of the right portion. So where our right pointer ends, we'd want the total sum of this which we could just get from this index. So that's exactly what we're doing here. We're taking the right index and getting the value from our prefix sum array. So this is the right prefix. So this is the right prefix sum. We also want the left prefix sum, which is just as easy. We just take the value at the left index of our prefix sum array. But what about the case where we're computing this prefix sum? And then we'd also want to remove the prefix sums of all values to the left of our left pointer. So that is just as easy because we would just take the prefix sum of left minus one. So you can see that over here, but there's one catch because what if we were computing this uh, range sum. Well, in that case, the left minus one index is out of bounds. We definitely don't want to go out of bounds. There's nothing there for our prefix sum anyway. So how would we calculate the sum of this subarray anyway? Well, we know that this value here would represent this sum and we would go left minus one over here and then subtract that value, but that's out of bounds. So what should the default value be over here that we want to subtract from our total. Well, the default value should just be zero, right? Because we don't want to subtract anything from this sum. This sum tells us the value that we want to return, right? Like this value tells us the prefix sum, which is the sum of our subarray. So what we say is, over here, I do this with a ternary operator, but you can actually have like a full if else statement if you want. I just think this is shorter and this works in most languages with a ternary operator, uh, but we want to do this if our left pointer is greater than zero. But if our left pointer is uh, equal to zero exactly at that zero index, then we want to uh, set this to a default value of 
zero. And then once we have that, we simply take the right prefix sum. So for this example, that would be this value and subtract from it the left prefix, which would be this value. So that would tell us this sum, subtracting this sum would uh, give us zero because one minus one is zero and that's what the uh, sum of this subarray is. So that's how we would do it. So I think this is one of the patterns that isn't super crazy, especially once you get familiar with it. It comes up a lot. This is definitely one of the most common patterns when it comes to data structures in general, even in coding interviews. And luckily it's not super crazy. So I definitely recommend practicing this pattern. There's a ton of problems that can be solved using prefix sums or postfix sums or sometimes prefixes uh, without sums. Maybe it'll be a product or something else. It's a pretty open-ended pattern. Next, let's look at another two-pointer algorithm. This time, usually it's used for linked lists. It's called the fast and slow pointer algorithm. It can also be called Floyd's tortoise and hare algorithm. The tortoise is essentially the slow pointer and the hare is the fast pointer. It can be used for a lot of things. The first example we're gonna look at is pretty trivial. It's finding the middle of a linked list, which can actually be accomplished without this algorithm. The easiest way to determine the middle of a linked list would be to you know, count the length, so one, two, three, four, five. So we have the length and then we would find the midway point. When we have a linked list that's odd length, it's pretty straightforward what the midway point is here. But what if we actually had a linked list of even length? What would we define the middle? Well, we have two middle nodes. We could say this is the middle or that's the middle. Let's say that for this question, we assume this is the middle node. So of the two middle nodes with a linked list that's even length, we would take the second one and say it's the middle. So by calculating the length, we can also solve this problem in O of n time. We just have to iterate through the linked list, find the length, then start at the beginning again, and then iterate through half the list, and then we would find the midway point. That's a linear time algorithm. Now this two pointer technique, fast and slow pointer, is also going to be a linear time algorithm. So there's no improvements with this algorithm, but I think it's important to understand because it can be applied in many different areas, which we're gonna talk about here. The idea is that we have two pointers, a fast pointer and a slow pointer. We initialize them at the head of the linked list. Now on each iteration of the loop, we're gonna take this fast pointer and shift it by two spaces. That's why it's the fast pointer. The slow pointer is gonna be shifted by one space each time. That's why it's the slow pointer. The fast pointer is clearly twice as fast as the slow pointer. We're gonna keep doing this until one of the pointers reaches the end of the linked list. Now it's no surprise that the fast pointer is going to reach the end before the slow pointer. So again here, the fast pointer is gonna be incremented by two positions and the slow pointer is gonna be incremented by one. When we say reach the end of the linked list, that means the fast pointer is either at the last node in the linked list or it's equal to null. So in this case, we would say the fast pointer is at the end of the linked list. Now you tell me if the fast pointer traveled the entire length of the linked list, how far did the slow pointer travel given that it's traveling half as fast as the fast pointer? Well, the slow pointer would have traveled half the length of the linked list. That means by the time the fast pointer reaches the end of the linked list, the slow pointer should be at the middle of the linked list. And you can see it works out perfectly, at least when we have a linked list that's of odd length. How would it work out if we had a linked list that's of even length? Let's assume this node doesn't even exist. In that case, fast pointer again would be shifted twice it's not quite at the end. Slow pointer would be shifted by one. Now that's after one iteration of the loop. Let's give it one more iteration. The fast pointer would be shifted twice. Here, it would be null. This four we're assuming is pointing at null. This node doesn't even exist. Slow pointer would be incremented by one. So this is after two iterations of the loop. The fast pointer reached the end of the linked list. The slow pointer is once again exactly where it needs to be. It's at the midway point because we defined the second node as being the midway point when we have a tie like this one, when we have linked lists of even length. So it worked out perfectly in this case, but what if we had defined this as being the middle? When we have a when we have a tie, we actually want the first node to be considered the middle. Well, it wouldn't be very complicated actually. We would just have to augment this algorithm slightly. 
We would initialize the slow pointer here, and we would initialize the fast pointer here. And then we would increment this twice, and then we would increment the slow pointer once. Fast pointer has reached the end. Slow pointer has reached the middle, because now we're saying that this is the middle of the linked list. The idea is that the fast and slow pointers can be used to find the middle of a linked list. So this is what the code for that would look like. It's more simple than you would expect. We just take two pointers, slow and fast, initialize them to the head of the linked list, while the fast pointer is not null, and while the fast pointer dot next is not null. This basically means while we have not reached the last node of the linked list, because if we did, then fast dot next would be null, so then we would also stop. But while that's not the case, we're gonna increment the slow pointer by one, set it to slow.next, increment the fast pointer twice, set it to fast.next.next, .next, and then continue doing that until the fast pointer reaches the end of the linked list, and then we would return slow, which should be at the middle of the linked list. And by the way, what if we were given an empty linked list, a null linked list? This algorithm actually would work as well. That's the beauty of it because slow and fast would be initialized to head. Assuming head is equal to null, this loop would never even execute and we would end up returning slow, which is equal to null. So it does handle all the edge cases that we're looking for. But there's one thing we haven't talked about. What if the linked list actually had a cycle in it? That means what if this node five actually was pointing at a previous node like three. That would mean as we traverse this linked list, we would never stop. This loop would never stop. We would get to the five and then go back to the three and then back to the four and back to the five. This algorithm would run forever. But believe it or not, fast and slow pointers can actually be used for cycle detection. Let's take a look at how that is. Suppose we're given a linked list like this one, which clearly contains a cycle. We start at the one, we go to the two, we go to the three, the four, the five, and then we end up back at the two. So we see that there's some portion that's not a part of the cycle, but eventually there is a cycle. And that's the part that we're gonna get stuck in. This might not necessarily exist. This might have been longer. We might've had two or three or four nodes before the cycle, or we might have had none at all. But the point is that there's a cycle. Now, given any arbitrary linked list, we want to determine if it has a cycle or not. Now, if a cycle does exist, that means as we traverse the linked list, we will eventually see the same node twice. So eventually, in this case, we will see the two twice. Now, we would also see the other nodes twice if we kept traversing, but this would be the first node that we saw twice. How can we detect that? How can we detect duplicates well, the easiest way would be using some kind of hashing data structure, in this case, a hash set. If we're told that the values of each node are unique, we can use that and add them to the hash set, but we might not be guaranteed that. So an easier thing to do would be take you know, the pointer of every single node and add it to a hash set. Then if we ever visit the same node twice, in this case, we would eventually get to the two node. We would see that it's already been added to the hash set. That means this is a duplicate node. That means we somehow visited it twice. So of course there must be a cycle in the linked list and then we would return true. But what if there's not a cycle? What would happen? Suppose this five didn't point at anything. Suppose it's pointing at null. Well, in that case, we would have a pointer and then it would keep iterating through the entire linked list until eventually it reached null. If we reach null, that's the end of the linked list. So of course it can't have a cycle. So then we would return false. The only problem with this is it's taking us extra memory. We have to take every single node and add it to a hash set. That's taking O of n time complexity, but also O of n memory complexity. How can we eliminate this extra memory need? Well, you guessed it, the fast and slow pointer technique. First, I'm gonna walk you through this algorithm and then we're gonna discuss why exactly it works. So once again, we start with two pointers. We initialize both of them at the head. One is gonna be the fast pointer and one is gonna be the slow pointer. We're gonna increment the fast pointer by two spaces. So one, two, so it's gonna end up over here. We're gonna increment the slow pointer by one position, so it's gonna end up over here. So this is what the pointers would look like after one iteration of the loop. Next, again, we're gonna increment the fast pointer by two spaces, so it's gonna end up over here. The slow pointer is only gonna be incremented by one position, so it's gonna be over here. Fast pointer, once again, is gonna be shifted by two spaces, so you might naively think, well, looks like the fast and slow pointer 
are intersecting, but we're simultaneously shifting the fast and slow pointer at the same time. So the fast pointer was shifted twice. That means the slow pointer has to be shifted once. So actually they were not overlapping just yet, but now we're gonna shift fast pointer two spaces one more time. So fast pointer will end up over here. Slow pointer will also end up over here. It's gonna be shifted by one. So now they are intersecting. If the fast and slow pointer intersect, then we know there's a cycle in the linked list so we can return true. But now let's talk about why is it that if the two pointers intersect, that implies that the linked list has a cycle? Well, the idea is actually pretty simple. We have two pointers. The fast pointer should always be ahead of the slow pointer. And that is the case. Here the slow pointer was here, the fast pointer was here. Next, the slow pointer was over here, but the fast pointer was already a few spaces ahead. But if it turns out that we have a loop in our linked list, a circle of some kind, that's the only way that the slow pointer would be able to catch up with the fast pointer. Because if our linked list was a straight line, the fast pointer would always be twice as far ahead as the slow pointer, but that's not the case. Here we had a circle, a loop, so the slow pointer was able to catch up. So that's how we know we have a cycle, but why is it guaranteed that the slow and fast pointer are going to intersect? What if they never intersect? Then we would never know if we have a cycle or not. Well, if we do have a cycle, it's guaranteed that they're gonna intersect. Why is that? Because the fast pointer is going twice as fast. We saw that at the beginning, they start at the same position, but eventually the slow pointer and the fast pointer have both entered this cycle. In this case, it's a cycle of length four. If they're not at the same position, in this case, they're not at the same position, there must be some distance separating them. Previously, I said the slow pointer will catch up to the fast pointer, but that's not quite true. Actually, the fast pointer will catch up to the slow pointer. It's gonna overlap it. So here, you can see that the distance between the slow pointer and the fast pointer is one, but the fast pointer will be the one that catches up. So the distance between the fast pointer and the slow pointer is one, two, three, three spaces. But if the slow pointer is moving by one and the fast pointer is moving by one, two spaces, then the distance between them should be shrinking by one every single time. When we took our slow pointer and shifted it over here and we took the fast pointer and then shifted it by two spaces, the fast pointer was over here. Now what's the distance between them? Well, the fast pointer only has to move one, two spaces now, two spaces to catch up to the slow pointer. So the distance went from three to being two. It decreased by one. And again, the slow pointer is shifted by one over here. The fast pointer is shifted by two to be over here. Now the distance between them is only one. It keeps shrinking by one every iteration of the loop until finally one more iteration, the fast pointer was shifted by two to be over here. Slow pointer was shifted by one to be over here. Now the distance between them is zero. They've intersected. So we know we have a cycle. So at this point we can return true. That's why we're guaranteed that the two pointers are going to intersect at some point. And the last claim that I wanna make is that this intersection will actually happen in linear time. We're guaranteed that it's gonna happen in linear time. The reason is that eventually the slow pointer will have entered the cycle over here. The fast pointer is also a part of the cycle. The distance from the fast pointer to the slow pointer can't possibly be longer than the length of the cycle. In this case, it's three where the length of the cycle is four. So if the length from the fast pointer to the slow pointer is three, how many more iterations of the loop is it gonna take us for these two pointers to intersect? Well, of course it's gonna be three. So basically what I'm saying is by the time the slow pointer enters the cycle, the slow pointer won't have to traverse longer than the length of the cycle. And we saw that the slow pointer went here, then here, then here. It never had to loop multiple times. So what I'm saying is the slow pointer will only have to iterate through the entire length of the linked list. The fast pointer, of course, will have to iterate through two times that. So we could say that the overall time complexity is maybe two times n, where n is the you know, length of the entire linked list, but we know that will also reduce to big O 
of n. So that's why this is always going to be a linear time algorithm, because a slow pointer won't possibly have to iterate through longer than the entire le length of the list. So the fast pointer will have to do twice that much, but that's still a linear time algorithm. So the code, once again, is actually going to be very simple. We have two pointers, initialize both of them at the head, while the fast pointer has not gone out of bounds, if the fast pointer reaches null or reaches the last node of the length list, that means there can't be a cycle. So this loop would stop and then we would return false. But if that's not the case, we will keep shifting the pointers, slow pointer by one, fast pointer by two, and if eventually they are equal to each other, we will return true. That means we do have a cycle. So if this whole idea of cycle detection was not confusing enough, now let's look at one last example. So suppose we're given a linked list and we want to determine if it has a cycle, but in this case, if it does have a cycle, we want to return the head of that cycle. If it doesn't have a cycle, then I guess we can just return some default value like null. What is the head of the cycle? Well, in this example, we have some portion that's not a part of the cycle, but the beginning of the cycle starts here. So that's what we would return. Now, we might not have had this node at all. Maybe this is the head of the linked list. So this would also be the head of the cycle. The beginning of the linked list is a part of a cycle. So that's what we would return. Or we might have a bunch more nodes that come before the cycle. So this problem can also be solved with a fast and slow pointer. So what I'm going to first do is show you how to solve this problem. The solution is surprisingly simple, but next we're going to understand why it works, which is not as simple. So we're going to have two pointers, a fast pointer and a slow pointer. We're, we're going to shift the fast pointer by two spaces, same as we did earlier. So fast pointer would be over here. Slow pointer is going to be shifted by one. It's going to be over here. Then again, fast pointer is going to be shifted twice until it's over here. Slow pointer is going to be shifted by one until it's over here. Fast pointer is again shifted twice. It's over here now. Slow pointer is shifted by one. It's over here. Now, lastly, fast pointer is shifted twice until it's over here. Slow pointer is shifted by one until it's over here. So basically we do the same thing that we did earlier until the two pointers intersect. Of course, they might not intersect. Maybe the fast pointer goes out of bounds. In that case, we would return null as the result. But in this case, they do intersect. That's when we know we definitely have a cycle. But the two pointers don't necessarily intersect at the beginning of the cycle. So we know for sure that they intersect here, but now we don't know how many more spots do we have to move before we get to the head of the cycle. Well, the solution is actually really easy, but very unintuitive. We have a slow pointer here. What I'm going to do now is create a second slow pointer, and I'm gonna set it back to the beginning of the linked list. So I'm gonna call that S2. It's the second slow pointer. S1 is still over here. Now, at this point, we're gonna forget about the fast pointer. We don't even care about the fast pointer anymore. All we know is that the slow and fast pointer intersected over here. At this point, we're gonna increment the second slow pointer by one every time. That's why it's called the slow pointer. And we're also gonna increment the original slow pointer. And it's still over here, by the way, we're gonna increment it by one. We're gonna shift it by one every time. These two pointers are guaranteed to intersect at the start of the linked list. They're guaranteed to intersect here. And when they do intersect here, that's the node that we would return. So when we're asked to return the head of the cycle, this is what we would return. So it works perfectly. And it's just that simple. If you just want to know what the algorithm is, what I described to you is the entire thing. And luckily the code for it is not super complicated either. It just has a second loop. So what we would do is the first portion of the algorithm is where we start at the head and we keep shifting our slow and fast pointers until they equal each other, in which case we would break out of the loop or here where the fast pointer might go out of bounds, that would mean we reach the end of the linked list. So here after that while loop stops, we have a condition to check did we reach the end of the list? Because if that's the case, then we can just go ahead and return null. 
But if we didn't reach the end of the list, then we have the second phase that I just talked about, where our slow pointer, our original slow pointer, is still where it initially was, is still where it left off, but now we create a second slow pointer at the head of the length list, and here we keep shifting these two pointers by one each time until they equal each other. We know they will eventually intersect and that they will intersect at the head of the cycle. And when that happens, we return that head. So that's the algorithm itself. Now let's talk about why it works. So let's say we're given some arbitrary linked list where it has some uh, portion before the cycle and it has a cycle of arbitrary length. Of course, here the cycle is of length four, but let's assume this is some arbitrary linked list where the cycle could be of any length. We know that at some point in the linked list, the two nodes are gonna intersect. Let's just call this arbitrarily the point of intersection. So I'll mark it with an X. We have three portions here. We have this part, which I'm gonna call P, it's the portion before we actually get to the head of the cycle. It could be zero if we if this portion didn't exist, right? But here we're assigning some variable to it. The length of the cycle itself, I'm gonna call C. Now, the, the length from the beginning of the cycle to the point of intersection, I'm gonna call the length of that equal to the length of the cycle minus x. Now this x is not to be confused with this x over here. I just you know put some symbol over here just to say that this is the point of intersection. Maybe I'll just make it a circle instead. Then the last thing would be that the remaining portion of the cycle is going to be x because we know that the entire length of the cycle is c. So if this portion is x, then the other remaining portion should be c minus x. I know this is a little bit confusing, but I'm just setting up the math here. So recall that the slow pointer travels twice as slow as the fast pointer. That means if the fast pointer covered this much distance, then the amount of distance that the slow pointer covered multiplied by two is going to be equal to how much the fast pointer covered. Like this is just distance here two times the slow distance is equal to the fast distance. And we know that's always the case, and we know that both of the pointers are going to intersect at some arbitrary position. So what distance will the slow pointer have to travel anyway? Well, it would start at the beginning, it would have to travel this p distance, and then it would also have to travel this c minus x distance. And remember, this could be arbitrary. It could be at, you know, it's here, it could be here, it could be, here it could have to travel the entire loop, but the slow pointer we know won't have to complete multiple cycles. It won't have to go through multiple laps of the cycle for reasons we talked about earlier. So this is the distance the slow pointer will have to travel. The fast pointer will also have to travel this P distance. It'll also have to make an entire loop through the cycle which is, we know, C, and then it'll also have to travel this portion, C minus X, and then the fast pointer will arrive at this spot. So by the time the pointers intersect, so this is the distance that they would have to travel. We know that the slow pointer has to travel P plus C minus X, which is the length of this portion, and we know that two times the length that the slow pointer traveled is equal to the length that the fast pointer traveled, and the fast pointer has to also travel this P portion portion, then it has to make an entire cycle around here, which is where the C comes from, and then it has to travel this last portion, which is C minus X, which is where this comes from. Now we can do a little bit of algebra. We see both sides will have two C's, so we can get rid of those two C's. We know both sides have, a, well, one side has a P, and the other side would have two P's, so we can get rid of the P on this side. This side had minus 2x, this size had minus 1x, so we add an x to both sides, then we're left with p minus x is equal to zero, so we can solve for p, p is equal to x. So we went through all that math just to find that p is equal to x. But it makes sense because what we found is this length, after the two pointers intersect, the length from that node to the head of the cycle is equal to the length of the beginning to the head of the cycle. We don't necessarily know what that length actually is. If we did, it would be easy. 
But because we don't know what that length is, we don't know what P or X is, we, what we say is we'll keep a slow pointer over here and we'll keep a slow pointer over here. We don't know how far we're gonna have to travel, but we know that if we keep shifting the two pointers by one each time, eventually when they intersect, they will intersect at the head of the cycle. And then that's what we can return. So that was quite a lot and probably more math than you were expecting. It's okay if you don't completely understand this, and it's especially okay if you wouldn't be able to come up with the math proof yourself on the spot, but fast and slow pointers are a common technique to solve difficult problems like this, and what we talked about can be an interview question that comes up, so I think it's worth understanding even if you're just gonna memorize the algorithm itself because it's not a complicated algorithm, the proof is what's complicated in this case. Next, let's talk about a different kind of tree structure. It's called a tri. Another name for it, and probably the better name for it, is prefix tree. The goal of a prefix tree is to be able to insert words in constant time. By word, I mean a string of characters. That's usually what tries are used for, strings of characters, usually not integers and other types of values. So we want to be able to insert a word in constant time. When we say constant time, that also could be, you know, the size of the word itself, because to insert a word, of course, we have to go through every single character of that word. So maybe a better way to say this would be O of N, where N is the size of the word. But we also want to be able to search for the existence of a word in constant time as well. Given some word, we should be able to check does it exist or not very efficiently. Now you might be thinking, can't both of these operations most easily be achieved using like a hash set? And the answer is yes, but there's one last operation that a hash set can't get for us. Maybe the most important operation is being able to search for a prefix. That's why we call this a prefix tree. What I mean is we could insert and search for a full word. For example, apple. We could also do that with a hash map, but with a hash map, we can't search for prefixes. What I mean is, given a prefix like just AP, we want to know, are there any words in our prefix tree with this prefix? Obviously, the word apple does match that prefix, so with a prefix tree, we would be able to return true, and we would be able to do it efficiently, you know, O of 1, aka the size of the prefix itself. But with a hash map, there's no easy way to do this. We would, in the worst case, have to go through every single string that we inserted into the hash map. So this is the problem that we're trying to solve. And before I get into the implementation of this data structure, an application for this would be with search engines or any kind of searching at all. For example, when you use Google search and you start typing a few characters and it auto completes or it gives you a few suggestions, it essentially uses a prefix tree. It uses the prefix that you type in and it checks what strings match that prefix. So it definitely is an important data structure and it's definitely one that can also come up in coding interviews. The good thing is that it's actually easier to implement than you might expect. So let's get started. Like I said, a try is essentially a tree of characters. So each node in this case is going to be a character. And the most common restriction, especially for coding interviews, is that we only have to worry about lowercase letters from A through Z. But even if we had a larger character set, it wouldn't make a huge difference in the structure of this. You know, we could have A through Z and capital A through Z. We could have, you know, larger alphabets. It doesn't really make a difference. Lowercase A through Z gives us 26 characters we have to worry about. So in that case, we would have a tree that looks something like this. You can think of it as having a single root node that's empty. The root node won't really have anything. Or maybe a better way to think about it would be we have 20 26 root nodes in this case, one for each character that we're worrying about. What that essentially means is that all the words that start with the character A are going to go down this path in the tree. Obviously, I haven't drawn all 26, that would be too large, but this character, lowercase character A, is going to have all words that start with the character A. So, you know, this is going to have children from A to B to C to Z and all those 26 characters. And each of those are also going to have 26 children at most. I mean, it doesn't necessarily have to actually have any children at all. But if we were, for example, looking for 
the word Apple, we would of course want to go to this branch because Apple starts with the character A. What's the second character of Apple? Well, it's P. So then we would go down this path. And at that point we would check, do we have a second P in here? If we do, then you know we keep going down that path. We're still looking for the word Apple, but maybe we don't have a P here. We haven't inserted that character. Maybe we have an E, but that's it. We don't have any other children here. Then we know for sure we can't possibly contain the word Apple because this is where it would be if we had inserted it, but it's clearly not here. So we have not inserted the word Apple. Now, another thing to note about this tree is that since each node could have up to 26 children in this case, but it could also have zero children or any number in between zero and 26. So it doesn't really make sense to give every single node a left and right pointer or define a variable for every single child anyway. An easier way to do this would be a hash map. So every node is going to have a value, but also it's going to have a hash map of all of its children. And the key of that hash map is going to be some character, you know, from A through Z. So each character is going to map to some node. So this is what the code would actually look like. It might be a little bit unintuitive at first. Let's first focus on the try node itself, and then we'll take a look at the full try class. But a try node has children, and in this case, this is a hash map in Python, so it's an empty hash map initially. And using a hash map makes it pretty flexible. We were talking about 26 characters, so we could have actually defined an array of size 26 if we wanted to, but a hash map makes it a lot more flexible. That's why it's easy to handle uppercase A through Z as well, or maybe any type of alphabet that we really needed to. For every node, we're also going to have a Boolean value to determine if this character is the end of a word or not. We'll get more into that later on, but for now, you can kind of ignore this. But notice how the try node itself doesn't actually store any characters. We could store a character in each node if we wanted to, but it's redundant because you can see in our try class, we have a root node, which is a try node. And that try node has 26 children. That's what I meant when I said we can kind of assume that we have an empty root node, which has up to 26 children. So for the roots children, if we access the children field and then we access maybe the A character, that is all the information we need. That's where the character is stored. It's stored as a key of the children map. It doesn't need to actually be stored in the try node itself. That can be a little bit unintuitive at first. But I think after we walk through each of these algorithms, it'll start to make more sense to you. So let's say we created an instance of this try, and the first thing we want to do is insert some words into it. Let's say the first word that we want to insert is apple. How would the search algorithm work? Well, of course, we're going to go to our root node, which is sort of the empty node. And we want to start going through every character in this input word, Apple, and we want to insert every single character into the try. And it's really that straightforward. We're going to go through every character, iterate through it. And if that character has not already been inserted into the try, meaning, you know, A is not one of the children of the root node, then we're going to insert that A character. We're going to create a new try node for the character A. Even though we're not passing A in as a parameter to the try node, it's okay because the key of the hash map, you know, of the children of the root node is the lowercase character a. So here we're going to say for the lowercase character a, we inserted a try node. And then, you know, initially our current pointer was here at the root. Now the current pointer is going to be shifted to the new node that we just inserted. So now our current pointer is going to be over here. And we're going to just go character by character at this point. It's just that straightforward. So P, P is not a child of A. So let's insert a new character for P or a new try node for P. So one of the children of A now is a new try node. And for P, it also needs a child for P. And then this also needs a child for L, which needs a child for E. So we inserted our word Apple. 
And the last thing we want to do before we return is for the last character, we have a pointer to this character, we want to mark it as the end of a word. So when we create every try node, initially we set this variable to false, it's not the ending of a word. But after we insert the last character, we want to mark that as the end of a word, I'm going to do so with a green circle like that. I'll talk a bit more about that later on. Now suppose we want to search for a word, which is actually very similar to inserting a word. And let's say we're searching for the word apple, the word that we just inserted. So we would start at the root node, we would go character by character through the input, so we would start at the character A. We would check, is A a child of the root node? Yes it is in this case, it's here. Now if A did not exist, suppose none of these existed, we would see that lowercase a is not a child of the root, and then we would immediately return false. There's no need to go down this path because the character doesn't exist, then the word must not exist and we can return false. But in this case, it does. So what we would do is shift our pointer to that child here. And, you, and we do that with this line of code. And so we're gonna keep doing that now for every character. Now we're looking for P. Is P a child of A? Yes, it is. And we can do that in constant time, by the way. We're, for every character, we're simply iterating through every single character, and then the rest of the operations are constant time operations. That's why this search function can run in you know, constant time or maybe linear time if n is, let's say, the size of the word. And you can see that that's pretty much the exact same for the insert function. It's also the same for the other function that we're going to talk about. So at this point, our pointer would be at this p. We would be looking for the next p. So is p a child of, you know, this p? Yes, it is. And then we would move our pointer there. Now we're looking for the l. Is L a child of P? Yep, it's right there. So then our pointer would move here. Is E a child of L? Yes, it is. So now our pointer would be here. We iterated through every character for the word that we were searching for. Now, can we immediately return true? Well, not quite. We're going to return whether this character is the end of a word or not. In this case, it is. We marked that with a green circle. So we would return true in this case. The word apple does exist in our try. But what if instead we were looking for the word a. We want to know, does the word A exist in our try? Well, we would do the same thing. Start at the root. Does it have a child? That's the character A. Yep. So then our current pointer would be here. And that was the only character we were looking for. So our loop would have terminated. We'd be out here. And then we would want to know, is this the ending of a word or not? Well, it was never marked as the ending of a word. E was marked as the end of a word, but this was not. So we would return false. The word A does not exist in our prefix tree. And that makes sense because just because we inserted the word apple doesn't mean we inserted the word A or the word AP and you know every prefix of this word. That's why every time we insert a word, we mark the last character as the end of a word. Because then when we search, we don't want to say that, you know, this is a word. We never inserted this word. We inserted apple. Suppose the next word that we want to insert is the word ape. So we call our insert function again. Our current pointer is going to be set to the root. We're going to go character by character in the word ape. Is, the, is A a child of the root node? It is, so we don't have to insert a new lowercase a. That's the point. We don't want redundant nodes. We don't need two lowercase a's that are both you know, children of the root. Because we want all words that start with A to go down this branch. We don't want to have to search two branches or multiple branches. We just want a single branch to be able to search for. So when we're inserting the word ape, we see the lowercase a has already been inserted. So we go to the next iteration. We're trying to insert the lowercase p. We see that's also already been inserted in the second position. So now we're trying to insert the lowercase e. That has not been inserted. So at this point, we can add a new character character for the lowercase e. And the last thing we can do is mark this as the end of a word. So you can see as we insert each word, we're just going character by character. That's why this is so efficient. And this also helps keep our search efficient as well. So let's insert one last word, no. We see that there's no root with the character n, so we can go ahead and insert that. And then for these, of course, we would just have to insert every other character, o, p, and e. So now let's move on to the last function starts with, which is the main purpose of this 
data structure starts with doesn't necessarily take a word, it takes a prefix that we want to match to you know, possible words that exist in our data structure. And we want to return true if there's any words that start with this prefix and false if there's not. Suppose we're given a prefix no. So for this prefix, so let's check, are there any words that start with the prefix no? At this point, you probably know exactly what to do because this function is similar to the others. That's why this data structure is actually a little bit easier than people expect. So we start at the root. Is there a child with the character n? This one. So then our pointer would move here. Are there any children for this node with the character o? Yep, this guy. And we can do this very efficiently because our children are a hash map. So we can check that very efficiently. So at this point, our loop stops because we went through the entire prefix. And since current is not null, our pointer is not null, we can return true. But if we ever got to a point where we were looking for some character and it didn't exist in our prefix tree, we would immediately return false. There's no point then to go through the rest of these characters. For example, if we didn't even have an N inserted into our prefix tree, then we could immediately stop. We wouldn't even have to go through the rest of the prefix. So a try can be really helpful for searching for prefixes. It's also efficient for inserting and searching for words altogether. Oh, and I think I forgot to mention, we would have marked this E as the ending of a word as well, just to illustrate that. Instead of calling starts with on this prefix, what if we were just searching for this word? So we would call search, we would go character by character, we start at the root, N exists, so we move to it, O exists, so we move here. So this character exists, but, it, but is it the ending of a word? That's what we would return current.word, which represents a true or false Boolean value. In this case, it's not the ending of a word, so we would return false. While there are words that start with this prefix, this prefix itself is not necessarily a word. So that's the distinction here. So if you just learned about prefix trees, I hope this was easier than you were expecting, and now you have a new data structure in your toolkit. So now let's move on to the union find data structure, AKA the disjoint sets data structure. And I personally think that this is an underrated data structure. It doesn't really come up super often, but when it does, I kind of enjoy coding it up. Now it's technically a tree data structure, but it's mostly applied to generic graphs. So it can get kind of complicated, but the implementation is surprisingly easier than you would think. Suppose we had a generic graph that looked kind of like this. Maybe it had directed edges. Maybe, you know, this is what it looks like. So even though it's a single graph, we actually have two disjoint sets because the entire graph is not connected. We're used to dealing with connected graphs like trees where every node is connected. We don't have usually graphs where we have two separate entities of the graph, but that's the case here. That's the strength of the union find data structure. It can deal with disjoint sets where we could have one or more connected components. This would be considered a connected component of the entire graph because all of these nodes are connected. This would also be a connected component, but the entire graph itself is not connected. So if we were given a graph like this, the strength of the union find data structure would be to count the number of connected components in this case. It can also be used for cycle detection. Suppose we had a graph like this. Union find would be able to determine that this graph does not have any cycles. But if we add an edge like this one, union find would be able to tell us that this graph indeed does have a cycle. Now you might be wondering, can't these operations also be satisfied using just a generic DFS algorithm? And usually that is the case. That's why union find is pretty rare to see usually DFS can accomplish the same thing in the same time complexity, but sometimes union find is more efficient and sometimes union find is required. So now let's get into the implementation of the data structure. Suppose we're given a list of edges like these, and we want to determine if this graph has a cycle or not. Let's say we're also given the total number of nodes, which is four in this case. So we have four nodes here and these are the edges of that graph. Let's say each edge is directed, so one, two basically means one points to two. 
Let's say in this case, each edge is undirected. So one, two basically means one and two point at each other. So how could we use union find to solve this problem? Well, first of all, union find is a forest of trees. Forest of trees basically means we have a bunch of trees. The way we initialize this, essentially we have a tree for every single disjoint set. Now initially we assume that all four of our nodes are disjoint sets. We don't know any information about these nodes, we just know that we have four of them. But now we're gonna start going through the edges and connecting these guys together. Now for each node, we don't store a lot of information. We just store what is the parent of that node. Initially, all of these nodes don't have a parent. They're just a single node. But an easier way to do that, especially in terms of code, is just to say that the node itself is its own parent. That's the way I like to implement it at least. But you can see it both ways. Sometimes people will say it doesn't have a parent. I like to say every node is just initialized to its own parent. And at this point, it gets pretty straightforward, actually. We have an edge one, two. What do you think we're gonna do among these? Well, we had four separate graphs. Now we know that one and two are connected to each other, so we should connect these two nodes. So essentially what we do is we take one of the nodes and set it as the parent of the other node. So in this case, I'm gonna say two is gonna be a child of one. So now two has a parent which is now one. It was arbitrary how we did this. We could have also taken one and added it as a child of two. It doesn't really matter in this case, but it will matter in some cases, but we'll get to that in a bit. We went through the first node, now let's go through the second node. And actually to illustrate things a little bit better, I'm gonna do this edge first. So actually let's focus on this edge first. So two, four, we want to union two and four together. So what should we do? Well. We could arbitrarily take one and set it to be the child of the other. We could take this four and set it to be a child of two. Or maybe we could even take two and set it to be a child of four. But two already has a parent, so we're running into a problem. We can't arbitrarily pick in this case. The best way to get around this problem is instead of unioning the two nodes themselves, how about we go from that node all the way up to its parent and then eventually to the root node of you know this tree. This is a tree at this point. And we go to the root, which in this case is just one. But you know maybe there were multiple chains and there were multiple nodes up ahead. We would keep going until we got to the root. And then we would take the roots of these two trees and then union them together. Now in this case, we sort of have a choice because they're not symmetrical in this case. It's not arbitrary which one we pick. They're not the same size as what I'm getting at. So what do you think would be better to take this tree and add it as a child of this, which would look something like this? Or should we instead take four and add it as a child of one? Well, this one definitely looks a little bit more balanced, but why is being balanced important? Well, what I just talked about, when we are trying to union two nodes together, in this case, two and four, the first thing we wanna do for these two nodes is find the parent of these two nodes, or rather not the parent, the root of these two nodes. So for two, the root is one. For four, the root is itself. And then after we find the parents, we want to then union these two disjoint sets together so that they form a single disjoint set, so that they form a single set. But we know we might continuously run the find operation on nodes. So if we have a balanced tree, then the find operation is going to be more efficient than you know if we just take this and insert it as a child here. At that point, we have a linked list. That's not really efficient to traverse. Imagine we have to find the root of this child, then we have to go all the way up the chain. Whereas if we take this four and you know move it to be a child of one, this is a bit more balanced. We don't have to go up you know an entire chain. For two, we just have to go up one step. For four, we just have to go up one step to find it its root. This operation that we talked about is called union by rank, which just means height. So we take 
the height of the trees that we're unioning and take that into consideration. We could do it arbitrarily if we wanted to, but it's more efficient when we union by height. We saw that this tree had a smaller height than this tree, so we took the smaller tree and then added it as a child of the larger tree. And even when we connected them, we connected it straight to the root because that also makes it more efficient to find the root. We could have taken this four and you know connected it over here, but you know why would we do that? So now we've processed this edge over here. And by the way, based on these two edges, one and two are connected and two and four are connected, we would have a graph that looks something like this, wouldn't we? Where two is connected to one and two is connected to four. But with our union find, we ended up with a tree that looks like this. Two is connected to one and four is connected to one. Well, that's kind of the point. Union find doesn't necessarily accurately represent the graph. It's about being able to detect cycles and about being able to count the number of connected components. So now let's go through the last edge for one. That means we have to first find the parent of four. So we would start at four, go to its parent and keep you know, going up the chain until we can't go any higher. One is the parent of four. One is the root of four. And for one, we also got to find the root of it. Of course, it's itself. So now we looked for the roots of both of these and they're the same. What does that mean? Well, that of course means that these two nodes, one and four, are part of the same connected component. That means that we can't union these. They're already a part of the same set. But we could return some value to indicate we were not successfully able to union. We could return false, for example. Basically, that would indicate that these are already connected. And in the context of this problem, that would indicate that this graph has a cycle because we're connecting two nodes that were already connected. That, that's at least assuming that all edges here were unique. And in this case, they were unique. That means we must have a cycle. Let's draw what this graph would look like to confirm. We have a one, we have a two, and we have a four. One and two are connected, four and one are connected, and two and four are also connected. I mean, we do also have a three, but it's not connected to anybody. So this is our graph, and our graph indeed does have a cycle. At least one of the components has a cycle. So now let's move on to the code. It's surprisingly not super difficult, but there are some gotchas, and there are a couple things that we didn't talk about in the drawing just yet. So we have our union find class. The constructor would usually take one parameter, tell, usually telling us the size of our set. You know, n in this case would be the number of nodes of our graph. And we know that for every single node, we want to keep track of what its parent is. I think the easiest way to do that is with a hash map. You can also do it with an array, especially if you're given some values, you know, in between a range of one through four, for example, that could be handled with an array. But I like to do it with a hash map. It's more generic. It works pretty much the exact same anyway. Now for every single tree, we also want to keep track of its rank. And by rank, we mean height because we want the height of our trees to be as small as possible. That makes our find operation more efficient. Now, when we have a tree like this, every one of these has a rank. So the height, aka the rank of this guy is one, the rank of this guy is one, the rank of this guy is two. But of course the ranks of these don't really matter anymore. They're irrelevant at this point because we're never going to be unioning these guys anymore. Anytime we want to union two with somebody else, like for example three, we're going to end up going from two up to its parent. That's where the find operation comes in. Given some node, we want to find its parent. We want to do that so that we can perform the union operation. How do we find the parent? And by parent, we usually mean the root parent. So P in this case is going to be the parent of N. And by the way, we initialize the parent as itself in the constructor, and we initialize the rank of everybody to zero. That's sort of a default value. We could also have done one, you know, it depends. Do you count the height of a single node to be zero or one? It doesn't really matter as long as you're consistent. 
because it's all about comparing the height of one node to another. The height of this would be one, the height of this would be zero. So of course this one would have a, a larger height. So to find the root parent of four, we would you know, go to its parent first of all. So we'd have a pointer to its parent. We could do that using our hash map of parents. And then we would essentially keep traversing up while P is not equal to its parent. So we know that's how we're kind of setting it. We're initializing every node to ha have its own parent. So that's how we know we can stop going up the tree. So we'd start at four, we'd go to one, we'd see that one is its own parent. So we can't really go any higher. At that point, we would stop we would return P at that point. Now this one line of code might be a little bit confusing. Basically what we're doing here is path compression. It's an optimization that I didn't talk about yet, but suppose we had another node down here like five. It's pointing at four. Let's say we run the find function on five. We go to five, we go to four, then we go to one. This is its root parent, and then we would return that. Now, simultaneously, as we're going up the chain, we can also shorten it. We can also shorten this chain, and it won't affect the time complexity of our find function. So why shouldn't we do it? It's an optimization that will help us if we ever run find on five ever again. Five's parent is four, but what we're essentially saying is we're going to set the parent of five instead of being four we're going to set it to its grandparent because that will shorten the chain so essentially we remove this and now have a direct link from five to its grandparent and we keep doing that as we traverse the chain this doesn't make the find operation more efficient as we do it the first time, but if we ever run find on five again, it will be more efficient. And since it's just one line of code, it's a good thing to do, but it's not always required in union find. Now, finally, we can move on to the union function. Given two nodes in this case, n1, n2, for example, two and four, we want to union them together to form a single set. So what we should do is find the root parent of n1 and the root parent of n2, and then union them together. But in this case, both of them have the same uh, root parent. So if that were the case, we wouldn't do anything. There's nothing to perform. We can't perform a union. So we should return false. False is to indicate that the union was not successful, that these are already a part of the same set. But if that wasn't the case, for example, we're trying to union four and three together, we would of course get their root parents. One and three is its own parent and then we would union them together. Now, the most easy thing we could do is just get rid of all this code, all this, and just have a single line of code, like this one where we arbitrarily pick, you know, for one of these nodes, we want the other one to be its parent. So, you know, maybe we say one is gonna be the parent of three. So maybe we'd say that this tree is going to be the child of three. You know, and then we'd get rid of this and we'd get something that looks like this. That's if we did it arbitrarily and that wouldn't always be efficient. So what we try to do is union by rank, AKA union by height. Which one of these guys has a smaller height? Well, the height of this is let's say zero and the height of this is one. So this one has a smaller height. Therefore, this one should be a child of this guy. And that's what these if statements are doing. It's saying if the rank, AKA the height of P1 is larger, then P1 should be the parent of P2. If P2 is larger, then P2 should be the parent of P1. So in this case, we would set three to be a child of one. Now, if those are the case, basically, if the heights are unequal, in this case, this had a larger height than the other one, doing a union operation is not going to affect the height because if this one had a smaller height anyway, then, and we're directly adding it to the root, the height of this is not going to change. It's still one, as you can see. But if we ever did an operation where we had unequal heights, but if we ever did an operation where we had equal heights, for example, let's say these two were not childs of one, both of these have a height of zero, let's say, and that's going to be the else case where the heights are equal. Then we would arbitrarily pick, let's say this one is going to be the parent of three, so we'd take three and add it to be a child of one. At that point, we would have to increase the height. But we only have to increase the height by one because 
both of these heights were equal. They were zero in this case, but I'm gonna use a value like n because it's a variable. The height of this tree was n, the height of this tree was also n. But now this tree is a child of this guy. So we added a bit of distance. We added this much distance. We added an edge of one. So now the new height of this is going to be n plus one. Right, that makes up for this distance. And then, you know, this tree has a height of n, which in this case is zero, but it could have been bigger. But that's the main idea. Now, the important thing to know about union find is, of course, the time complexity. Union is a pretty straightforward operation, actually. Like this combination, because we already have the parents at this point, we're essentially just connecting, you know, two nodes together. That is a constant time operation. What's not constant, though, is what we have to do before. We have to find the root parents of two nodes. So the bottleneck is coming from the find function. Now, in the naive case, where we don't implement path compression at all and we don't implement union by rank, then the find function would be linear time because we might end up with trees that are just connected as if they were a linked list. That would not be very efficient. Those are imbalanced trees. And, the, and then, you know, traversing up them would be a linear time operation. Now we can cut this to log n by just doing one of the two operations. We can either implement path compression, which is just a single line of code. That will take our find function, at least on average, and change it from being an n time function to being log n or we can decide to implement union by rank which does take some more code but i don't think it's a super complicated thing to achieve which will also get our time complexity to be log n for find because it will result in more balanced trees. The height of the trees will be smaller. But if we implement both path compression and union find, we get a pretty complicated math function, which is written like this, and it's called the inverse Ackerman function. You won't really have to memorize this. I don't think it's super important, but what I'm trying to get at is if we implement path compression and find by rank, this is a function, but it essentially reduces to constant time. Even for really large n values, it will usually be a constant time operation. Not literally, but it can be simplified to that in most cases. But this find function is usually not going to be run a single time. It's going to be run a bunch of times as we were doing right now. We're trying to connect graphs together. In our example, this would be run for the number of edges that we have. Let's say that is denoted by m. So so, you know, in general, the time complexity of union find, if we have this many edges, let's say, would be big O of M times log N. But we saw if we implement path compression and union by rank, this log N can be, you know, essentially reduced to a one time operation. So in that case, our union find would be the time complexity of the number of edges that we had. That's why in some cases union find can be more efficient than a DFS for cycle detection or counting the number of connected components. This can definitely be a complicated data structure for beginners, but I hope that this walkthrough did make things a bit more simple for you. So next, let's learn about segment trees. And to be honest, this is definitely the most complicated tree structure that we've looked at so far. So before we actually dive into what this is, let's try to first understand the motivation behind it and what kind of problem it can solve for us. Suppose we were given an array of values, so a range of values in this case. And on this array of values, we want to support two main operations. We want to be able to update a value at some index with a new value. That's a very simple thing to do. You can easily implement this with an array. You can just, you know, overwrite the value at that index. That's a very efficient thing. We could solve that in constant time. Now, when it comes to querying some range, so between some left and right index inclusive, so let's say this is the left index, this is the right index, we want to get the sum of that range. That could be one possible query, getting the sum of that range. And that's what I'm going to stick with for this example, because that's really the most simple thing that we could possibly do. This is kind of the textbook problem behind segment tree. So that's what we're going to be focusing on. Now, in the worst case, we could just iterate from left to right and take the sum of all those values that could be accomplished in O of n time in the worst case. 
There are some optimizations we could do, like taking a bunch of prefix sums to get this query to actually be a constant time operation in general, but that's assuming that we can't update the values. Once you add this in, making it possible that we could update values in the array, then there's no way to get this query range to be constant time. It would be O of n time with an array. But with a segment tree, actually, we can solve these problems in log n time each. So we can update in log n time and we can query in log n time. Now the update is actually a downside because previously with an array, we could do that in constant time. So we're adding a bit more overhead to the update, but the trade-off is that our query is gonna be much more efficient. So assuming that we're always updating and always querying our data structure, we're doing that a lot, we're gonna have a bunch of log n operations, whereas with an array, we'd have a bunch of you know constant time operations, but the downside would be we'd have a bunch of linear time operations. And we know these are way more expensive than log n, so it's better to have log n. So that's what this is about. So that's kind of why this is called a segment tree as well. It takes segments, it takes an array and breaks it up into segments. So the general structure is that for the entire array, the root node would represent the range for the entire array. But as we go down to children, we take this array and we break it up so the half, the left half of the array would belong to the left node and the right half of the array would belong to this node. And then its children would actually uh, break it up as well. So they would get smaller and smaller portions of the node. So they would get smaller and smaller portions of the array. Now the overhead of this is that when we update, we can't just update a single value because suppose we're trying to update this value over here. We would have to update the root node because it you know, has that value. We'd also have to update the right child because it has that value as well. And we'd have to sort of update an entire chain of the tree. So that's where the log n idea comes from for update. We'll talk more about the query range in a bit, but for now, let's focus on the structure of a segment tree, how we can build one, and then how we can actually implement these functions in log n time. So suppose we were given an array that looks like this, indexes zero through five. The values aren't super important, but they will be relevant when we're calculating the query range sum. But given this, how would we represent it with a segment tree? Well, like I said, the root node is supposed to represent the entire array. So what we would say is the root node represents indices from zero through five. And then we take that input and essentially divide and conquer. It's a bit similar to merge sort actually when we have an array and we wanna break it up into equal halves until we can't do so anymore. It's the same idea here, actually. We wanna take this and break it into two halves. So what we do is take the left and right indices, add them together and divide by two. That gives us our mid value. So in this case, it'll be zero plus five divided by two rounding down. So in this case, our middle value is gonna be two. So what we do is we take the left index from here and the middle index that we just calculated, and these are gonna be the boundaries of the left child. The right child is going to be bounded by m plus one and the right boundary of its parent. So m plus one and right. Now this is the formula, the actual values themselves in this case are gonna be zero, two and three, five. And at this point, we would recursively do the same thing for the left and right child. So we're gonna continue to do this. So for this node, we break it up into two equal halves. In this case, when we calculate the midpoint, it would be one. So the left child is going to represent the range from zero to one. The right child is gonna represent the range from two to two. So notice how this range is of length one. It's from index two ending at index two as well. So it can't be broken up anymore. So it's not going to have any children. And for this node, the, it can be broken up one more time. The left child would be from zero to zero. The right child would be from one to one. And quickly, let's do the same on this side. Left child would be from three to four and right child would be from five 
to 5. We found another base case, and this one can be split one more time to 3, 3, and 4, 4. Now, each of these nodes is supposed to represent a range, but why do we care about that range in the first place? Well, in our example, we care about the sum of every single range. So as we build this tree, there was one last thing I didn't show you. When we actually reach a base case like this one, there's a third value we would have. Right now we have the left and right index of that range, but we also want the sum of that range. So it's from zero to zero, so that's a base case. The sum is just five. So I'm gonna put that five next to it. For one, it's gonna be the same thing. We just take the value at one. Another base case over here is seven. Three and four have values one and four at them. And lastly, index five has the value two. And as we would have computed the base cases here, and then we recursively pop back up, we would also want to have the range sum for all of these nodes as well. Now, for this one, we wouldn't have to manually calculate it. We would just get it from its left and right child and then add those values together. So five plus three is eight. So I'm gonna put an eight next to this guy. And this parent would do the same, eight plus seven is 15. For this one, it would be one plus four. For this one, it would be five plus two. And for the root, it's going to be the sum of the entire array. And luckily, we don't have to go through the entire array to calculate that. That's the whole point of this segment tree. We just have to look at this guy and this guy, add them together, we get 22. Now, before we go any further, let's take a look at the code for implementing what I just talked about. So suppose we had a segment tree class. Our constructor in this case could possibly take some total value, you know, for a node as we construct a node. What's that total value, which I've, you know, drawn in green. In this case, left and right refer to the left and right children. So these are gonna be pointers typically. It's gonna be a bit confusing because we also have two variables called L and R. I use these to indicate the indexes. Of course, I could have used a more descriptive variable, but then the rest of the code would also be a lot larger because you can see we're using these left and right indices a lot. And left and right, of course, refers to the left and right boundaries of a node. What range does that node represent? In this case, this node represents the range from zero to five. Now, this is a static method for actually building a segment tree. We could have, of course, implemented our constructor using this method instead of, you know, taking in a total left and right value. We could have just taken in an array of numbers and then constructed our segment tree, you know, within the function. But this is the approach that I'm taking. The time complexity is linear. So build is going to be a recursive algorithm given some array and given some left and right boundaries similar to merge sort. We want to break that array up into you know smaller arrays by half and then create nodes for each portion if we of course get to the base case which you know any of these you know leaf nodes represent where we just have a range of one so basically if left and right are equal we create a segment tree node the total value that we pass in is just the value in the array nums at that position and the left and right boundaries of course are just going to be those left and right boundaries and at that point we would return that's the base case now if we don't have a base case for example the root then we calculate the midway point just like i talked about left and right divided by two and we create a temporary root node for this we don't know its total value just yet, right? We don't know the total value, but we do know its left and right ranges. So for the total value, we initially put zero, but for the left and right ranges, we put zero and five. It's just like how I talked about, we have to go to the bottom and calculate the total value for the leaf nodes, and then we work our way up, calculating it for this node, and then calculating it for this node, and then calculating it for this node. We do it bottom up similar to merge sort. So with that temporary root node, then we go ahead and build the left side of the heap and assign it to root.left. And then we build the left side of the segment tree recursively and assign it to root.left. The variables we pass in, the input array nums, and the indices, just like how I talked about, left and middle. When we build the right segment tree, we pass in middle plus one and the right index. After we've calculated the left and right children, then we can calculate the sum of the root node by taking the left and right sums. So it's actually not super difficult. 
It's probably not a data structure you would come up by yourself, but once you know it, it's definitely manageable. Another observation about this tree is that it's sort of like a heap, actually. Heaps are full binary trees. It means that every level in the tree is going to be full except possibly the last level. But this is not quite a full tree in this case because another property of heaps and full trees is that if the last level is incomplete, the nodes will be filled from left to right. But here you can see that we would have two nodes that are children of this node, but we don't. We have a gap over here and then we have two more nodes over here. So segment trees actually commonly are implemented using arrays just like heaps are, but since we have gaps, it's harder to implement them with arrays compared to heaps. So I generally prefer to implement them with nodes like I'm doing right now, nodes and pointers and all that, but you definitely can do them with arrays similar to how we implemented heaps. So now let's talk about how we would update a value. And like I said, it's going to be a log n time operation, not a constant time operation like with an array, but we are still given an index and a value. So let's say we're given an index value of three and the new value is going to be four now. How would we do it? With an array, it's really easy. We go to index three, but with this tree, it's gonna be harder. By looking at the picture, we know we want to go to this node because of course it's the one that represents index three. We know with our segment tree, every leaf node represents a single index. This leaf node, these, and this one. So of course we wanna go to that leaf node. How do we find it though? How do we search for it? It's similar to how we built the tree in the first place. We know that the root node represents the range from zero to five. So where would index three be? Would it be on the left side or would it be on the right side? Well, we can answer the question the same way that we actually built these two sides by taking you know, zero plus five, adding them together, calculating the middle. The middle in this case is going to be two. And we know that the middle value itself always went on the left side, right? We said that the left node is going to be L to index M. So if we're looking for index three, clearly three is greater than the middle value. So it must be on the right side. That's essentially this line of code over here. If we're calculating the middle index, and if index is greater than middle, then we're gonna go to the right side. But if it's not the case, then we know that the index is less than or equal to middle, and then we would go to the left child. And as with most trees, the best way to do this is recursively. So that's what we do. On the right child, that's what self.right is in this case, we call the member function update, the recursive function update, which belongs to the segment tree class, which belongs to the segment tree object. We pass in the exact same parameters. We're still looking for index three and we wanna update the value to be four. So now we're at this node, we do the exact same thing. Three plus five divided by two, it's gonna give us index four. Our index greater than four? Nope. So then we're gonna execute the else case. We're gonna go left this time. We're gonna be over here. Three plus four divided by two is gonna give us three. So is three greater than three? Nope. Then we're gonna execute the else case. So now we're gonna be over here, we finally got into the base case. Our left and right indices are equal. So we got to a leaf node. If we get to a leaf node, that must mean we got to our destination. We're assuming here that the update is always going to be called for a valid index. If it's out of bounds, then of course this is not going to work. But now that we're at the base case, what are we gonna do? Well, this value one over here, let's overwrite it with the value uh, four. So that's all nice and dandy. And at this point, you might think we're done. But remember what this segment tree is supposed to represent. Every node is supposed to represent a range of values and the sum of that range of values. Since we updated one value, we at this point have to update every value in the chain of that value, but essentially all the ancestors of that value because they're the ones that are affected. The sum of this guy is not gonna change. None of its descendants were updated, but this one had its 
child updated. So it has to be updated as well. The good thing is since we were doing this recursively, it's going to be very easy because as we pop back up to every one of the parents, we can just, you know, update the sum of that one. So after our base case updates, we're going to return. We know we're returning from one of these if else conditions. We don't even care which one though. All we know is that for this node over here, one of its children were changed. We might not even know which one. We don't know, was it the left one or the right one? Who cares? All we know is we just have to take the sum of both of the children, add them together. That's a constant time operation, so who cares? We just add them together and then we can update the, the sum of this node. So to update five, we can just take its children, four plus four, and add them together. And then we get the new value, eight. And as we pop back up to the parent again, we're gonna do the same thing. Get rid of the seven, add eight and two, we get a 10. And now we go back up to the parent, get rid of this 22, add its children together, 15 plus 10, that's gonna give us 25. So now we've updated our segment tree. You can see why it runs in log n time because we're just going down one path and then of course going back up that path. But that is essentially the height of the tree. We know the tree is going to be balanced because that's the whole idea behind merge sort. We're you know, breaking it up into equal halves every single time. So this tree is always gonna be balanced. Therefore, the time complexity is always gonna be log n where n is you know the size of the range which represents roughly the number of nodes as well. Now, finally, the reason we implemented this data structure in the first place to calculate a range query, in this case, the range sum, of course, over this range of values from index left to index right inclusive. Let's start with some basic queries. Let's say the input we're given is from zero to five. We would start at the root node and we would see that this node actually exactly matches that query and then we would return the sum associated with it, which is 22. So that's the best case, of course, we're taking the sum of the entire range. So obviously that would be a constant time operation. Now let's say we did kind of the opposite where the left index is five and the right index is five. Then of course we don't execute the base case immediately, but we're gonna do the same thing we sort of did before. We're searching for index five at this point. How are we gonna find it? Well, we're gonna take zero plus five, add them together, divide by two. We're gonna get a mid value. In this case, that mid is gonna be two. And remember this mid value was used when we created the left node. The left node went from index left to mid plus one. And the right node went from mid plus one to index right, where right is this node and left is, you know, this zero. But the more complicated thing this time is that we're not searching for a single index like we were when we were doing the update. In this case, we're actually searching for a range of indices which is still possible with a segment tree though. That's the whole idea behind it, but it's gonna be a little bit more complicated. The idea is that this node represents a range and that range is broken up into two ranges like these. We're searching for our own range. Where does that range lie? There are three possibilities. From this node, the entire range lies in the right subtree or the entire range lies in the left subtree or maybe the range overlaps with both the left and right subtrees. Let's start with the simple case, which is that the entire range lies in the right subtree, which is the case here. But how do we know that? Well, when we're given a range left and right, we know that the left value is gonna be less than or equal to the right value. So if we know that the left value that we're searching for, which is the smallest value that we're searching for, is greater than the mid value, and sorry, I just realized I had mid plus one over here. That's a mistake. This should have been just mid, from left to mid, and this one is mid plus one. Really sorry about that confusion. Hopefully you caught it earlier. But five over here, is greater than the mid value. That means the smallest value that we're looking for is greater than the mid value. Therefore, the entire range must be in the right subtree over here. So there's no need to go to the left subtree at all. So, you know, in terms of code, that's the left range that we're searching for is greater than the middle value of the current node that we're at. 
The code can be a little bit confusing to read because we have a bunch of different variables. We have this, the nodes left and right values, which are you know these left and right, and we have the left and right indices that we're searching for. And by the way, the opposite case, instead of five, five, maybe we're searching for one, one. In that case, we would see that even the largest value that we're searching for, our right index, which is one, is less than or equal to the mid value, which in this case, we calculated the mid to be two. If even the largest value is smaller than mid, then that must mean that the range that we're searching for is somewhere here on the left side. Another way to visualize this idea is sort of with a number line, because that's essentially what ranges are in the first place, right? We have a zero, which is for this node. We have a one, we have a two, we have a three, we have a four, and we have a five. If we're searching for the range that's just five to five, of course, from here, we're gonna go search in the right subtree. If we're searching for the range that's, you know, one, one, of course, from here, we're gonna go to the left subtree. But if we were searching for a range like two to four, like this, then of course, we would have to go to the right and the left subtree. That's kind of what I'm getting at here because all these nodes simply represent a range. So that's the idea. Now let's actually walk through this example five, five. So, so we know we're gonna go to the right child first. And at this point, we're gonna do the same kind of computation. We're gonna calculate the midway point, which is gonna be four. The left value is greater than four. So again, we would go right here. And this would be the base case where we execute this and we simply return the sum, which is two. And then we you know, pop that two back up and up and up. And then that's the result we would return for this range query. And I could show you the same example when we're you know, getting the range for one, one, it would be the exact same. We would just keep going down until we get to this node. But the more interesting case is going to be a range like two, four. What's the range sum of this? So we would start at the root. We would calculate the midway point here. We know, of course, it's two. And in this case, neither the first if statement or the second one would execute because our range two to four is on both sides of the tree. We have a two here, we have the three and four over here. So we have to go to both sides to calculate the total that we're looking for. So the else case does exactly that. We call the range query function recursively on the left child and the right child. For the left child, we simply pass in the range from left to mid, and on the right side, we pass from mid plus one to the right. So we called two, four on the root node. Now on the left node, what we would call is two, two. Recursively, we'd wanna calculate the range sum query of two, two from the left subtree, and also calculate the range sum query on the right side from three to four, and once we solve both of these sub problems, we'll pop back up to the root, add those values together, and then that's what we're going to return. So before we do that, we actually have to calculate it. So from this side, we would end up executing, we would calculate the midway point here, it'd be one, we'd see that the left value here is even greater than the middle. So we know that the range is gonna be on the right side over here. And that's exactly where it is. We have a seven here. So from here, we'd pop that seven back up to the parent. And then that seven would be popped up to the root. Now from the right side, we're gonna do something similar. We're gonna calculate the mid of this three plus five, which is four. Even our largest value in the range is less than or equal to four. So we know that this range can be calculated exclusively from the left side. So then we go to the left side and you might think, well, we have to go to the base cases and add those together. But this is the beauty of the segment tree. We don't even have to go to those leaf nodes. We have exactly what we're looking for over here. And this is not uncommon for segment trees. It's expected that we usually reach our answer before even getting to leaf nodes. So we're trying to calculate the sum from three to four. We have that already, it's five. So we take that five and we pop it back up to the parent. So the solution that we're looking for is seven plus five, which is 12. So that's what we would return from our recursive range sum query. And just to verify, you can see that the value two had seven, three had one, four had four. So add those together, it's also 12. So that kind of verifies what we're trying to do here. Now, the only thing you might be wondering is, why is the range sum query log n? I mean, these steps make sense. Usually we're gonna go down one branch, but this else case makes things more complicated. If we have to go down two branches, 
that's not too bad. But if we have to, you know, from here go down two branches again, and from here go down two branches again, and we have to keep doing that, it surely can't be log in. We might have to end up traversing the whole tree, wouldn't we? Wouldn't that be a linear time algorithm? Well, first of all, the answer is no. It's safe to assume that the range sum query runs in log n time. And the reason is that at any level of our tree, we would look at at most a constant number of nodes. For every level, we would look at at most four nodes. I believe that's the number. So in reality, the worst case time complexity would be four times log n. So that of course reduces to log n. So when it comes to standard algorithms like this, even in coding interviews, you shouldn't be asked to prove the time complexity. That would be a problem in and of itself. And for this problem, it's definitely not trivial to prove the time complexity of this, but it's safe to assume that it is an efficient algorithm. So if this was your first introduction to segment trees, I hope this made sense. It's definitely not a simple data structure to wrap your head around, but as with most data structures, practice makes perfect. Try a few practice problems. Start with this example, maybe. Maybe if you prefer, try to implement it with an array. You'll use the same ideas behind heaps. The good thing is that segment trees aren't super common in coding interviews, but it's definitely worth learning nonetheless. So let's go back to binary trees, a pretty familiar data structure for us at this point. And we're gonna be talking about DFS, which is also a pretty familiar algorithm for us, but we're gonna be doing it a bit differently. We know it's pretty easy to implement DFS on a binary tree when you're using recursion, but it's more tricky to do it iteratively without recursion. It's still possible though, and the way we're gonna do it is by emulating how the recursive function actually runs we're gonna be going through the three common traversals for a tree in order traversal first, which is gonna be the easiest one when we do it iteratively. And we're also gonna do pre-order and post-order, which is going to be the hardest one when we do it iteratively. So with in order traversal, we know we're gonna start at the root node. And the idea is that we wanna traverse the entire left subtree before we traverse this node. When we say traverse, we essentially mean doing some kind of operation on the node. In our case, we're gonna do the simplest thing, which is printing the value of the node. So in this case, we would wanna print all the values in the left subtree and then print the value of the root node and then print all values in the right subtree. That's the recursive idea. So when we get to the root node, we simply go to the left. We call in order traversal on the left child. And when we're here, we do the exact same thing. We don't print this node yet. We don't go to the right child. We go to the left child again. And we essentially keep doing this until we can't do it anymore. So here, we're gonna try the same thing. Go to the left child. But we see there is not a left child in this case. We reached a null node. What do we do when we reach a null node in the recursive implementation? Well, we simply return, right? So when we return, we're essentially popping back up to the previous node in the stack. In this case, the stack is the call stack, the recursive function call stack. We know we called in order traversal on this node first, then we called it on this node, then we called it on this node. So when we pop up the call stack, we're gonna pop up to this one first, and then this one, and then this one. And when we do this iteratively, we're actually gonna do it the exact same way. So let me draw it out. Let me draw what our stack would look like. In this case, it's not gonna be a call stack. We're actually going to explicitly declare a stack data structure and then use it the exact same way that the recursive function uses it. So as we start at the root node, before we print this, we know we have to do the entire left subtree. So we're gonna save this guy. We're gonna save it on the stack. So we're gonna push one onto the stack. Well, not literally the value one, but the node that you know contains the value one, but I'm just drawing one for simplicity here. Normally we would add the tree node to the stack or a pointer to the tree node. And then when we went to the left child, we did the exact same thing. We pushed two onto the stack. And then when we went here, we pushed four onto the stack. And then when we finally got to null, we did not push anything onto the stack. There's no reason to push null onto the stack here. We simply popped back up. 
So we popped from our stack. We saw that we can't go left anymore. That means it's time to print our parent node here. So we pop four from the stack and I'm just gonna you know, draw out the order that we're printing it down here. So we popped this four and after we pop and print this value four, what does that mean? Well, it means we did the entire left subtree of four, which was null in this case, and then we printed four. Now it's time to do the entire right subtree of four before we go back up to our parent now. So essentially, we're going to move our pointer from this node to the child node, which is null. So what do we do when we reach null? Well, we simply pop from our stack again. So I'm gonna pop this two from our stack, print it, and after we pop the two, we do the exact same thing. We know we did the entire left subtree of two. We just printed two. Now it's time to do the right subtree of two, which in this case, again, is null. So what are we going to do? Exact same thing we just did. We're going to pop from the stack as long as it's non-empty, of course, which in this case, we still have one more value here. So let's pop that guy. We print one. We've traversed all of these nodes. Now it's time for us to traverse the right subtree of one. In this case, it's finally not null. So now we're going to set our pointer to the right child and run DFS on this subtree. So what do we do when we reach a node that's not null? Well, of course, we push it to the stack. We're gonna save it for now and first do the left subtree. Only after we do the left subtree can we traverse this node, can we print this node. In this case, the left subtree is null. So that means it's time to once again pop from our stack. Thankfully, it's not empty. If our stack was empty, then we would stop. But in this case, we have one more value here. Let's pop three, print it. Every time we pop a node, we simply take our pointer and then shift it to the right child. In this case, the right child is non-null. So what do we do with a non-null node? We simply add it to the stack. And then we go to the left subtree, left subtree is empty. We have nothing to traverse here, so we pop from the stack, printing the five. Five has been traversed, then we go to the right subtree, so our pointer now is at null. What do we do when our pointer is at null? Well, we pop from the stack, but now our stack is empty. So if our pointer is null and the stack is empty, then we don't have any more nodes left in the tree to traverse. So that's how you know we can stop the algorithm. So maybe this idea of iterative DFS makes sense to you, using a stack the same way the call stack would work recursively. And believe it or not, the code is actually not super complicated either. So this is what the code for that would look like. We have our standard tree node definition, and then we have our in-order traversal. The code is a bit more long than the recursive implementation, of course, but the ideas are actually the same. We're given the root of a tree node, we create our own stack. We set our current pointer equal to the root node and we continue traversing the tree while our current pointer is non-null or our stack is not empty. If our current pointer is null, that means the current node that we're at is null. But if the stack is not empty, that means there are some recursive calls for us to essentially pop back up to still. But maybe our stack is actually empty, but we still have some nodes to traverse. That would mean our current pointer is non-null. Then we would execute a couple conditional statements. If the current pointer is non-null, that means we want to traverse this node after we traverse its entire left subtree. So we're gonna save this node by pushing it on the stack and then set our current pointer to the left child. And then we're gonna simply go to the next iteration of the loop. So how this code is gonna run is we're gonna start at the root and then just keep going left until we can't go left anymore. So all these are gonna be pushed onto the stack and then we're gonna end up getting to a null child. And then the if statement would not execute, we would execute the else case where we of course pop back up to the parent. So we pop a node from our stack, print the value of that node because we know Every time we push to the stack, the node is not null, right? That's pretty clear by these two lines. So when we pop from the stack, we know it's not null. So we're gonna, of course, print the value. And then we know we've printed that value and we know we traversed the entire left subtree. So we're gonna set our current pointer to the right child. 
In this case, after printing this guy, the right child would also be null. So then the if statement would not execute, we would again execute the else case. We'd pop back up to the parent and then do the same thing, then pop back up again. So we you know, have popped all these and then we would go to the right child by executing this line. And finally, it would not be null. So then we would execute you know, the if statement, try going left, push this on the stack, try going left while well, it's null, then pop back up print three, and then do the right subtree with this line. It can definitely be difficult to wrap your head around this, but as we run the code, we see it's executing the same way that the recursive solution would be executing. And the time complexity and space complexity are also the same. The time complexity is big O of n, because we're, of course, traversing all the nodes of the tree. The uh, memory complexity is also big O of n, because in the worst case, if we had an imbalanced binary search tree, suppose these nodes didn't exist, we just had one long chain of nodes like that, we would, in the worst case, have to push all of these onto the stack. So that's the worst case time complexity. Though, that being said, a more accurate way of you know writing out the space complexity would be to say the space complexity is the height of the tree because that's really what we're saying here. If the height of the tree is really long because we don't have a balanced tree, that's what the space complexity would be. The ideas behind pre-order traversal are also going to be very similar. We're again going to have a stack we're going to start at the root, but remember, pre-order traversal means that we print or process the current node before we process any of the children nodes. So we process the current node, then we process the entire left subtree, and then we process the entire right subtree. So how should we do it then? Well, we know that we don't have to push this guy onto the stack. We're gonna print it immediately. So I'm gonna print one, and we're not pushing this onto the stack. We're done processing this node. But we do have to push something to the stack, we know we're gonna go and process the left subtree immediately, basically. Do we need to push this onto the stack? Probably not, because we can just you know go there via a pointer. But we know when this entire left subtree is done, we're gonna have to go and print the right subtree. But we're not gonna have a pointer from two to go to this node, we just don't have that. I guess we could pop back up to the parent if we really wanted to, but we already printed that node. Why would we push it onto the stack? The easiest thing to do while we still have a pointer to the root node, while we're still at this node, we should push this guy onto the stack and then shift our pointer to the left child. So that's exactly what we're gonna do. We're gonna add three to the stack and then move our pointer to the left child too. Now we're at two, we're gonna print two. So, so we print it, then of course we wanna go to the left child, but before we do that, we should take its right child and push it to the stack. Well, the right child is null in this case, so there's no need to push it to the stack because we know we would want to print two, then print its left subtree, and then print its right subtree before we go to this subtree. But this, but two does not even have a right subtree, so there's no reason to do that. We move our pointer from two to be to four, and then we can print four, and then we see its right subtree is empty, no need to push anything to the stack. We printed this, so I'm gonna cross it out, and we printed this. Now we're gonna take our pointer and then set it to the left child of four, but now the pointer is at null. What do we do when our pointer is at null? It's the first time that's happening for us in this case. Well, you guessed it, we're gonna pop from the stack. We did all of these nodes, now it's time to traverse this guy. It's the reason we're pushing this onto the stack in the first place, because from down here, we definitely don't have access to this node, but recursively, this is the exact same thing that would happen anyway. So we pop three, and now we're at a node. As soon as we visit a node, we want to print it, so we're gonna print three. We're gonna take its right child, which is not null in this case, push it onto the stack, and then go to its left child, which now is null. So when we reach a null pointer, we again pop from the stack. And now we're at five, then we can go ahead and print five. So that's the pre-order traversal. It's pretty similar to the in-order traversal, just a slightly different order, I guess, in the way that we're pushing to the stack. Let's take a look at the code. So with pre-order, we again have our stack. We initialize our current pointer to the root again. Our loop executes the same way while our current pointer is not null and our stack is not empty we're gonna be traversing the tree. If our current pointer is not null, when we start at the root, for example, we're gonna print that node. If the right child is not null, we're gonna push that right child onto the stack. 
but we're not gonna process it immediately. We're gonna shift our pointer to the left child first. We're gonna process the left subtree first, and we're gonna keep doing that until we, of course, get to null, in which case our current pointer is gonna be null, and then we're gonna pop from the stack. So after traversing all these, we would pop up to this guy that we pushed to the stack in the first place. And of course, we'd keep doing this until we have traversed all of the nodes. This is also going to have linear time complexity where we have to traverse the entire tree and the space complexity is technically the height of the tree, which in the worst case could be the size of the tree as well. Now, post order is a bit more complicated. We actually will need two stacks to implement this. And technically we don't need two stacks. There is a variation to do it without two stacks, but that one goes in reverse post order traversal and then reverses the output, which I don't think is technically correct. So the most correct way to do this is two stacks. Let me show you why we need two stacks first though. We get to the root node. We know with post order, we wanna traverse this node last. We wanna traverse the entire left subtree and then the entire right subtree and then traverse this node. If you try to do it with a single stack, what you're gonna find is there's no good way to do it. We end up visiting the same node multiple times. Let me show you what I mean. We're at this node. We don't wanna process it yet, so what can we do? We can add one to the stack. We know we wanna go left first, but we also know eventually we're gonna to need to traverse three as well. So we're gonna push three onto the stack as well, and then we're gonna move down to two. And this is the correct order that the values should be added to the stack, because we know we wanna process three before we process the root node. That's the idea behind post order traversal. Now when we get to two, we wanna do the same thing push two onto the stack and its right child, well, it doesn't have a right child, and then we get to four. Do the same thing, push four onto the stack, then we get to null. Now we can start popping. We pop four, we can print four. Should we add the right child of four? No, because remember, as we were you know, going through every node, we were already adding the right child to the stack. And then we can pop two, and then we can pop three, this is so far in the correct order, but now we're gonna end up popping one. How come we can't get to this five? Well, it's because sometimes when we pop a node, we want to add its right child, but sometimes when we pop a node, we don't want to add its right child. For example, when we pop one, we definitely don't want to re-add the right child to the stack. So that's where the visit comes in. The first time we add a node to the stack, we're gonna mark it as false. It's not been visited yet. The second time we add it to the stack, we're gonna mark it with true. It has been visited. The second time we pop it from the stack is when we're going to print the value. So the way this is gonna work, actually, we're going to first initialize our stack with the root node one and mark it as false. It hasn't been visited yet. So then we're gonna pop one from the stack. Since one hasn't been visited, it was marked with false. What we're gonna do is add its children to the stack and then add one to the stack again. The order that we add the children in matters because we know we wanna do this in post order traversal. So we wanna process the left subtree before we process the right subtree. So what we're gonna do is first add three to the stack and then add two to the stack. And we're gonna mark these as false. I'm just gonna put an F for false here. And also let's not forget to add one to the stack because after we process the two children, we also want to process the original root, which is one. We're gonna mark it with a T though because it's already been visited. But before we add the children, we're actually gonna add one to the stack again. This time though, we're gonna mark it with a T for true because it's already been visited. And then we're gonna add the children. The order that we add the children matters though because we wanna pop two before we pop three. So first we're gonna add three three to the stack, and then we're gonna add two to the stack. We're gonna mark these both with an F because they've not been visited yet. Now, the way this algorithm is gonna work, we're actually not gonna be maintaining our current pointer. Every iteration of the loop, we're gonna be popping from the stack. We're gonna pop two now from the stack. It's not been visited before. So you know the drill, we're gonna add two back to the stack, mark it with a T for true, and then add its children to the stack. First, we're gonna add the right child, which is null. I'm gonna put an N for null because we are gonna add null values to the stack in this case, actually. Added a little bit of room because we're running out and this null is gonna be marked with false. 
And then we're gonna add the left child, of course, which is four. We're also gonna mark that with false. And now we're going to pop from the stack. We're gonna pop four which was false, we would add the children and we're definitely gonna add those to the stack, but they're both null. So when we pop those null nodes, we're not gonna do anything with them. We're not gonna add their children because null nodes don't have children. So I'm not gonna draw it out here. But after popping its children, we would also pop four again because it would have been added to the stack. It would have been added with a T value for true. So after we pop that, we would have printed the four. So I'm gonna print the four here. And then we're gonna continue now to pop from the stack. We're gonna pop the null value. That was supposed to be the right child of two, but it didn't exist. So we pop that and now we just keep popping. Now we're gonna pop the two. It has a T value. When we pop a node with a T value, we print it because it's already been visited before. That means all of its children have been processed already. So now we're allowed to print two. And let's keep going at this point. Now let's pop three. When we pop three, we see it has false. It hadn't been visited before. So you know the drill. We're gonna add three back to the stack over here, hard to read, but it's there. It's gonna be marked with a T for true. It's been visited. We're now we're gonna add its children, five first with false. It hasn't been visited yet. We'd also add the left child, which is null, but I'm not gonna you know, draw that out completely because we would pop that null value and do nothing with it. And now we would pop the five value and not do nothing with it, but we would add that five value to the stack with a T for true. And we of course add its children, but it doesn't have any. So we would end up adding two null values to the stack and we would pop those. And then we would pop this five. So five hadn't had already been visited. So this time we print that five. Notice how it is going in post order. We printed the four, then we printed the two. Then we wanted to do the subtree, but we had to do the five first. And now we're finally going to pop the three. It's right here. And it has a T value, meaning it was already visited. So we pop the three, print it. And now finally, we just have one value left in our stack. It's hard to read, but it's this one. And it has a T value for true. That means we finally popped back up to the root uh, after printing all of the descendants. And this was the post order traversal. Now, while post order is definitely the least intuitive, in my opinion, of the iterative solutions, the code for it is not crazy complicated. Yes, we have two stacks. One stack is for the nodes themselves. The other stack is marking which nodes have been visited before. We initialize it with the root node, marking it as false. It hasn't been visited. While our stack is not empty, we're gonna pop from the stack. We know that the stack is gonna be the same size as the visit stack. So as we pop from one, we're gonna pop from the other. We're gonna have our current node and we're gonna have whether it's been visited or not. If that node is non-null, we're gonna do some stuff. If the node was null, we do nothing. We can just skip over it. There's nothing for us to do. Then we have two cases with that node itself. Either it's been visited before. If it has, then that's the really easy case. We simply take that node and print it. Right? If one had already been visited before and now we're popping one, that means we already printed all of its descendants. There's no reason to do anything with them. All we have to do is now print one. But if that's not the case, if this is the first time we're, we're uh, visiting one, then we have to add some stuff to our stack and the order that we do it matters. And by the and by the way, this two stack approach could also be condensed into a single stack of pair values. So a stack of pair values where one value is maybe the root node and one value is a Boolean for whether it's been visited or not. The reason I did it this way though is it's a little more generic and it works regardless of which language you're using. This two stack approach is pretty flexible regardless of the language that you use. But what we would do is we would take the current node and add it to the stack. We'd give it a value of true. It's already been visited before, but then we'd also add its children to the stack. It's important to add the right child and then add the left child because then we end up popping the left child first and popping the right child second. That's exactly what we want to do. But when we push these to the stack, we're gonna give them a visit value of false because this is the first time we're visiting them. And it really is that simple. That's what makes this traversal hard. It's simple, but it's really unintuitive in my opinion. Though the space complexity is still the same, yes, we end up pushing and popping each node from the stack twice, but that's still you know big O of two times N, which is linear time complexity. And the space complexity, you know, is going to be the same. The height 
of the tree, which in the worst case could be big of N, even though yes, we have two stacks, it still reduces to this. Probably the most common application of iterative DFS is implementing a you know binary search tree iterator, for example, where we're printing values of the tree or maybe fetching values of the tree in order, but we don't necessarily wanna go through the entire tree. Maybe we just wanna keep a pointer wherever we are at this point. We start at the root, we wanna do it in order. Maybe we just want the first two values. So then we fetch these two values and then our pointer is here. And then maybe we wanna fetch two more values. Then we fetch this and this, and then our pointer ends up over here. That's one application of an in-order binary search tree iterator. That said, when you're allowed to use a recursive function for these DFSs, it would definitely be recommended because they are easier to implement. When you're solving heap problems, what could be better than one heap? Well, sometimes two heaps is required to find the optimal solution. And this is the pattern we're gonna be talking about now. It can commonly be applied when we are talking about medians. So if you forgot what a median is, basically if you took a set of numbers, to find the median is basically to find the middle value when those numbers are sorted. So for example, if we were given an array like this one and we wanted to find the median, well, the easiest way would be to take this array and sort it so it would look something like this. And then to find the median would be basically to go to the middle index. Since our array in this case is of odd length, we would just calculate the middle index and go to it. So in this case, our median would be four. But maybe if we had an even number of values, then our middle index would actually be two different indices. So these two, and then to calculate the median of a even set of numbers, since there isn't a middle value, we basically take the two middle values, in this case, three plus four, and then divide that by two. So our median in this case would be a decimal 3.5. And if you're given an unsorted input array, you can't really do much better than that. In the worst case, the time complexity of this solution, because we're sorting, is gonna be big O of n log n, and you can't really do any better than that if the input is unsorted. Maybe if we were already given a sorted input, we could basically solve the problem in constant time, actually, because we would just have to get the middle indices and then you know return the result. So it's all about sorting in this case, but what if we're actually given an even more complicated problem? What if instead of being given all the numbers up front, we're actually given a stream of values? So we're streaming values, so initially we only have the four, but then we have two values. We have these two, and then we basically keep getting values as time goes on. And of that stream of values, the values that we've seen so far, if we want to continuously find the median of those values, then what can we do? Well, to solve that problem where new values can be inserted into the set and we have to continuously get the median from that set, doing it the naive way that we kind of talked about with sorting is not going to be the most efficient because suppose we're just given one value so far, finding the median is easy, but then we're given two values, finding the median is still pretty easy, but then we're given three values. At this point, we'd probably have to sort this and then find the middle number. And then as the set continuously grows, we initially had these three values, but now we inserted a new one. Now we already had these three sorted, so we don't necessarily have to sort all of these again, but we had uh, these values. Now we're inserting a new value. Well, we probably don't wanna just insert it at the end. We want to insert it in a sorted order. We wanna maintain the sorted order of our set of values as we continuously add a new value. So to insert a new value in this case is going to be a big O of n time operation. But getting the median is gonna be pretty easy because when you already have a sorted array, getting the median from that is a constant time operation. This is not a terrible solution because our get median is pretty efficient, but as we continuously insert values, it's gonna be expensive. I mean, what if we don't have to uh, get the median very frequently? What if we're actually running insert a lot more? What if we have a really, really big set of values? Then this is not super efficient at all. All. If our set grows to a size of n, to having to insert each value in sorted order would have made the total time complexity just of inserting uh, n squared. Now there's actually a solution that we can uh, do it more efficiently where uh, doing the insertion is actually a log n operation and getting the median is still a constant time operation. 
Now, how can we implement this? Well, you guessed it, using two heaps. So the idea is that we're gonna have a couple heaps. One that we're gonna call the small heap because it's gonna contain the smaller values of our set of values that we have so far. And we're also going to have a second heap for the large values. It's going to have the large half of the values that we have so far in our set. Now the small heap is going to be a max heap. Now the heap that has the smaller values is going to be a max heap. And the heap that has the larger values is going to be a min heap. That might sound counterintuitive at first. But bear with me and by the end this will make sense. So the idea here is that we're actually designing a class. We're designing a median finder class where we can arbitrarily insert new values into our median finder and we will arbitrarily get median from it. So the order that we do these operations could be random. We might insert two values and then we might calculate get median. We might insert one value, then calculate get median, then insert another and then get median and then another and then get median and keep going like that. It could be random, but we have to be able to handle all cases, all valid cases at the very least. Let's assume that we don't uh, get median when we have no values inserted at all, just for simplicity, because that's an edge case. When we insert a single value, it doesn't really matter which one of these heaps we insert it into. So arbitrarily, what I'm going to do is just take the first value four and insert it into the small heap. So now if we call get median, it's a pretty simple thing to do because we just have a single element anyway, so we would just return four. So these are just simple cases so far. Now let's insert a second value seven. So what we want these two heaps to represent is of the values we've added so far, so we have four and seven, we want half of the values to be in the small heap and we want half of the values to be in the large heap and we want every value in the small heap to be less than or equal to every value in the large heap. So based on that criteria, you tell me, where should we insert this seven? Should we insert it here or should we insert it over here? Well, probably we should put it in the large heap and that's exactly what we're gonna do. So now if we wanna get the median, we would first basically take the length of both of these heaps and since we know the lengths of both of these heaps are exactly equal, that means we know for sure we have an even number of values uh, total in our set. Because remember, the number of values in both of the heaps should be roughly equal. So at that point, we would take four and seven from each of the heaps, add them together and divide by two, and we would return you know, 11 divided by two, that's gonna be 5.5. So these are simple cases so far, but as we grow, our set of values, you're gonna see how we're gonna start handling these cases. So next we wanna add a three. Well, which heap should we add this into? Well, just by looking at it, you can probably tell that we would wanna add the three to the smaller heap. I mean, it's smaller than basically all of the values we have inserted so far, but how would you know that programmatically? Well, you would definitely know that we shouldn't put it in the large heap because the large heap, it's gonna have the greater half of value values. And since it's a min heap, we're going to be able to get the minimum value from that heap in constant time. We're not popping, we're just reading what the value is. So we can do that in constant time. And we're going to see that three is smaller than the largest value in this heap. So probably it shouldn't go in that heap. It should go in the other heap. So that's what we would do. We would insert the three over here, but we kind of have a problem because the lengths of the heap are not equal at this point. But in this case, since we have an odd number of values, we can't really do anything about that. There's no way we can make the lengths of these two heaps equal. So we're just going to leave it as it is because we know that the size of this heap is two and the size of this heap is one. So as long as the difference of the lengths of the heap is at most one, that's okay. But if we had, for example, three values in this heap and one value over here, then that definitely would not be okay. We would move one of the values. So this would be of size two and this would then be of size two again. And of course, if we had, you know, four values here and one value here, that would also not be good. We would at the very least move one of the values to the other heap to get the difference to be uh, less than or equal to one. 
Now, I've been a bit misleading about one thing so far. When we take a new value and insert it into one of the heaps, we kind of already talked about multiple conditions that could happen. First of all, when we started and we had no values in either of the heaps, we just arbitrarily took that value and put it in the small heap, and it turned out that it worked in this example. And then when we had a second value, we saw that that value is greater than the uh, previous value we inserted, so then we just went and put it in the other heap heap. But if that wasn't the case, we probably would have had to swap the values. If, if seven instead was two, we probably would have had to put the two over here and then moved the four to be in there from the heap. We'd have to move it to the other heap. And now that we're inserting a new value three and both of the heaps are non-empty, we kind of have to compare uh, what values here, what values over there. Is this a big value? Is it a small value? So you can see that there's going to be a few conditionals that we'll have to write to know which heap to insert a value into. There's an easier way to do it. So in this case, the simplest way to do it is just to take every time we have a new value, just put it in the small heap every single time. Now, we don't know for sure that that's the correct thing to do, but we're going to start out by doing that. But after we perform that operation, we want to verify two things. We want to verify that all values in this heap are less than or equal to all values in that heap. What's an easy way we can do that? Well, we're just going to take the max value from this heap so good thing this is a max heap. We're going to take the max value of our small values and make sure that that value in this case is three is less than or equal to the smallest value in the large heap, which in this case is seven. Since that's uh, uh, confirmed, since this is the case, we don't have to do anything. At least we know all these values are less than or equal to these values, but we don't necessarily know that the sizes are equal. So we actually have to check that as well. We have to check the length of this heap, which is two, and the length of this heap, which is one. We have to make sure that the lengths don't differ by more than one. If they did, for example, if this one was three and this one was one, so this has extra values and this one has less values, then we would take a value from this heap and push it into this heap. How can we do that? Well, which value would we want to pop from here? Probably the largest value, right? We wouldn't want to pop a small value. And good thing, this is a max heap, so we can do that in log n time. We can take the max value, pop it, and then push it into the other heap, and that is also a log n operation. If the opposite was the case, maybe we just had one value in this heap and we had three values in this heap, we would probably want to take a value from here and then push it over there. Since these are large values, these are small values, we would want to take the minimum value from this heap and then push it to the small heap. Good thing this is a min heap, so we can do that efficiently. So that's the easiest way to make sure that these heaps are basically following the properties that we have set for them. And now if we wanted to calculate the median, because we know that the heaps are roughly equal, these values have the small values, these values have the large values, how do we get the median at this point? Well, since we know this heap is larger, we know that the median is going to be in this heap because we technically haven't sorted all these values, but we have a sorted property. These are the values we've added so far. We want to get the middle value. Since we know the heaps are of uneven size, we know that these values are in the left heap and this value is in the right heap. We want the middle value. Well, good thing this is a max heap. We can get the maximum value in constant time because we're just reading it. We're not popping it. So when we get median here, we would just get four. We'd get the max value from our max heap and then return it. Uh, of course, if the heaps were like this and we had four, seven in the large heap and we just had three in the min heap, we would do the same thing. We'd take the minimum value from our uh, large heap and then we would return this value. So you can see how these heaps make it easier for us to find the median. We've set them up intentionally in a way that they will easily allow us to find the median value continuously. Now let's look at we're, now let's look at the case where we have an even number of values by taking this 5 and inserting it. And I'm going to insert it in the way that I talked about. So we're arbitrarily going to put the 5 here. We're going to put it in the small heap. But now we see that the small heap has three values and the large heap has one value. So we want to pop from here. We're going to pop the largest value because this is a max heap. We're going to pop 
that five that we just inserted, and then we're gonna insert it into the large heap. So now we put that value in the correct heap and their heaps are of equal size. So that's good. Now, if we wanna get the median, we actually have heaps that are of exactly the same size. So we have an even number of values. So how do we calculate the median then? Well, we're gonna read the max value from our small heap. We want, uh, you know, let's say this is our set of values at this point in sorted order. These are the values in our left heap and these are the values in our right heap. We wanna take the two middle values, add them together and divide by two. Well, good thing from our max heap, we can get the uh, max value in constant time, that's this four. We can get the smallest value from our large heap in constant time, that's this five. Add them together, divide by two, we get nine divided by two, that's gonna be 4.5. So we can do this pretty efficiently. The get median is always gonna be a constant time operation because we're setting up the heaps in that way so that we can basically guarantee that. Now, lastly, let's just look what would happen if we took this one and added it. We're gonna arbitrarily insert it into the small heap. It turns out that that's the correct thing to do because now we're gonna read the largest value from here which is four, verify that four is less than or equal to the five over here. And since that's the case, that means we know that all these values are less than or equal to all these values. That's good. Now, lastly, let's check that the sizes are roughly equal. This is a length three, this is a length two. So the difference is one, but that's okay. So the insertion is completed. Now, if we wanted to try getting the median, we would see that this has a length of three, this has a length of two, this has a length of two. So if we wanna get the median, it's probably in this heap and we would take the max value from that. So four would be our median in this case. So you can see that when you set it up with heaps, rather than just keeping a single sorted array, we can get the insertion from a linear time operation and we can get it to be a log time operation. So this is what the code for that would look like, at least in Python, but most of these ideas can be extended. So our constructor will basically initialize two heaps, just like I talked about, a small heap and a large heap. In Python, that's essentially an array. And then we can run heap operations using the heap class. But of course, this might be different in other languages. Now, the two operations that we're supporting are insert and get median. You can see the bulk of the work is in the insert operation. That's also the operation that runs in log n time because when we get a value and we insert a number, we're arbitrarily gonna push it to the max heap and only swap if needed. So we're gonna take that value and insert it into the small heap. So this is that value. Now, the thing about Python, this isn't true for most languages, but Python does not have a max heap by default. So a way to get around that actually is when you're inserting a value to actually take that number and multiply it by negative one. This will basically, this will turn that heap into a max heap. You can apply the same technique in other languages if you want to, if that language doesn't support max heaps. Basically, if we were adding a value of three and two, like these are our two values we're adding to our max heap, but this is actually implemented with a min heap, but we wanted to simulate what a max heap would do. We would take these numbers and actually multiply them by negative one. So now we'd have negative three and negative two. So now if we pop from the heap, we're gonna end up popping the negative three, which is what a max heap would have done. A max heap would have popped the three instead of the two. So in this case, we're popping the negative three, but since we know we multiplied the value by negative one, we're gonna have to multiply it by negative one when we pop from it again to counteract that effect. So when we pop from it, we'd, uh, we'd get rid of the negative and we'd have a three. So that's how we could simulate a max heap using a min heap. But moving on to the main concepts here, after we push to the max heap, we want to make sure that none of the properties of our two heaps have been violated. The first thing we wanna check is that this value was inserted into the correct heap. How we can check that is first by making sure that both of the heaps are non-empty because if one of the heaps is empty, then we can't really compare the two heaps. But if they're both non-empty, then we're gonna take the root value from the max heap and the root value from the min heap and compare them. If it turns out that the largest value from our small heap is greater than the smallest value in our min heap, our a set of large values, this means that we violated the property where we want all values in the left side to be less than or equal to all values in the right side. So if we violated that, then we have to pop from the small heap and push 
to the large sheep. We're, we're popping from here and then pushing to the other one because by default, we know we always push to this one. So we'd pop from the small heap, multiply the value by negative one. That's only required in Python because of the reasons I just talked about. And then we take that value and then push to the min heap. When we push to the min heap, we don't have to multiply by negative one. So that will make sure that that sorted property is handled between our two heaps. But what if they are of uneven size? We haven't handled that yet. So that's the next thing that we would do. We would check if the length of one of our heaps is greater than the length of the other heap plus one though, because we know in some cases, if we have an, an odd number of values, then one of the heaps is always gonna be greater than the other one. But is the difference greater than one? That's what we're asking when we add plus one to the other heap. So if this is the case, then we'd obviously have to pop from this heap, which we're doing here, and then we'd have to push to the other heap, which we're doing here. Or, or maybe the opposite is true, where the other heap is larger. So we would check that with a second if case and then do basically the same operation, pop from the heap with more elements and then push to the heap with less elements. So one thing I'll say is that this is a relatively elegant way to write this code. This is probably not something you'd come up with just to arbitrarily push to one heap and then you know handle the case like I did. And that's completely okay. The first time I tried solving this problem, I think I just had a ton of different conditionals and that is completely valid and it works. It just turns out that that code can get messy. It can be hard for you to write. It can be hard for somebody to read. So I wanna say that if you're trying to solve this problem and you write code that looks different than this, but as long as it works, that's completely okay. Because as long as you understand the idea behind two heaps, that we want the heaps to be of roughly even size. We want one of the heaps to have uh, values that are less than or equal to the other heap. That's what's important. These concepts that we're talking about are important. If your code isn't perfectly elegant, that's okay. Okay, if you have a few extra lines of code, that's okay. The concepts is what you should be focusing on. Now, for getting the median, this is the easy part. This is the part which we can do in constant time. We're gonna first check, do we have an odd number of values? In other words, is one of our heaps larger than the other? Because we know the heaps should be of equal size, unless, of course, we have an odd number of values. So is the small heap larger than the other heap? If that's the case, we're just going to take uh, the max value from that heap and return it. Of course, we're multiplying by negative one, but that's only a Python thing. The other case is if the other heap is larger, then we take the value, the root value from that heap, the smallest value value and then return that. But if we have an even number of elements, then we know we actually have to calculate the average between two elements, the two middle values. So we would take the root value of this heap and the root value of that heap, add them together and divide by two and then return that. So admittedly, this might not be a pattern that you'd come up with on your own. Like if you had never heard about this pattern, you would probably not be able to solve problems requiring it. But as you practice it, and now that you've been introduced to it, it's definitely something that can come up in interviews and having seen it before can definitely make a difference in being able to solve a problem optimally. But just seeing this pattern in action is not enough. I highly recommend practicing it for yourself, even if you have to practice you know, this problem that we just talked about. Now that you've seen a possible solution, try solving it on your own. Maybe come up with your own way to solve the insert function, even if it requires more code. So now let's learn a little bit about combinatorics, which is sort of a math subject, but it's commonly applied to coding interviews, usually for backtracking problems. One pretty common one is subsets. So we'll be going over how to understand these types of problems for coding interviews, but also a bit of math background that I think can really help you a lot at least it's the reason I think that these types of problems are usually pretty trivial for me. So subsets is the simplest one. We'll also be going over combinations and permutations. But to start with subsets, suppose we're given a list of distinct numbers. That's important here. And we want to return all possible distinct subsets. First of all, what is a subset? Well, you have you know these values 
Well, a subset is pretty straightforward. It's basically any subset of these values. So, you know, just the first value is a subset. The second value is a subset. The third is a subset. Even zero values is technically a subset. So if we just choose none of these, that counts as a subset of this set of numbers. We could take, you know, just two values or these two or even all three. That's pretty much every single subset. And we also want them to be distinct. So basically that would mean uh, if we have a subset, suppose one, two, that we can't include a subset that is two, one. Just because the orders are different doesn't mean they're different subsets. That would be a permutation, but we don't care about permutations. We care about subsets and these are technically the same subsets. So we would not include them. But since we're given a list of distinct numbers, we don't really have to worry about getting duplicate subsets. If we had, you know, maybe an extra three over here then we could potentially run into a case where you know this is a subset so that's two three and maybe just these two is a subset but that's the same subset it's two three so we wouldn't be able to include that but for now we don't have to worry about that and for every subset, let's assume that the order does not matter. We talked about how these two subsets are technically the exact same subset. So which one of these would we return as a part of our result? Well, it doesn't really matter. Let's assume that for this problem, we can return either one. So this one would work or this one would work, but we can't return both of them, of course. So this problem is mostly straightforward. If you're already familiar with backtracking and you have a basic understanding of subsets and the math in general behind them, basically for every one of these values, we have a choice. We can either include it in our subset or not include it in our subset. Does that sound like a decision tree to you? Because it does to me. So for the first uh, position, we'd have, let's say a pointer I, we're gonna be here. We can choose to include that value one or not include that value one, which would leave us with an empty set. And then when we shift our pointer and we get to the next position, we have the exact same decision. We can either include this two in our subset or not include the two. Basically what we're trying to do here is create all possible subsets. It's not super complicated. We're in this decision, including the two. So we would basically append the two to our list and this decision, we are skipping the two. So we you know, just keep that one. Same decisions over here, but they're gonna result in different subsets because on this path, we chose not to include the one. So these are gonna be all the subsets without a one. These are gonna be all the subsets with a one. So over here, we would skip the two. And then finally, we have one last decision as we get to the last index. Here, we can include the three or not include the three. And over here, same thing. If we include the three, we get the one three subset. Here, we can skip it. So you can see each of these subsets is unique so far, and it has to be the case because every time we branch, we're guaranteeing that they're gonna be different because these are gonna be all the subsets that included a two, and these are gonna be the ones that did not include a two. So of course, all of the children are going to be different. We're gonna quickly finish up the rest of this tree. Over here, we'd have two, three. Over here, we just have two, running out of space a bit, but uh, let's have two more decisions over here. And here we would include the three, here we would skip the three. So you can see that this path is basically where we uh, skipped every single one of these values, but that's important because remember an empty set does count as a, a distinct subset that we're trying to return. So let's count the results. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And that makes sense because remember, we started uh, at the root, right? Just a, a single position, but we multiply by two every single time because we're branching two times. So here we had two sets because we just had a single value. Here, we multiplied that by two and we had four sets. And then finally at the bottom, we multiply by two again and we have eight sets. So the number of subsets that we're gonna have is always going to be the same. It's going to be two to the power of n where n is the number of input values. Because remember, for each one of these, we have a choice. We can either include it or not include it. That gives us two choices. Same decision here, two choices. Same decision here, two choices. So two times two times two is of course gonna eventually be two to the power of n, depending on how many values are in the input.
So does that mean that that's also the time complexity because this is how many uh, subsets we have to generate? Well, not quite because look, for every single subset, we're going to have to build it. Like these are gonna be separate arrays. We can't just reuse the work we did over here because our result is basically gonna be a big list and these are gonna be the sub lists. So we're gonna have a nested array and each of these uh, children are going to be separate. So each of them are gonna have to be built separately. So let's say, you know, this one is of course size n most of them are going to be smaller than size n but we're going to approximate that each of them is of size n that's like the worst case here so if there's this many of these arrays and each one is of size n then the overall time complexity is going to be n times 2 to the power of n that's going to be the big o time complexity when it comes to memory complexity that is technically the exact same because that's going to be the result this is going to be the space it takes to contain this result but typically when we're talking about big O space complexity, we don't include the space it takes for the result. So if we're not including that, the space complexity here would be the height of the tree, which is in this case gonna be N. So we would say the space complexity would probably just be big O of N here. So this isn't super crazy if you're familiar with backtracking. And if you're not, hopefully this makes sense because this type of pattern is pretty common in backtracking. I mean, sometimes you'll have more than two choices, but it's all about the choices here. Let's take a look at how we would implement this with code. So this is one way to implement the code. So suppose that this is the function, like this is the one that's actually going to build the subsets and return them. So we're given just the list of numbers. Well, we're going to do this recursively with backtracking. That's the easiest way to implement this. So that's gonna be our helper function. We're gonna pass in zero as the starting index. That makes sense, because of course, you know we're gonna start at the beginning here and then keep making decisions. We're gonna pass in the nums array to our helper, but we're also gonna pass in a couple helper variables. One is subsets. This is going to contain the results. So like these are the subsets that we're building. This is an array, but each item in it is gonna be a sub list. Like for example, one, two is a subset two, three is a subset. These are the individual subsets we're gonna be adding to the list of subsets. And the reason we're declaring it here as like an array and then passing it into helper is because uh, for the scope of helper, like that can be considered kind of a global variable. So if we update it, like for example here where we're updating that subsets list, the updates will be reflected uh, for the variable because it's a reference to the exact same variable. It's not like we're creating a new array every time we call the helper function. It's the exact same array. We're passing in the same reference to that subsets array. We're also passing in a, another helper array, current set. So that's going to be a variable that actually helps us build an individual subset. So initially it's empty. So we start our helper function, assuming we start at index zero, we're gonna check, are we out of bounds or have we reached the end? Because of course, when our eye pointer is over here, that's how you know we're done. But assuming we haven't done that, we have two decisions to make, right? One decision is we include the number at index i. The second decision is we don't include the number at index i. So this is a standard backtracking template. Here, what we're gonna do is to our current set, right? We're going to uh, make the decision to include nums of i. So to our current set, like this is our current set, we're gonna add one to it. And then we're gonna call our helper function with the exact same variables essentially, right? Nums isn't changing. Current set, well, that did change. We appended a value to it, but we're passing in the same reference, right? It's just a single variable and we're passing and we're reusing it throughout this recursion. We're also passing in subsets. And then after we uh, called this recursively, like we know here, this is gonna do a bunch of recursion. We're gonna make more decisions here. We're gonna potentially update the result with some base cases, but eventually we're going to be finished with this recursion, right? After this returns, after that, we want to pop the value that we just added here because now we want to go down the other path where we decide not to include nums of i. And going down that path, we would want our current set to be 
empty, or at least we wouldn't want to include this value that we just added. So that's what we do. We pop, we undo the work that we did previously, and we do, basically this is called a cleanup, and then we go recursive again. You can see that these two recursive calls are the exact same. So what's different about them? Well, of course, the current set. The difference is on the first recursive call, the current set had the one added to it. On the second call, it did not have the one. So this one is going to calculate all subsets that include one. This recursive call is going to calculate all subsets that don't include one. Now, for any particular ones, uh, suppose you know we went down this path, we add a one, two, and then you know we have two decisions and we choose. We of course we're going to go through all of them, but I'm just showing an individual one. Suppose we went down here and then we did not include the three. And then after this, uh, we basically go out of bounds, right? Our I pointer is going to be over here. We're out of bounds. That's when the base case is going to execute. If I is greater than or equal to the length, technically this could have just been if I is equal to the length, because that means we're exactly out of bounds. If we go out of bounds here, we're never going to increment it farther. So that's why you could have just had this as equals, but there's nothing wrong with doing it this way either. But when that's the case, we reach the base case. Of course, we just want to take this uh, helper array and then append it to our overall result. Like this is our overall subsets result. We want to take this one, two and add it. But we know that current set is a array and we're passing in the same reference to every recursive call. So if we take this and add it to the result, and then you know we we pop back up potentially and we pop back up again eventually we remove the one and the two well that's going to end up updating this as well if we remove one from here we're going to end up removing it from here so what we actually want to do is not add the exact same reference to this array but we want to create a copy of this array so that's what we're doing here we're creating a copy of the current set before we add it to the subsets result and then after that, we're just returning. So this helper function is not actually returning anything. Uh, what it's doing is it's modifying the subsets array that we have declared up here, and it's adding each individual subset to it. So that after we've executed that recursive function, then we can go ahead and just return the subsets. So these are the main ideas. This is definitely not super easy, especially when you're new to backtracking, but getting a really good understanding of this can make future more difficult backtracking problems a lot easier because they generally do follow this similar template. But there's a slight variation we can make to this problem. This is subsets without duplicates in the input array. What would happen if we did have some duplicates in the input array? Let me show you what we could do to fix that. So if we slightly change the problem and say that we're given a list of nums that are not necessarily distinct and we want to return all distinct subsets, how would we do that? So suppose we're given an array like this where we have two occurrences of the value two. Well, the first thing we pretty much always do with a problem like this, and sometimes it's not even a backtracking problem, but usually with backtracking problems this applies, is we want to sort the input array. Because first of all, we already know that the solution to generate all distinct subsets is going to be exponential. So sorting, which is n log n, is not going to be super expensive, and it makes these problems a lot easier. And in this case, it's very important to solve this efficiently. We're going to sort the array and you're going to see why I'm doing that in a minute. After the array is sorted, the problem is pretty similar to the original subsets, but let me just show you a problem that would occur. If we try the regular way of subsets, we have one and then we choose, you know, an empty array here. Going down another path, we choose one, two. Here we stay with one. Going down here, we choose one, two, two. Going down here, we skip the second two over here, so we're left with just a one, two. Uh, here, we choose the second two, because that's where we're at here. We'll choose the second two, one, two, and here we'll skip the second two, so we'll just have a one. Notice how we have duplicates here. At this point, this is not a base case. We still have some values left, but these two are going to obviously be the exact same because they're at the same position and they're going to make the exact same decision. So these two paths are going to result in duplicate solutions that we're going to have duplicate subsets in our result. That's not what we want to do. So we can't you know, use the same idea that we had where we, for every single number, we choose whether we want to include it or not. 
Because if we make that decision here, we include this two or not, or we make that same decision here, we include this two or not, that's not necessarily going to result in distinct subsets. Logically, what we really want to do is have a path, for example, where we say, okay, this path is going to have two occurrences of two, and this path is going to have one occurrence of two. And maybe a third path is gonna have zero occurrences of two. So we don't include either of these. So those three paths would definitely not result in distinct subsets. So that's what we're going to do logically speaking. We're just gonna implement it in a different way. We're gonna take advantage of the fact that this array is sorted. So let me show you what I'm gonna do. For the first value, we're going to make the same decision because since this array is sorted, we know that all duplicates are going to be adjacent to each other. So we'll be able to tell that there's only a single one. And when we get to two, we'll be able to tell that there are multiple twos. So here we're going to, for the first value, make the same decision. We have a one or we have an empty array so far. We're going to get to the second position here and we're going to make a similar decision. So here we're going to choose to include the two. So we'd have one two here we're going to choose to not include the two so we're just going to have a one so this is going to be the path where we not only skip the first two but we're actually going to skip both of these twos and the next time we make a decision here we're already going to be at this position so here we're going to make the decision do we include the three or do we skip the three what we're trying to do is we want this path to represent all subsets that don't include any twos. So what about this path? Is this path gonna include both of the twos? Not necessarily, but clearly it's gonna contain at least one two. So we know it's gonna be distinct from this side. This is not gonna generate any duplicate subsets that this one will. And of course, we know that this right side is not going to generate any uh, duplicate subsets with this path because this is not going to include the one, whereas this does already include the one. That's why I'm kind of just glossing over this part. But to focus back here where the duplicates actually occur, here we have two more decisions now. We're at the second two over here. We can choose to include the second two where we would have one two two and here we can choose to not include the second two where we just have a single two so now you probably get the idea this is the path that does not include any of the twos this is the path that only includes a single two we don't care if it's the first two or the second two because it doesn't really matter to us this is the path that includes a single two this is the path that includes both twos so we clearly know that these three paths are always going to be distinct how did we accomplish this it's because it's pretty clever well from up here we basically said this is the path that's going to include one or more twos so if we know this is the path that that's including one or more twos then this is the path that can't include any twos so what we did here is when we skipped this spot we didn't just skip the first two we just kept skipping while the neighbors were the same value so if there were even more twos over here if this was a two we would have skipped this one and we would have skipped this one we just keep skipping while the values are duplicate at least that's the case when we go down this path and by the way, if we did have extra twos, like for the example, this one, and maybe even more, the same logic would be applied to these children as well. So here where we include to maybe include that third two, that's great. But here where we choose to skip that two, we'd not only skip this two, we'd skip all the twos. We'd, we'd basically skip until we got to a new value. That's to ensure that, you know, these don't end up resulting in duplicates either. So that's the main idea. So it's very similar to the first subset problem, but it's definitely not the type of thing you could easily come up with by yourself. So it's very helpful to have seen this before. It's definitely a common pattern that can come up in a, a lot of backtracking problems. Let's take a look at the code now. So time complexity and space complexity wise, it is the same because in the worst case, we wouldn't have any duplicates and then we'd have two branches every single time. You know, we wouldn't have to skip any values. So, you know, the size of the tree would be to the power of N for each subset. It takes N to build it. So that's the time complexity and space complexity would again, just be the height of the tree, which is big O of N. And you can see the first thing we're doing before we do anything is sorting the input array. That's very important because we're not guaranteed that the input array is going to be in sorted order. Other than that, 
Code wise, it's pretty similar. We have that subsets list and we have the current set list. We're passing those in, we're passing in nums, we're starting at index zero. And then eventually once we've built subsets, that's what we're gonna return. But how do we actually build it? Well, this is also pretty similar to the first one. If we reach the end of the uh, list, we're going to take our current set, create a copy of it and append it to our subsets and then return. Otherwise, we have two decisions to make the exact same decisions, we can either include this number. So we would append it to our current set, call our helper recursive function, I plus one, and then we'd pop that value and basically make the decision to not include nums of i. But how are we gonna do it? This is where it gets a little bit more tricky than the first solution because we actually have a while loop here. The first solution we could do without any loops, this one is helpful to have a loop. Basically, we're gonna make sure i plus one is out of bounds. That just means we're not at the last value. So for example, let's say we're over here at the first two. We're going to check is the value at this index equal to the value at i plus one. Are these two guys equal? If that's the case, we're gonna increment our i because remember, we're trying to skip nums of i. Our i pointer is here. We're trying to skip two. So if we call uh, our recursive helper function on i plus one, which would be this, we would not be skipping two at all because we're trying to skip this and we get to another two here. Well, we wanna skip all these twos. So we're going to increment our i pointer one more time. So now our i pointer would be over here. It's still at the two, but that's okay because at this point our code would say, well, i is still in bounds. Well, i plus one is still in bounds. i plus one is over here, but nums of i, which is here, is not equal to i plus one, which is three. So that's okay. And that's because when we call our helper function, remember, we're not passing an i, we're passing an i plus one. So even though our i pointer is over here, we would pass i plus one. So we would start our recursive function at three. So that's what we're trying to do. When we reach duplicate values, we wanna skip all of them when we you know go down this path at least other than that it's pretty much the exact same as the first solution so i hope i was able to demystify something that can trip a lot of people up these type of problems are definitely not trivial when you're first learning them but after a while they do start to make sense they definitely follow a very similar pattern so next let's learn about combinations and the good thing is that these are almost exactly like subsets like even the math definition, I think, of combinations and subsets is pretty much identical. I mean, maybe there's a technicality in like computer science between them, but more or less they are the same. So even solving these types of problems with code is going to be similar to subsets. For this example though, suppose we're only given two integers as parameters. One is n. In this case, let's say n is equal to five and let's say k is equal to two. In this case, n represents the numbers that we can choose from. So in this case, the numbers that we can choose from are between one and n. So in this case, we can choose between any numbers between one and five. And we want to create all possible combinations from these set of numbers. But the catch is that the combinations can only be of size two. So before we were doing every single possible combination, like one combination would be just the value one, another combination would be the value two, but these are of size one each. So they would not be counted as a part of our result. Before even an empty set was a part of the result for subsets. But in this case, that won't be the case. We want every subset of size K. And I don't think I mentioned it here, but let's assume that we want the subsets to be distinct. So, you know, one, two, two, one, these do not count. These are permutations because the order is changing, but we care about combinations where the order is uh, irrelevant. So these are not different. We only want to add just one of these to our set. So first I'm gonna show you the trivial way to solve this problem that's gonna be pretty much identical to subsets. And then we're gonna look at a way that we can actually optimize it at least a little bit. So the idea is going to be pretty similar to what we did before. For every number, we're gonna iterate through one through five. So for every number one through five, we have a choice. Do we include it or not? So for one, we include it or we have an empty list. Same decision here, we can either include two or not include two, and same decision over here. We can include two or not include two, and we just keep going like this. But you notice something, by the time we get here, we already have two values as a part of this combination. So why would we add more? Why would we try building one, two, three? It doesn't make any sense. 
So this is already our base case. By the time that we have a combination of size two like this, we are good. Like we're not gonna go any farther. So, you know, this is a base case, we stop here. But for the rest of these, we will still potentially continue. So for here, we're at, we're choosing between three. So we could include three, we'd have one three, or we skip three and we are left with a one. And this is another base case. So we would take this and add it to our result. And because the way we branch this, these are gonna be all combinations with a one. These are gonna be all combinations without a one. And we kind of do that recursively. So every time we branch, we're going to have separate distinct subsets on each side. So this is pretty much, identical to the subset solution and the code is going to be similar as well but there's one thing about this the time complexity we're branching twice every time uh, but what power is this two going to be raised to is it going to be two to the power of k because each subset is only going to be of size two so does that mean the height of this tree is going to be k where k is equal to two in our case nope actually because uh, that's the problem with this actually here we are choosing one and here we're choosing nothing because in so many spots here 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 in so many spots we're choosing nothing so we're skipping a value that's going to make the height of this tree actually uh, n, where n is the range of values that we can include. You can see even to make, well, to make this combination, it was actually at a height of two, but this combination over here is at a height of three and many of the other combinations are gonna be at other heights and the max height is gonna be five. So we can't say that this is the time complexity. We have to say two to the power of n is the time complexity, but actually even this isn't the time complexity. This is just the size of the tree itself. So that's the size of the tree. And for each combination itself to actually build that combination, the time complexity is a K because that's the size of each combination. So this is an approximation. For, this is at least an upper bound of the time complexity. I'm gonna show you how we can solve this problem with an even tighter big O time complexity. It's slightly more efficient, though practically speaking, I think this would probably be good enough enough in most interviews. So let me show you the code for this. So we have our combinations function. We're given those two parameters, n and k. We have our result combinations we're trying to return and we have our helper function, pretty similar. We're starting at the value one. So one is what we're passing in here. I in this case is not actually an index or anything. I is, you know, the actual individual value. We know our range of values is one through five. We just happen to start at one. So that's what I'm passing in here. And our initial current combination, that's gonna be the array that stores what our combination is so far. As we recursively uh, call our helper, comms is gonna be the actual result. And that's where we're gonna put each individual combination that we're eventually gonna return. N is gonna be you know, five in this example. K is gonna be two. That's the size of the combinations that we're going for. So we have some base cases here. One is that we have a combination, the length of our combination is exactly equal to K, in which case we're gonna take that combination, create a copy of it, and then append it to the result and then return. We don't need to do anything else. But there's actually a case where, you know, the path where we just keep choosing nothing. Like here we have an empty array, we keep just having an empty array, we keep skipping the value, and we will eventually go out of bounds. We'll go out of bounds in the sense that our i value, which is gonna be one through five, is gonna be too large. Like eventually it'll be five, and then eventually we're gonna choose nothing again, and then our i value is gonna be six. It's gonna be out of bounds. We can't include six as a part of any of the combinations. It's not a part of our valid range. So in that case, when we go out of bounds, we're simply gonna return because we went out of bounds, but we still don't have a combination that's equal to K. Okay, then we, we can't really do anything at this point, so we stop. But if we don't have any base cases, we have our two decisions that we're familiar with by now. We can either include I or we do not include I. If we include I, we add it to our current combination. We recursively call our helper where i is you know a part of our current combination and then after that's done we're going to pop i from our current combination and then recursively call the exact same function with the exact same parameters but the difference is that i is not a part of our current combination so this is pretty familiar i think if you already learned about subsets but now let's take a look at how we can optimize this and it has to do with math actually 
if we have a set of, you know, n numbers, in this case where n is 5, and we're trying to create all possible combinations of size 2, how many possible combinations even are there? Because that's the theoretical limit that we can reach. Because we know we have to create some number of combinations. Let's say that number is x. And for each of those combinations, they're going to be of size k. So this is theoretically the best time complexity we could possibly get. So how can we achieve this? When it came to subsets, we know that the number of subsets had to be 2 to the power of n. We can't do better than that. That's how many subsets exist. But for combinations, there's clearly going to be less combinations than there are subsets because uh, these combinations that we're talking about are of size 2, whereas the subsets were of any size. They included size 2, but they also included all the other possible sizes. So we know the number of combinations is going to be less than 2 to the power of n. Well, the math behind it is... It's actually a math formula in statistics. Uh, it's sometimes denoted like this. You're getting the combinations where we have n values choose k of them. It's called n choose k sometimes. It can be referred to as other things as well. But the idea is that this is a math formula and the math formula where we have n values and we want to choose k. How many possible combinations can we create? Well, this is the math formula n factorial divided by k factorial uh, add multiplied by n minus k factorial. Now, you definitely don't need to know this to solve this problem more efficiently. I'm just quickly going over this math background. But this is more efficient than 2 to the power of n. But let me show you how we can solve this problem by basically creating every single combination that we need without going down paths where we choose nothing and then end up creating a larger decision tree than we actually need to because it's not super crazy. So another way to think about the backtracking, instead of thinking about it in terms of choices where we could either choose like a one or not choose a one, let's instead think about it like we have in this case, k spots that we're trying to fill. So in this case, two spots. And for the first spot, we have five choices. We can choose any number between one and five. So we would have five branches uh, for every number between one and five. So next we want to fill the second position. So would we have four choices in that case? That would mean for one, we have every choice except for one. So we have two, three, four, five. And then maybe for two, we also have four choices. So one, three, four, five. And this would be all two digits because these two occur at a height of two. What we're doing here is we're never choosing nothing. We know here we chose one. So next we have to fill the second digit. We have every choice left remaining except for one. When we chose two, we have every choice left remaining except for two. Doing it this way, we are not ever choosing nothing, so the size of our decision tree has pretty much been minimized. But the problem here is we actually have duplicates. Here we have one, two, and here we have two, one. So even though they occur in a different order, we don't want to have uh, duplicates occur. So if we choose all five uh, values here, you know, one, two, three, four, five, and here we can choose every other four value, this will result in duplicates like this. So actually we're getting the incorrect result, but we're also making our decision tree larger than it needs to be. Well, to prevent this, what we can do is when we go down the path of one, we're getting all possible combinations where we have at least a single one a value in our combat in our uh, list of combinations. These are going to be all combinations that have at least a single one. So the rest of these paths have to generate all combinations that don't create a single one. So th that's what we have to do with the rest of these. So when we um, have our two over here, this can never include any more ones. So the only choice this guy has is to include a three, a four, or a five, because we said that this path will have at least a single one, but we actually know it's gonna have exactly a single one because with these combinations, we can never reuse the same value because we do want distinct combinations. So this is the path with exactly a single one. These are paths without any ones. And in fact, this path, 
path is going to be the path with exactly a single two. Because remember, we don't want this path to have any duplicates with any of the other three paths over here either. So that's how we're going to handle this. This is the path that contains a single two and never includes any ones. So this path is going to be the path that includes a single three, but never any ones and never any two. So this would have two children, four and five. I, obviously, this is getting messy. Sorry about that. Uh, and then this four would follow the similar pattern. This four will have a single four, but never any one, twos or threes. So the children of that four would just be five. And then the five would actually not have any possible children. So at this point, we would not go any lower here because this needs to be, remember, have two digits in it for it us to add this combination, but we can't really choose anything from here. So we wouldn't really continue down this path. And at this point, we actually have all of the possible combinations that we would include. Notice here that we do not have any possible duplicates, but these are all possible distinct combinations we could create. Let's follow our formula. First, let's count how many we have here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10. Let's see our formula. Remember our formula was n factorial divided by k factorial uh, times n minus k factorial. So this is the formula. Let's plug our values in. n here is 5 factorial divided by k factorial, which is 2 factorial, and then 5 minus 2 factorial. So that's going to be 5 times 4 divided by 2 factorial, which is just 2. So that's going to end up being 20 divided by 2, which is going to end up being 10. I mostly did the math in my head, but you can write it out if you'd like. The answer you will get is 10. So that's exactly what we were looking for. We have 10 combinations. So that's the result. So coding this up isn't going to be too different from the regular solution. The only difference is we're going to have a loop here because as you can see for one, we're basically going to every number after one. For two, we're basically going through every number after two for its children. For three, we're doing the same thing. And for four, we're doing the same thing. And for five, it didn't have any numbers after it. It was the last number in our set from one through n. So of course it didn't have any children. So this is the combinations code with the pretty much most optimal solution it has the tightest big O bound time complexity. That said, I don't know if most interviewers or companies will care about you finding like this most precise optimization. I think the solution K times two to the power of N solution would probably be good enough. It's a subtle enough improvement that I think in most cases, you know, this optimized version will probably not matter. But this type of pattern can definitely come up in other backtracking problems. In many problems, this is the only way to do it. It's kind of the same pattern we saw before where we uh, were creating subsets, but we were not given a distinct set of input numbers because we here you can see we have a loop. But so our combinations to set up the same, our result is going to be a list of combinations. We're starting at number one. Our current combination is initially empty. We're passing in the result that we're trying to build and we're passing in n and k. The base case in this case is that if our current combination is of length k, of length two in this case, then we're gonna create a copy of the current combination and add it to the result and return. Otherwise, if we go out of bounds, similarly, we will return. But for the recursion, we don't just have two choices in this case. We actually have a range of choices. If we're at the value i, basically we want to go through every path. Uh, i plus one, right, will be the children for i. So, if, you know, for example, we had three, the children would start at four to five, et cetera, et cetera, keep going until we reach the edge of our uh, range. So for that i value, we would pass in basically, you know, j, but adding one to it to make sure that we never repeat the same value, right? Like we don't want to reuse the same value. We keep, we're not allowed to do that, but also that we never result in any duplicates as well. And then after adding it, we're going to backtrack. This is part of backtracking, right? Where you make a decision. We have three, we add four to it. And then we, you know, handle the recursion, whatever, maybe this would have some children, but then we pop back up. We undo this, we backtrack, we pop the four, and then we try going down another path where we have maybe three, five. That's the idea behind backtracking. That's why we're popping here and then trying a different possible child. Other than that, the code you can see is pretty short. It is the same as, you know, the other backtracking solutions we've looked at so far, just that this has a slightly better uh, time complexity. That's what I was trying to kind of illustrate with this example. Another variation of solving this problem that's slightly more efficient.
And maybe this would have been the natural solution that you possibly came up with. Maybe you didn't think about it in terms of just two decisions. You were already thinking about this kind of approach. So next, let's talk about permutations, which in my opinion is a bit more complicated than combinations or subsets, but maybe for you it will actually be easier, who knows. Basically, we could be given some list of numbers. Let's assume that the numbers are distinct for simplicity, and we want to return all possible distinct permutations of nums. So first of all, what is a permutation? Because it's different than a combination. It's kind of the idea, uh, instead of for each number, whether we include it or not, right? Every you know possible subset of these numbers, we are including every single one. Like that's gonna be a permutation of nums. We include every single one of these, but we possibly rearrange the order of these. So we have four spots, we know that, but we want to rearrange the order. So how many possible permutations could we create of these? Well, for the first position, we can possibly choose any single one of these. So we have four possible values we can put in the first position. But after we've put something here, we can't reuse the value. So whether we put a one here or we put a two here, we can't reuse that value. Then we would just have three choices left for the second value. So we'd have three choices here. After we made the first two choices, we'd have two choices left. After we make those, we just have one choice left. So basically four times three times two times one. Another way of putting that is four factorial. So we say that the possible number of permutations we can create with a array of arbitrary size is going to be n factorial. So we know this is how many possibilities are going to be in our result of permutations. So to create all permutations using backtracking is what I'm going to show you first, but actually you can also do this using an iterative solution as well, which I'll show you in a bit. But there's actually multiple ways of going about this, even like thinking about it logically with a decision tree. So one way to think about it logically is that for each layer, we're going to be choosing a position. So for the first layer here of our decision tree, we're gonna be choosing the first position. For the first position, we can have either one, two, three, or four. And then for the second layer below that, we have three choices, but this is going for the second position. So for example, for one, we have every value other than one. So we could do two, three, four. For two, we could do the other three values that are not two. We can do one, three, four. Notice how we do kind of have a duplicate here, one, two, and two, one, but that's okay because for a permutation, one, two is different than two, one. The order matters. Since these are in a different order than this, these are different permutations. So this is actually fine. And we can continue doing this decision tree like this. Like here we'd have three, four, here we'd have four, and here we'd have three, and then this would be one permutation, a second permutation, and we could expand the tree just like that. We have n uh, layers here and children here we have n minus one and then we keep going like that until we get down to one so multiplying all these out will give us a time complexity of n factorial that's where you know this comes from and this is a perfectly valid way to think about it but coding it up this way is a little bit um, more annoying in my opinion because you have to kind of remove from this array to expand upon the children paths so another way to do it is similarly for the first step we'd have you know one two three four but for each of the paths we expand upon it differently like at this point we have an array of one what we do for this path is every number that comes after one so here we have two three and four we're going to insert each of these values in every possible position we can so in this case this two can either be inserted before the one or after the one. So we're going to do those paths for this guy. We'd have one, two, and we'd have two, one. We do the same thing for three and four. So we'd have one, three, and three, one. And we'd do the same thing with four. So we'd have one, four, and four, one. And then for each of these, we expand upon it similarly. We basically break it into a sub problem where we start at the first position. So we have an I pointer and we start at the first position. That's pretty typical for these backtracking problems. But we say generate all possible permutations with these three numbers and then I'll include one in that. 
So basically we pass i plus one, so we end up here. But for here, we do the same thing. To generate all possible permutations with these three, let's first generate all possible permutations with these two. So we uh, do the same thing. And then here we'll do the same thing. Instead of generating all permutations with these two, first generate all permutations with this. Now that's gonna be the base case. So you can kind of see how this solution in a way lends itself to iteration, which is what I'm gonna show you eventually. But in terms of recursion, you can kind of think about it, we you know made four kind of recursive calls and eventually we got to the point where we had just a single four that was returned to us. So I'll just kind of put a four. So that was the permutations we could create with just the single value. Now to that four itself, we can either add the three at the beginning of the four or add the three at the end of the four because now we're trying to create all permutations with these two numbers. So that's what we would do. Now we have this, this was returned up from the second, uh, you know, from this recursive call, basically up to the parent here. Now here, we're trying to do all permutations with all three uh, values, two, three, four. So basically we have these two permutations. We're gonna create a copy of this permutation, add a two at the beginning of it, which would give us this permutations, two, three, four. And we're also gonna try to add a two in the middle of it, which would give us this permutation, three, two, four. And we're also gonna add a two at the end of it, which would give us this permutation, three, four, two. And we'd also, this is obviously gonna start becoming a big list now because we would do the same thing with this permutation. We'd add a two at the beginning of it, add a two in the middle of it, and add a two at the end of it. So that's gonna give us six permutations here. And then for each of those six permutations, which each have three values in it, we're gonna try inserting the one in every possible value. So the one is gonna go at the beginning, uh, in between these two, in between these two, and at the end. So we'd have six permutations here, multiply those by four because a one value can go in all four positions. So then we'd end up here with 24 permutations. So how many permutations is that? Well, that's equal to four factorial. So this is just a different way to think about it logically. The main reason I'm showing you this way is because it's easier to code, but you can also implement it the other way where I kind of showed you we're actually branching with the decision tree. It's up to personal preference. But if I showed you the more complicated way to code it, then people would ask, hey, well, there's a simple way. Why didn't you show that? So I prefer to show you the simplest solution. So let's see how we could code this up. It's a bit different than the other backtracking approaches we've seen so far. So here's how we can compute the permutations recursively. The time complexity is going to be n factorial because that's how many permutations we're gonna have. Each permutation is gonna be of size n, so you know n values in it. So that would be a time complexity of n times n factorial. But lastly, you saw the way we were generating these uh, permutations. When we had a permutation, let's say of size uh, three, we had, uh, for example, two, three, four. Then for the one, we want to insert it in every possible position. And then we'll have a resulting permutation of size four. Now to have built that permutation of size four, it wasn't straightforward. It wasn't that we just added a two, then added a three at the end of it, and then added a four at the end of it. As you can see, when we have this one, we're inserting it at the beginning. To insert at the beginning of an array, is not a O of one time operation. It's an O of n time operation. To insert that one in between these two, same thing. It's an O of n time operation. So to arbitrarily insert a value in any position of an array is O of n. So to build each array normally would take O of n if each insert was an O of one time operation. But if each insert is an n time operation and we're doing it for n values, then to build each array is actually n squared. So to build each array in the output is n squared. How many of those arrays do we have? n factorial. So this is the big O time complexity here. It's easier to analyze the big O time complexity for this problem, thinking about the math actually, like how statistically these are actually built and calculated rather than looking at the recursive solution. It's, it would be pretty complicated to uh, get the time complexity from looking at this in my opinion. Code wise, you can see there's not a lot here. We have our permutation function where we're just passing in a list of numbers, but then our helper is going to actually calculate those permutations because we're gonna be moving through the array. We're gonna start at index zero of our array. That's what this I pointer is for. By the time we reach the end of the array, we actually do need to start with a base case. 
we could have actually made our base case here be when i is equal to length minus one, in which case what we would return is a single permutation with the last value, kind of how I showed in the drawing explanation, we would have returned a four, a list with just four inside it. Uh, and actually this list will be inside of another list here, but what we're actually doing here is we're just returning an empty list with an empty list. Uh, basically. And then what this will actually do, uh, suppose this is returned from the value i, then it'll be returned back to the uh, call where we're at i minus one. So that would mean our i pointer was here, but then we popped back to this position where we're at the last value. And for that, what we would say is for every array in our return value in our list here, we're going to create a copy of this and then insert the four in every possible position. So what we're saying is here we recursively call our helper from, you know, here we'd call the helper from this index and then to this index and this here and then here, and then we would get to the base case that I'm talking about here. So after we get that base case, then we're going to go through every permutation in the list of permutations here. We just have a single one that's empty. And then we're going to go through every position in the length plus one here because for an empty array, we have one position where we can insert it for an array of size one. We have two positions where we could insert it. We can insert at the beginning or we can insert at the end for an array of size two. We have three positions where we can insert at the beginning, middle, and end. That's the idea here. That's why we're doing length plus one. And then we're creating a copy of that permutation. And then for that copy, we're taking our nums of i value and inserting it at every possible value. So this j is basically a pointer that's going to iterate through every position in that permutation. For this uh, simple base case, it's just a single one here and we just have four. We're going to insert four at one position. So then from here, the return value though, we basically have our result of permutations. We initially had permutations. This was the return value from our recursive call. And then we have the result permutations that we're building, which would uh, from this just basically be this. So just a four inside it. And then from here, we would return our I pointer would be back at this three. And then for this, what we would do is create a copy of this, insert three in every position. So one copy would be three, four, and then another copy would be four, three. So that's why we're creating a copy of these because we want, you know, distinct in, uh, lists for the possible permutations. And then this would be our result permutations, which we would return here. And then we'd kind of do the same thing where we're now going to be, our I pointer is going to be at two. For each of these, we create a copy of it and then insert two in every possible position. So two, three, four, uh, you probably get the idea here. It's going to be a lot to write out. So I'm not going to write out all of these, but the two could also go in the middle. It could also go at the end. So that's this inner loop for each position that we can put the two in. We're going to create a copy of this, insert that two there, and then take that and add it to our result. And after we do that for this, we're going to do it for the second permutation. We're going to do it for every permutation in this list. So we would do the same thing for this guy and then we would return. And that's pretty much the entire idea behind this solution. So this is definitely tricky. The way I'm showing you is kind of a clever way to do it in terms of code because it ends up reducing the code that we write. But you could do this a different way where the nums that you're passing into each recursive call, you're actually removing from that. Like where initially you can see here, we start out with all four values. And then for each of those four values, we want to potentially make a decision. We want to do one, two, three, or four. Then for each of these children paths, for the one, you would want every value to be available except for the one. For two, you would want every value here to be available except for the two. So maybe recursively, you could pass in nums after removing two. That's a different approach. It makes more sense visually, I think, but in terms of code, it would be a bit more complicated. But I encourage you to try writing that out if you want to practice things. But now let me show you how we can solve uh, this same problem, basically translating this code into an iterative solution. Because you might be thinking the way kind of we're doing this, where we initially have just a list that's empty, and then we transform that into a list of just a single value, and then we uh, transform that into you know larger permutations, and we keep going. It does kind of make sense that this could be done iteratively. So you can see here that the iterative code is actually even shorter, but that doesn't always mean it's more simple to come up with. By now, we definitely know that. So you can see we're starting with an initial empty list of permutations. Technically, we just have the empty permutation. That's not really a valid permutation in this context, but it's going to help us build our result. So we're going to go through every single number in nums. 
So first we're gonna build all permutations with just the first value, just because it's more simple. I mean, we could iterate through this in reverse order just to uh, be consistent with the recursive solution, but there's no need to do that. We can also start at the beginning, uh, do all permutations with the first value, then build all permutations with these two, then with these three, and then finally with all four values, and that's going to be our result. So what we here say is this is our next list of permutations. This is our original list, and next we're gonna build the permutations with all one values and then this is going to be our list of permutations and then the next list of permutations we try to build is with two values and then three values what you can see we're doing is after we build the next list of permutations we're assigning that to our regular list of permutations and then we start the cycle over again until we've built it with all of these values and then we would return that but First, just starting with the first value here, we're gonna go through our list of existing permutations, which is just an empty permutation, and insert the n value here to every possible position, so every uh, i index in this guy, but there's only one just you know at the zeroth position, so that's what we would do. We would have our permutation of just one, and then we want to build all permutations with the second value included, so we would go through all our list of existing permutations. We just have one here, and then we would try to insert uh, n in every possible i position of that permutation. So we try to do two, one, uh, inserting it at index zero, and then we would try to insert it at index one, which uh, would be after the one. So we'd put two over here, and then uh, these are basically the permutation copies that we're building. And when we, uh, in, after we insert a value into it, then we add it to our list of next permutations. Uh, as I kind of drew over here, this is our list of next permutations. And then this is what our perms uh, would be assigned to. And this would basically no longer be in memory. And then we'd have our, our next list of permutations, which would be an empty array where we would, uh, you know, take these, create copies of them, insert, you know, th uh, in this case, three, our I pointer would be over here and, you know, build that next list of permutations, keep the cycle going, and then eventually return the result. So this is, again, not super crazy in terms of code. The time complexity is pretty hard to analyze from just looking at the code, but uh, conceptually, we know mathematically this is what's actually going on here. Each time we insert, this is where that n time operation is coming from. Each permutation is going to be of size n, so that's n squared. The number of permutations we're going to have in our result is always going to be n factorial. That's just kind of mathematical. So that's going to be the overall time complexity here. So this might have blown your brain, I'm not sure. Who knew you could take recursive solutions and also write them iteratively? So maybe this doesn't even count as backtracking. I think it sort of still does, but it's definitely a different way to do it. But there are different ways of calculating permutations. There's actually several different ways you can write this code. I encourage you to try writing it a different way if you'd like, if maybe this way doesn't make a ton of sense to you. I think this probably is code-wise the easiest way to do it though. Now let's learn about Dijkstra's algorithm, which is a shortest path algorithm. First of all, why do we need this shortest path algorithm? Because we talked about another shortest path algorithm, which is called BFS, breadth for search. But the downside of that is it only works when the edges in our graph are not weighted. So when we're given unweighted graphs, it's equivalent to being given a graph where every edge just has a weight of one. In that case, how can we find the shortest path given some source node? For example, let's say A is our source node and we have a bunch of nodes in the graph and we wanna find the shortest path from A maybe to D. How would we do that? Well, we would go breadth first search. We would go layer by layer. What are all the nodes we can reach with one you know, jump, with one edge? Starting from A, this is the first layer of nodes. And then we would do BFS on those nodes. So asking ourselves, which nodes can we reach within two edges? Well, in this case, we can reach you know, the remaining nodes within another jump. So within one node, we can reach all these. Within two nodes, we can reach these. By doing this, not only did we find the shortest path from A to D, but we essentially found the length of the shortest path from A to every node in the graph, essentially. We found that the length from A to these two is simply one. The length from A to these two is simply two. But what if I change the weight of this edge from being one to being 
10. Then what? Let's try the BFS way. What are all the nodes we can reach within two edges? These two nodes, of course. But the cost of reaching C is going to be 1. The cost of reaching B is going to be 10. Even though it was just one edge, the cost was so much higher. And then within two jumps, we can reach, you know, these two nodes as well. But not only that, but actually we can take an alternative path that takes two edges starting from A to get to B. So it took two edges, but the total cost of that was only two, as opposed to this path, which took one edge, but the cost was 10. So BFS is not sufficient for finding shortest paths when we're given edges that have weights. Dijkstra's algorithm, though, can solve this problem for us, and actually, it's very, very similar to BFS. So to set up the problem, we're given a graph with some nodes and edges, starting from some arbitrary node, in this case, it's A. We want to find the length of the shortest path, it looks like there's a typo here, but ignore that, the shortest path to every other node in the graph. So our output is gonna look something like this. Well, in this case, we're including A in the output. Well, what's gonna be the shortest path from A to A? Well, there's not necessarily a self loop here, but the value that we put here actually is gonna be important because we're gonna use it to implement our solution, but we know the length is going to be zero essentially. So the idea behind this algorithm is that we're of course gonna start at A and we are going to do a breadth first search actually, but it's a greedy breadth first search, meaning we have from A two edges going out. We have an edge going to node B, it has a weight of 10. We have another edge going to C, which has a weight of three. Among these two neighbors, which one do you think we should visit first? Probably C, but what do we know about C? Do we know for sure that this is the shortest path from A to C? Of course we do. Can you figure out why by looking at this picture? We already know that C, the shortest path from A to C, is three. The reason is that there's only two possible paths we could take from A that leave A. We could go to B and we could go to C. If we go to B, we incur a cost of 10. Now, there might be another path from B that takes us to C. In this case, there's not, but there could have been. Is it possible that that path from B that takes us to C is going to be shorter than 3? It's impossible. And the reason is that we're assuming that we don't have any negative weights in our graph. None of the edges are going to have a negative weight. That's the assumption that we're making. So if that's the case, since we already incur a cost of 10, we're never going to recover from that. When we took the other path, we only had a cost of three. We can't beat that going the other way. It's just not possible. And even more than that, actually, when we do this breadth first search, we're going to now visit C because it was the shortest path. But now, how are we going to continue this breadth first search? Don't we have to go through all of the neighbors of A? Not necessarily. We don't necessarily have to visit B just yet. Now, actually, we have multiple choices. These are the two nodes that we visited so far. And actually, at this point, A would be marked with a cost of zero. But these are the two nodes we visited so far. Now we have several choices. We can take this edge that costs 10 that takes us to B, or we can take this edge that takes us to E, which costs two. Actually though, we wouldn't only care about the two, we would take three plus two into account because we wanna know what's the cost from A to E. We don't care about from C to E, so we want the total cost. So here we would say the cost to reach E is going to be 5. The cost to reach B is going to be 10. But hold on, there's a couple more. From C to reach D, the cost is going to be 8 plus 3. That's 11. That's another choice we have. And the last choice we have, actually, we can reach B a second way with an edge of 4 plus 3. So that's 7. So actually, in this case, there's a shorter path 
from B. We don't even have to take this way. We can go directly like that. So that's the idea behind this algorithm. Among all of the choices we can make, in this case, we have one, two, three, four choices. We always want to pick the choice that's going to take the minimum cost, that's going to be the shortest path. And in this case, among these four choices that we have, the shortest path is going to be this one because the total cost of that is going to be five. So if we know that the total cost of reaching E is five and that's smaller than all the other choices that we currently have, then none of those possible choices are ever going to lead us to a path that takes us to E that's ever gonna cost less than five because you know, going to D itself is costing more than five. Going to B here is costing seven. Going to B this way is costing 10. None of those paths are ever going to lead us to a shorter path than this one that we have right here. So the idea behind Dijkstra's algorithm is that we have a frontier. Our frontier is the nodes that we've visited so far, the nodes that we've calculated the shortest path for so far. And among that frontier, we want to consider all the outgoing edges. And among those edges, we want to choose the one with the shortest path, not just the shortest path of that individual edge, but the total cost, the total path from the starting to that target node. So among those, we want to take the minimum. So we're actually going to need another data structure for this a data structure that we've covered, which is called a min heap. This is one of the use cases of that data structure. So now to finally set up the problem, we're going to have a min heap where we add a pair of values. At least that's the way I like to do it. The key of the min heap is going to be the cost. That's the first value in our pair. And the second value is going to be the node because we want to pop the nodes reachable from our frontier that have the lowest cost. We want to do this in a greedy way. And by the way, this output is going to be a hash map. At least that's the easiest way to do it because for each node, we want to map it to the minimum cost to reach that node. The way we're going to initialize this is pretty much empty, but the way we're going to initialize our heap actually is by taking the starting point, which is A, and we're going to add it with a cost of zero and the node is A. And then the algorithm is pretty straightforward. We're gonna continue while our min heap is not empty, we're gonna pop from it. So the first node that we pop, no surprise, is gonna be A. We're gonna find that the cost to reach A is zero. We're gonna look in our hash map. We're gonna see that we haven't calculated the length of the shortest path for A yet, but now we have it, it's zero. So this is the first node in our frontier. It's the first node we've visited so far. And now we're just gonna go through its list of neighbors. Since we're going through that list of neighbors, you can probably tell that the easiest way to represent this graph is going to be with an adjacency list. So we're gonna go through the list of neighbors of A and push them onto the heap. But what we're gonna push is going to be the cost to reach each of these nodes. We have two nodes in this case, B and C. What we're gonna push on is going to be the cost to reach B, which is going to be the cost to reach A, which was zero, no surprise there, plus the cost of that single edge. So zero plus 10 is gonna be 10. That's the cost to reach B. And do the same thing for C. The cost to reach C is gonna be zero plus three. So push that onto our min heap. So now rinse and repeat. We're gonna pop from our min heap the one with the smallest cost. It's C, we pop C. The cost to reach C was three. So now we have that information. Now for C though, we're gonna go through its frontier. We're gonna go through all of its neighbors. We have a few of them, we have E. So when we push E onto the heap, we want the cost to reach E. It's gonna be the cost to reach C, which was three plus the cost of that edge, which is two. So three plus two is gonna be five. So we're gonna add a cost of five is to reach E. We're gonna push that onto the heap. Then for D, we're gonna get eight. 
plus three, that's 11 to reach D. And hold on now, we can also reach B. We definitely want to push that information, especially in this case, because this is gonna be the shortest path to reach B. So we have four plus three is the cost to reach B from C. So we add that, seven is the cost to reach B. Notice how B is pushed to the heap multiple times. That's perfectly fine because as long as we put the shortest path to reach B in our result, we're perfectly fine with adding it to the heap multiple times because we know among these two, which one are we gonna pop first? The one with the smaller cost. So after we pop this one, we're gonna put seven as the cost to reach B. And then when we pop the second one, we're gonna see that we already have the result for B, so there's no need to you know, put a larger value over here. But for now, let's continue with our solution. We're gonna pop the one with the smallest cost, which is E, so to reach E, we get a cost of five. Now let's get all the neighbors of E. Well, it doesn't have any neighbors, so we don't have to do anything in this case. Our heap stays the same. So let's pop again from our heap. This time we're gonna pop B because it has a cost of seven. So we got the cost to reach B, it's seven. So this is part of our visited nodes. We just have a single node left. But let's get the neighbors of B. It just has a single neighbor, which is D. What's the cost to reach D? It's not just two, remember. It's going to be the cost to reach B, which was seven plus two. So we're gonna add nine is one of the ways we can reach D. Good thing we did that because now we found a shorter path to reach D. The other one we had costed 11. That's why this greedy algorithm works because we always take the shortest possible path at every single step. That guarantees that for our result, we'll also find the shortest possible path for every single node. So now finally among these, let's pop the one with the smallest cost, which is D. So nine is the cost to reach D. At this point, our result is complete, but depending on how you code this, the algorithm might still run. We might still add the neighbors of D, which in this case is going to be E. So we would probably add like a 14 with E. And depending on how you code this, we might still end up popping every value from the min heap, even though our result is essentially complete, or you could stop after the result is complete if there's a way that you can calculate that. But that's the idea behind this algorithm. Now let's analyze the time complexity before we jump into the code. So to analyze the time complexity, first recall if we have a graph, let's say with V vertices, ver by vertices I mean node, what's the maximum number of edges we could have? Well, it's gonna be equal to V squared because every single node could be connected to every other node. So that's simple so far. The other thing is when we push and pop from our min heap, the size of our heap in the worst case could be the number of edges in the graph because as we saw, we might add the same node, B for example, multiple times to the min heap, one for every edge that's going into that node. So the size of our heap in the worst case will be E, which is gonna be in the worst case V squared. So pushing and popping from the heap is going to be a log E operation in the worst case. How many times in the worst case are we gonna push and pop from the heap? Well, we might have to do it for every single edge in the graph, because if that's gonna be the size of our heap, we might in the worst case pop as many times as we have to. We might keep popping until the heap becomes empty. So in that case, we would do E operations, that's the number of edges, multiplied by log E, which would be the size of our heap in the worst case. So that is actually the time complexity of Jixter's algorithm. Though sometimes you see this written in a different way. Sometimes you'll see people write this as E times log V. Why is that the case? As I mentioned, the number of edges is actually gonna be in the worst case uh, V squared. And the way logarithms work, this can actually be reduced to two times log V. We basically take that square and then move it here. That's just a property of logarithms. So this can be actually reduced. We get rid of the constants, can be reduced to E log V. 
V. So that's why, you know, people will reduce it to this because even though it's E log E, it can be, you know, mathematically reduced to E log V. And this is, I guess, a more tight boundary. And, you know, sometimes you might even see it be written as V squared times log V. But I think that's a bit less precise because we might not necessarily have V squared edges in the graph. So I think probably the most correct way is E log V. That's, I think, the most common way you'll see this written, the time complexity for Jixtra's algorithm. Now let's take a look at the code. Surprisingly, it's not quite as bad as you would think. It's pretty similar to BFS. So this is what the shortest path code would look like. This is assuming that we're given a list of edges. So for example, you know, a, an edge from B to D, the edge will have three, the edge will have three values where the first value is the starting node, for example, B. The second value will be the ending node, the destination node, D, for example, in this case. And the third value will be the weight of that edge. In this case, it's two. So it will be a two dimensional array where the nested array is an array of three values that I just talked about right now. So like I said, the easiest way to traverse this would be with an adjacency list. So when we're given just a list of edges, what we wanna do is convert it into an adjacency list. Let's say we're also given the number of nodes. So in this case, we're given five nodes. That would be a parameter N. So what I would do in this case, the nodes are characters, but let's say for this code, the nodes were uh, integers. So if we're given an integer five, let's say we know that each node is gonna be labeled, you know, with integers between one through five. So there's gonna be a node for one, two, three, four, and five. So what we would do is essentially for our adjacency list, which is a hash map, we would go through each integer from one through five and give that node a list of neighbors, which is gonna be an empty array of neighbors initially. And then we're gonna go through the actual edges that were given and then to the adjacency list, append those destination nodes. So we would append a pair or maybe a subarray in this case, where the first value is gonna be the destination node and the second value is gonna be the weight or the cost it takes for us from the source to reach that destination node. So this is just a bunch of setup actually. To actually run Jixter's algorithm, it's even less code. Suppose we're given the source node, in our case it was A. What we would do is first declare our shortest hash map. So for every single node in the graph, we want the length we want to map that node to the length of its shortest path starting from A. And we're going to initialize our heap with uh, the cost, the weight of reaching the source node, A in this case is zero. That's how we're going to initialize our heap. And then we're going to continue the algorithm while our heap is non-empty. What we're going to do is pop from the heap we know we're gonna get the same pair of values that we add to the heap, which the first value is the weight or the cost. The second value is the node itself. If that node has not already been visited, meaning for that node, we haven't calculated the shortest path, then we want to add the shortest path. We're saying this is the cost to reach that node. But if the node was already visited, then we would basically skip this node. We would just go to the next iteration of the loop. Just say, what's the next value we're gonna pop? Because we definitely don't want to overwrite this with a larger weight. That's why we would skip the iteration of the loop. And after we pop a node and get the shortest path, and get the length of the shortest path for that node, then we wanna go through the neighbors of that node. So for example, for A, we wanna go through its neighbors and each of those neighbors is going to have a node. Remember, that's what we pushed to our adjacency list. The first value was the node. The second value was the cost, the weight to reach that node. So for this neighbor, if for that neighbor we haven't already calculated the shortest path, this is important because we don't want to end up getting stuck in an infinite loop. For example, if you know from C, maybe we are maybe we had an edge going back to A. We don't want to end up, you know, pushing C to the min heap and then pushing the neighbor of C, which is A, and then pushing the neighbor of A, which is C. We don't want to get caught in that kind of infinite loop. That's why we make sure not to push a node that we've already calculated the shortest path for. But if we haven't calculated the shortest path for that node, then we want to push it to the min heap. We want to push that node, but the value that we really care about that we're pushing is the cost to reach that node. What's that cost going to be? If we were pushing E, for example, weight one 
would be the cost to reach C, which was 3. Weight 2 would be the edge cost from C to E, which in this case is 2. We want to add those two values together, and that's the cost that we want to push to the heap. So that's very important, but that's literally it. Then our greedy, then our greedy Dijkstra's algorithm will continue to find the shortest path for every node. And then after our min heap is empty in this case, that's the conditional I'm using. But another way you could do this actually is by checking that the length of the shortest matches the number of nodes in our graph. That's assuming the graph itself is connected. So we will find a shortest path for every single node, but it might not necessarily be the case. So I think the more general way to write this algorithm is while the min heap is non-empty. And then we will simply return that shortest path hash map. So this was definitely a lot to cover. This is considered kind of an advanced algorithm, but it's not crazy difficult once you can wrap your head around it. It can definitely take time though. I won't deny that. So it's important to practice. But knowing this algorithm is really helpful. It definitely can come up in coding interviews a lot. It's a really famous textbook algorithm that you definitely want to have in your toolkit. So now let's learn Kruskal's algorithm, which is actually just another way to find the minimum spanning tree of a connected graph. So maybe if Prim's algorithm was too confusing for you, you might prefer Kruskal's algorithm. And actually, in my opinion, conceptually, it's a much easier algorithm to understand. Now, coding it up might be a bit more difficult, and that's because it actually uses the union find data structure. So if you can just use like a built-in union find data structure, it's pretty easy to code this algorithm up. But if you can't, you'll have to implement your own union find, which is not super complicated as we learned earlier, but it does take quite a bit extra code to do that. The idea is similar to Prim's algorithm. We want to take minimum edges. We want to be greedy. We want to add the edges with the smallest weight because we want our minimum spanning tree to have the minimum cost of connecting all these nodes together. But instead of Prim's algorithm where we start at a single node and then just add adjacent nodes to our frontier and then you know after we've added one of those adjacent nodes then we have like a larger frontier then we have more nodes to choose from and then you know we choose the minimum of the you know adjacent neighbors instead of doing that kruskal's actually skips that altogether we just take all possible edges and then start taking the minimum of those edges and then add that to our minimum spanning tree so the idea would be that among all these edges, pick the one with the smallest weight. In this case, it's one. So we add this to our minimum spanning tree. So now we have these two nodes as a part of our minimum spanning tree. Now we don't actually mark these as visited. Kruskal's handles it a bit differently. This is where it can get a bit more complicated actually, because now we're gonna add the next edge with the smallest cost. It's gonna be two. So we already had these two as a part of our graph. Now we're adding this edge. And this edge actually also includes a node that we already added before. So how do we know we're not introducing a cycle? Well, that's where union find comes in actually. We initially start with this graph and we have five individual nodes, right? We have five individual components of this graph. As we add edges, for example, when we add this edge, we essentially union these two together. These are now a part of a single connected component, but we also have three individual nodes remaining. Then when we add this edge, we're essentially connecting this portion to this node. Since these were not previously connected to each other, we know for sure we're not introducing a cycle, right? We're not introducing a redundant edge. But now as we continue, we've added these two cycles. We're gonna take now among the remaining edges, the one with the minimum cost. In this case, it's this edge. So this time we have you know, this component over here and a couple edges connecting these nodes together. But now we just added this edge, which connects these two nodes together. So we have two connected components, but that's perfectly fine. We don't have a cycle, but we know we want all the nodes to be connected to each other without forming a cycle. So now we have five nodes. So we know for sure we're going to need four edges. 
So now at this point, we can actually choose any of these three edges and all of them will form a minimum spanning tree. So if we add this edge, then this becomes our minimum spanning tree. If we add this edge, then this becomes our minimum spanning tree. And if we add this guy, then this becomes our minimum spanning tree. Notice how none of them have a cycle. So that would be our result. We would end up choosing one of these three and we would get our result. But the reason Kruskal's algorithm works is because we make sure that we don't introduce an edge that creates a cycle. Now this example didn't really illustrate that super well, but let's say I change this one to a four. Well, I'm gonna change this three to an eight, let's say. So now when we try to build the minimum spanning tree, we're gonna choose the edge with the smallest weight. It's this one, so we connect these two together. Now among these four, we have a tie. So I'm just gonna arbitrarily choose this one. So when we introduce this edge, we do not create a cycle because we're connecting two different components together. Now let's add another one. Let's arbitrarily choose this one. That's okay because we had one component over here and we had another component over here. Our union find is gonna tell us that we are allowed to union these two together because they're not already a part of the same connected component. So that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna union them together. Then among these two, let's say we pick this edge. Well, the problem is that these two nodes here are already a part of the same connected component. So by adding another edge here, we know for sure we're creating a cycle because they're already a part of the same component. That means there's already a path from C to D. So by adding another edge here, we're creating another path from C to D. Now there's two paths here. And since we know this graph is undirected, that means that we have a cycle. So since our union find would tell us that this edge is redundant, that these are already connected, we would choose not to add this edge. So we would remove it from consideration without adding it to our minimum spanning tree. Then among the remaining nodes, we would choose this one because it has the smallest cost. And again, we would find that these two nodes are actually a part of the same connected component. So if we add this node, we're gonna create a cycle. So we're not gonna add this node. Once again, we're gonna skip it. Well, this edge. Once again, we're gonna skip this edge. Now among these two remaining, we could add either of these two nodes actually would create a tree. Then all these would be connected if we add this edge. Also, we could add this edge and again, all of these would be connected. But we want to minimize the cost, so we're gonna choose the one with the smallest weight, and this is the one that we're gonna choose. Every time we introduce an edge, we wanna make sure we're connecting two nodes together that previously were not connected. That's gonna get us to forming a tree. By choosing the one with the minimum cost, we're gonna ensure that we create the minimum spanning tree. So Kruskal's algorithm is just another greedy algorithm, just like Dijkstra's algorithm and Prim's algorithm. So the code here is quite a bit shorter actually. And the reason is because the union find data structure, I'm not showing the code for that, but if you wanna see the entire code for that, I will have it below. You can also of course go to the union find lesson to understand the implementation of the union find data structure. So given a list of edges, we're not actually gonna to need to build an adjacency list in this case, because for any given node, we don't really care what its neighbors are. We don't care at all. We just care about the entire list of edges. And using those edges, we will make sure that we don't create a cycle by using union find. So in this case, our heap actually is going to be initialized with every single edge in the input. We're also given n, which is gonna be uh, the total number of nodes. And we're gonna to be told that each node is labeled from one through n. Now going through the list of edges, each edge is gonna have two nodes connecting them together. We don't really care about the source and the destination because we know each edge is undirected anyway. So node one, node two, and it's gonna have a weight. We know we care about the weight the most when we're pushing to the min heap. That's the value that's gonna be used to decide how to pop first. And the nodes also matter, but in this case, actually the order that we put the nodes does not matter at all because when we add them to the union find, it doesn't really matter what order we union them together. So we're gonna initialize our union find data structure, giving it N for the number of nodes that we're initializing it with. We're gonna have an empty array for our minimum spanning tree. And this time we're gonna continue the algorithm while the length of the minimum spanning tree is less than N minus one, because we know we have N nodes in the graph. We know we're just 
just going to need n minus 1 edges to form the minimum spanning tree. As long as every time we add an edge, we're not introducing a cycle. So we're going to pop from the min heap the weight, node 1 and node 2. We don't really care about the weight. It was just used to pop the edge with the smallest weight, but we're not going to need that weight again. We're going to take these two nodes, try to union them together. But if not, if we can't union them together, we're simply going to skip this edge. We're going to continue to the next iteration of the while loop. But if we can union them together, then we're going to take that edge. We're defining the edge as being node 1 to node 2 and taking that edge and adding it to the result, the minimum spanning tree. And then once we've done that n minus one times, we're gonna simply return what the minimum spanning tree is. Now, what do you think the time complexity of Kruskal's algorithm is? Well, it's pretty similar to Dijkstra's algorithm and pretty similar to Prim's algorithm because we are pushing and popping from the min heap the main difference here is that we also have union find. As we pop from the heap, we're also unioning two nodes together. Now the time complexity for popping from the heap is gonna be log n, or rather log e, where e is the number of edges in the entire graph. That's the worst case, and we know e can be reduced to v squared, and we know that two can go over here. So really the time complexity to pop is log V. And actually unioning two nodes, depending on how you implement the union find with path compression and union by rank, it could also be a log E or maybe it could even be a constant time operation. So the, this union find actually d doesn't really matter. It doesn't really affect the time complexity because uh, the heap pop operation is you know, roughly the same time complexity anyway. So no matter how efficient we make this, it doesn't matter. This is gonna be the bottleneck. So the overall time complexity sense, we may push and pop from the min heap a total of E times for the total number of edges. And we know pushing and popping each time is gonna be roughly log V. So this is the overall time complexity. The overall memory complexity is going to be big O of E because we have to take every single edge and add it to the min heap. So that's where the memory complexity comes from. So even though a lot of these ideas can definitely be difficult to wrap your head around, I hope you're starting to see the similarities. Most graph algorithms have a lot of similarity between them. And that's definitely true for the minimum spanning tree algorithms, definitely true for the shortest path algorithms as well. So now whenever you need to find a minimum spanning tree, you have two ways of doing it. You can use Prim's algorithm or you can use Kruskal's algorithm. You can do whichever one you prefer. I sort of prefer Prim's algorithm because it's similar to Dijkstra's algorithm, which is you know more common. Kruskal's though is pretty dang easy, especially if you don't have to implement union find from scratch. Next, let's move on to topological sort. I really like this algorithm because it's one of those algorithms you can kind of learn without actually knowing it's an official algorithm. Suppose we have a graph that looks kind of like this. By definition, the topological sorting, aka the topological order of this graph, would basically be a sequence of each node itself. So in this case, we'll use the label of each node. So one valid topological ordering would be this, A, B, C, D, E, F. So when we call it topological sort, maybe sort is a little bit misleading, but that's just the name of it. In a sense, it is sorting, but it's not sorting an array. It's pretty open-ended because this is one valid topological ordering of this graph, but there's actually many. Let's talk about the definition of a topological ordering. Basically, given a graph like this one, a valid topological ordering is to say that for every single edge we have, such as this one, every edge has to be directed. So they have to have a direction. That's important because for every edge, a valid topological ordering guarantees that the source node comes before the destination node in the topological ordering result. So in the result here, you can see that yes, A comes before C, and we had to do that because of this edge. We also see that E comes before F. We also see that C comes before E. Not directly before, but in the general ordering, it appears first in the sequence and then eventually E appears as well. So basically with just these two edges, we're told that A has to come before C and C has to come before E. So implicitly, we know that A has to come before E. So you can see that that is the case. A is before E. That's just pretty logical in my opinion. 
So given this graph, it's guaranteed that A is going to come first in the sequence. Nothing else could come first because every single other node has an edge coming into it. So F has a couple edges coming into it, D and E, but it has nothing coming after it. So F is actually guaranteed to be the last in this uh, topological ordering. A, of course, you know, doesn't have anything coming into it. That's why it appears first. These siblings sort of though are actually ambiguous because we know that for B, A has to come before it. For C, a has to come before. That's all that's required of these two nodes, actually. So we wrote it like BC, but actually uh, writing it like CB is also valid because there's no requirement on which one of these two has to come first. As long as A appears before both of them, then we're good. That's the idea behind topological sort. Another thing about it, though, it only works for graphs that are directed. We already talked about that but also the graphs have to be acyclical. So we can only run this algorithm on a directed acyclical graph, AKA a DAG. What if we tried running this on a graph that did have a cycle? Suppose from E, we have another edge going back to A. What would happen in that case? Well, this kind of breaks the definition of topological sort because we know that A has to go before C. So we know we'll have a sequence something like this. A goes before C. C has to go before E. So we can have a sequence, you know, something like that. And then we're told that E has to go before a, how is that possible? Because we know our sequence has to look something like this. So how can we possibly put E over here, but also have it come after the C? It's impossible. That's why topological sort does not work for cyclical graphs. But notice how I didn't mention the fact that the graph has to be connected. That's how this is different from a tree. If we had a graph like this, where we have two connected components, this is actually valid. We can run topological sort on this. What does it mean though? Which one of these two has to come first in the ordering? Because this time, both of these do not have an incoming edge. So which one is gonna go first in the topological ordering? Actually, it doesn't matter. That's why topological sort is pretty open-ended. There's a lot of possible solutions. With this graph alone, there's actually several valid topological orderings. One, the simple one would be uh, what we had before, A, B, C, D, E, and then put G, H after that. But we could also rearrange this a lot. Like this GH is pretty independent of any of these. We could insert this right in the middle of this somewhere. We could put it before, we could put it after. It really doesn't matter. All we have to guarantee is that the G shows up before the H. That's all we have to do. The rest doesn't matter. And, then, and of course, we have to preserve you know, the ordering of these as well. So given a directed acyclical graph like this one, that's not necessarily connected into a single component. It could have multiple components. How do we find a valid topological ordering? Just a single one, how do we do it? Well, we could actually do it with DFS or BFS. These are the two common traversal algorithms for a graph. So we could do it either way. We're going to be focusing on DFS. So how could we solve this problem with DFS? Well, let's just start at the beginning of each of these components, right? Let's, for example, this one, let's start at the beginning of it. Let's just start, you know, printing each character or adding it to some result. Let's say we want to take each value of each node and then add it to an array, which represents the topological ordering. So this would be pretty easy, right? Start at A, do DFS, add A, then start going, you know, down one of the branches. So this is our first neighbor of A. So let's start going down this branch recursively. Now let's run DFS on B. So let's add B to the result. Let's go down B's neighbor. It just has a single one, D, add D to the result. D just has a single neighbor, add F to the result. And F does not have any neighbor, so we can't do anything anymore. So at this point, we would just pop all the way back up recursively, and then we would end up getting up to A. So then for A, we'd go to its next neighbor, C, so we'd add C to the result. Then we'd get to E because C only has a single neighbor. Let's add E to the result. And this time, finally, we would get to F again. But in this case, we end up adding F to the result twice. That's probably not what we want to do. 
we don't want duplicates in our topological ordering. So how would we solve this problem? Well, to ensure we don't add the same node multiple times, because you know one node could have multiple incoming edges, this doesn't necessarily imply that there's a cycle. So if this is the case, we don't wanna add the same node twice. So the easiest way to solve this problem is by having a hash set. We'll use it to keep track of nodes that we've already visited before. This is not something new. This is something we usually do with DFS on graphs. So far, this algorithm is turning out to be pretty straightforward, but don't get your hopes up. Things can get more complicated. So when we get to F, we're gonna find that we've already visited it before. So we're not gonna add it to the result again. Also, we're not gonna run DFS on this guy again because it could have had some you know, neighbors. It could have had another neighbor, maybe X or something like that. If that was the case, we would have already ran DFS on it once when we went down this path and therefore X would have already been added to the result. So we wouldn't wanna run DFS on F again because then we would end up adding you know, X again. So our visit hash set will prevent us from doing that. So now we've gone through one component. Next, we would just want to start at the beginning of the other component and run DFS on this guy. Pretty easy. Start at G, add G to the result, get to the neighbor, H, add H to the result, and we're done. We did that for the entire graph and we have a valid topological ordering. Well, we actually have a problem. Can you spot it? Take a look at our ordering. It's not quite valid, is it? And you probably noticed it a lot earlier when we got to this point where we got to F and then we added F to the result. The problem with doing that is, yes, before we add F, we have to make sure we add D to the result, but we also have to make sure we add e to the result as well. So how can we possibly know that we've already added all incoming edges of f? Like we don't have necessarily an edge from f going to these guys, so we don't know that we've added them. So to solve this problem, so to solve this problem, there's actually two common techniques with topological sort that people use. I'll be focusing on the one that I think is easier but I'll briefly talk about the other one. So let's talk about the one that I'm not gonna go super into detail on. And that's because it requires sort of modifying the graph if the graph isn't in the form that we want. So let's take a look. Sometimes what people do is they'll take the graph and reverse it. That means they'll take every single edge in the graph and put it in reverse order. So if we had two edges going out of A, now we would have two edges coming into A from you know, its original neighbors. And that would be the case for every single edge that we have. And so now, instead of starting at you know, what we thought was the beginning of each of these connected components, we're gonna start at the end of them. So this time, we're gonna start at F because it's the last node. But as we run DFS, before what we were doing, we were sort of running pre-order DFS where we added each element as soon as we visited it. But this time we're gonna do the opposite. We're gonna first get to seven, we're gonna visit it, but we're not gonna add it to the result just yet. Then we're gonna go to one of its neighbors, D, we're not gonna add it yet. Then we're gonna go to its neighbor, B, we're not gonna add it yet. Then we're gonna get to its neighbor, A, we're still not gonna add it. We're gonna go to all the neighbors of A, it doesn't have any neighbors. Now we would add A to the result. And then when we get back to B, B doesn't have any more neighbors anymore, so then we'd add B to the result. Same thing with D. And then we'd get back to F, but before we add F, to the result, we want to see, does F have any more neighbors? It does. So it has E. So then we visit E. But before we add E to the result, we're going to visit its neighbors. Do you kind of see why we're doing this? When we had the original edge going from C to E, what we were told by definition, we have to have C appear before E in the result. Same thing for F. Before F goes in the result, both of the incoming edges have to be in the result before we can add F to the result. So we kind of reverse the logic here. We say that, okay, we'll go ahead and add F to the result after we add all of its descendants. And we'll add these guys to the result after we add all of their descendants. And we keep doing that. So we kind of reverse this and I'll quickly run through this. So for E, we'd go to E's neighbors C, and for C, we'd go to C's neighbor, 
A, but we already visited A, so we wouldn't want to add it multiple times. So then we would add C to the result, and then we'd pop back to E, we'd add E to the result, and then finally we can add F to the result. And we do the same thing with H and G. So we'd visit H before we add it, we're gonna visit its neighbor, G. G doesn't have any neighbors. So then we can add G to the result and then we can add H to the result. So you can see here, we do have a valid topological ordering. We make sure that A goes before any of these guys and we made sure that F went after all of them. So this is the way that I don't prefer because sometimes you can't modify the graph you're a given. And I think modifying the graph is harder than what I'm about to show you right now. What I'm about to show you is actually easier. So this is the second way of doing it. What we do is we start at the beginning. We do the same thing where we don't add this to the result just yet. We want to add its descendants to the result first. But before we add those descendants, and we're gonna do this DFS, so we'd go down one path first, so B, and then we'd go down D, and we'd keep doing that until we got to the base case like this one where this guy does not have any children. Then we would add it to the result. We'll add F to the result. And then when we pop back up to D, we'll add D to the result. And then when we pop back up to B, we'll add B to the result. By the way, we were able to add F because we know for sure it doesn't have any more uh, descendants. Then we'll pop back up to A, but again, before we can add A to the result, we want to make sure we add its descendants. It does have another neighbor C, so we'll get to C, but before we add C, let's add E. Before we add E, we gotta add F, but we'll notice that F was already visited, so we're not gonna do that. We pop back up to E, we add E to the result, then we pop back up to C, add C to the result, then we finally pop back up to A and add A to the result. We'll do the same thing for G and H. So we'll start at G. Before we add it, we got to add its neighbor and H does not have any neighbor. So now we can add H and then we can add G. But you notice something about this. Well, this isn't even close to topological ordering. Or is it? Because what we originally wanted to do is add A before we add any of its descendants. But what we ended up doing, since we did it post-order traversal, we did the opposite. We added all of its descendants and then we added A. Same thing for G. We added G's neighbor before we added G. So actually, if we take the reverse of this, we will get the result. Reversing it will look like this. And this is a correct topological ordering because just looking at one component, this left component over here, it's definitely valid for that post-order reasoning that I talked about. Now we also had two individual components, these two guys, and we ended up, you know, swapping the order of them. And, you know, each one of these was individually reversed as well. Like uh, this sequence shows up in reverse order in the output. This sequence shows up in reverse order here. That, and that's all we care about. Each sequence should be reversed. The relative order of each of these components, you know, whether this one shows up first or this one, that doesn't matter at all when it comes to topological ordering. So this actually is a correct way to do it. So essentially what we found out is we want to run DFS on each of these components, but we want to do it in a post-order way so that when we build the output, our output is in reverse order. So what we can do after we're completely finished with building the output, we're going to reverse it and then we will have a valid topological ordering. So that's all we really need to do. But there's one last catch that we actually have. We talked about the really simple case where we know exactly which nodes are, you know, the head or the beginning of a connected component. But usually most problems aren't so convenient where we have that information. So if you don't know the beginning of each of the connected components of the graph that you're given, it's okay. You can still solve the problem in almost exactly the same way. As long as we have a list of every single node in the input graph, we can solve this problem. The only thing is instead of us looping on each head of each component, we'll basically loop through every single node of every single component. Let me show you what I mean. Suppose, you know, arbitrarily B shows up first in our list. So we would run DFS on B. 
we'd run it in the same post order way. So first we would run DFS on its neighbor, D, then we'd run DFS on its neighbor, F, and then, you know, F does not have any neighbors. So we would add F to the output, then pop back to D, add D to the output, pop back to B, add B to the output, and then we're done. Let's say next, uh, C shows up in our list of, of nodes. Then we'd run DFS on C, and then we'd run DFS on its neighbor, and then we'd run DFS on its neighbor. We see though that we visited the same node twice, but that's okay because we keep track of the nodes that we visited in our visit hash set. So we don't end up adding F again. And as soon as we see it, we stop our DFS. We pop back up to E, we add E to the result. Then we add C to the result. And then we're done running DFS on this guy. And so far we've only run DFS on B and C. Let's say next we have to run DFS on D. Well, we would try to, but we'd see it's already been visited. So there's nothing for us to do. Maybe we run DFS on E now. Well, it's already been visited, nothing for us to do. Then maybe we run DFS on F, it's already been visited, nothing for us to do. So eventually we'd you know, try to run DFS on nodes we've already visited, it wouldn't work. So then eventually we would get to a node that we haven't visited, maybe it would be A. But maybe to show you the more complicated case, maybe we end up running DFS on H. So then we'd try to run DFS on it, it has no neighbors, so then we'd add H to the output. Then maybe G shows up. So we try to run DFS on G, we go to its neighbor, its neighbor's already been visited. So then we pop back to G, add G to the output. And then there's only one node left that we didn't try running DFS on. Run DFS on this guy, try going to one neighbor, it's been visited, go to the other neighbor, it's been visited. So then we add A to the output. Now this is also a valid topological ordering. Well, of course, after we reverse it, we'll reverse it and then we'll get the real correct answer. But notice how this GH thing, you know, is in the middle of the sequence that we created from this. That's perfectly fine because all we knew is that G has to show up before H but this component is independent of the other component. So it really doesn't matter at all. So it turns out that this post order DFS and then reversing the output works regardless of which order you run it, whether you start at the beginning of each component or start right in the middle of a component, it doesn't matter. So now let's finally take a look at the code. So we're assuming that we're given a directed acyclical graph and we wanna return the topological ordering. We'll talk a bit at the end what would happen if we weren't guaranteed that the graph was acyclical. But for now, let's assume that it is. Let's say we're given the number of nodes in our graph and let's say you know each node is labeled between one through n. And let's say we're given just the list of edges themselves. So one edge could be something like A to B, that would indicate that A shows up first and that B is the destination node. So it's a list of directed edges. And using that list of edges, let's just create our own adjacency list. This is a pretty common thing that you have to do in coding interviews. Usually you're not given an adjacency list. I think part of it is that it's your choice on how to best represent the graph that you're given. Usually adjacency list is the best way. This is just some boilerplate code that we've probably already seen before. But next is to actually run topological sort. So we have a reference. So we create an array. This is where our result is gonna go, or our topological ordering. We also have a visit hash set to make sure we don't visit the same node multiple times. And at this point, we do what I talked about, where we're just gonna go through that list of nodes. In this case, we're going from one to N, just incrementing every single time. Maybe though we could have been given a list of nodes as well, but usually this is the simple case. And for each node, so in this case, I is the label of our node. And what we're gonna do is run DFS on it, just like how I talked about. So after we run DFS on every single node, we're gonna have a topological ordering. It will be in our you know topological or, uh, sort array, and then we're gonna reverse it and then return it. So that's the main algorithm. Now, what exactly does our DFS look like? Well, it looks like this. Of course, we need to tell the DFS what node are we currently at? What's our current node or what's our source node at this point in time? We also have to pass in the adjacency list because for this node, we are going to want to go through all of its neighbors. So that's why we need that adjacency list. We also need the visit hash set because we want to know before we even run DFS on this node, has it already been visited before? If it has, we can return immediately 
immediately. In this case, I'm returning, you know, true, but it doesn't really matter. You wouldn't normally need to return true. You could just return anything. Notice how this function doesn't really need to return anything. And I'll get to that in just a moment. But if we know source is not visited, we want to make sure we add it to the visit hash set so that we never run DFS on it twice. Then we're simply gonna go through its neighbors. So if we were at A, we would just go through both of its neighbors. We can get its neighbors from the adjacency list. That's kind of the purpose behind using an adjacency list. And for each of these neighbors, so B and C, we would run DFS on each of them passing in the same three uh, variables that we were passed in here. We would pass in the adjacency list, the visit hash set, and the topological sort array. We're not creating a new array every time we pass it in. So as we update the array, it will update the single global reference that we have. Well, it's not global, but it's a reference to that single array. And only after we run DFS on the neighbors of A can we then take A and add it to the topological sort. Because remember, this is sort of post-order DFS. And after we have done that, for every single node in the graph, we know our topological sort is uh, created. And before we return it, we wanna make sure to remember to reverse it. But now let's go back to that cyclical point. What if we were not guaranteed that the graph was acyclical? What would we do? Well, we would have to kind of augment this and add some cycle detection to it. One way to do that, the way I like to do it, is actually have a second hash set, which doesn't keep track of the visited uh, nodes, not like all the visited nodes. It keeps track of our current path in our DFS. So I'd have a second hash set for path and I'd pass that in to our DFS function. And what I would do is right here where we add to the visit hash set, I would do the same thing. I would add to the path hash set. Here where we check if the source has been visited, before that I would check if the source has already been added to our path. If it's been added to the path, that's bad. That means that there's a cycle in the graph. And at that point I would return and I would return maybe false here instead of returning true. False means that there is a cycle that was detected. And then, you know, when that DFS is called, whether it's here or up here, I would handle that in some case. I would say that we were building the topological sort, but we detected a cycle. So we have to return some default value, maybe negative one, maybe an empty array would be more appropriate. Also, after we're done visiting that node, after we add that node maybe to the top sort, and before we return, I would pop the node from our path to basically say it's no longer a part of the path. Let me kind of show you what I mean in this drawing. We're gonna start at A normally. We're gonna add it as being visited. Then let's say we go down C first. We add it as being visited. We go to E, it's been visited. We go to F, it's been visited. And then in reverse order, we would add each of these to the uh, topological sort result. But remember, we have a second hash set for path. So as we add each of these to visit, we're also adding them to the path. So we keep going down, but then uh, you know we go down as far as we can, and then we wanna basically pop back up so we can add each of these values to our top sort uh, result list. Uh, but as we you know pop back up, we're going to unmark these as being a part of our path hash set. They would still be visited. That's what green means. These they've been visited before, but they're no longer a part of this particular path. So we'd pop them from the path. Now A is going to still be part of the path, and then we would go down the other branch that we haven't visited yet. We'd go down B. We'd mark B as a part of the path so far. We'd, then we'd go down D, we'd mark D as being part of the path, and then we would you know, follow its neighbor edge over here. We'd get back to A. The problem here is that we would see that A's already been visited, but we don't wanna return true because before that we'd have our if statement that checks that A is actually not only visited, it's also a part of the path. So here we would re realize that we have a cycle in the graph. Down the same path, we reached the same node. 
We would also, maybe would maybe instead of going on this edge first, we would have gone to this edge over here. But when we get to F, we would see that yes, it's been visited, but it's not a part of the path itself because we don't want to you know, say that this is a cycle because yes, it's gonna have been visited down this path, but it would have also been down uh, visited down this path. That doesn't mean that this is part of a cycle. That's why we have a second hash set to distinguish between the nodes that have been visited and the ones that have been visited along the same path. Because if they're on the same path, then that means it's a cycle. Okay, now before we wrap up, I just wanna mention one more thing to you that will make the practice problems a little bit easier. One application of topological sort is actually with course prerequisites. For example, in college or high school, there are sometimes courses, for example, a course would be physics three, P3 for physics three. This course has some prerequisites. You have to take maybe a physics two before you can take physics three. Before you take physics two, you have to take physics one, and maybe before physics three, you also have to take uh, calc two. Before calc two, you have to take calc one. Before these two, maybe you have to take algebra one or something like that. I'm just making this up. And maybe over here, independent of all these like STEM courses, you have English 2. Before you take English 2, you have to take English 1, something like that. This course prerequisite or course schedule problem is a really common and famous application of topological sort. For example, given a graph like this, you want to construct a topological ordering. In this case, the topological ordering of this would put these courses in an order such that you can take each course, right? Because for some courses, you have to take the prerequisites before you're allowed to take a, a course, right? For example, P3 in this ordering could not come first because it has some prerequisites that we'd have to complete. But also notice something about this graph. It's sort of in reverse order, right? Because what we know about topological sort, we know from an edge, we have to take the source edge first, and then we can take the destination edge. So we would build the output something like this, where physics three goes before physics two, but that's not correct. Here we're saying that physics two is a prerequisite of physics three. Physics two should go first. So this is a problem where the graph is actually set up in reverse order. So in this case, when we run our topological sort algorithm on this, we actually would not have to reverse it. Because remember what I talked about earlier, when you're given a graph, one way to get the topological ordering is to take each edge and reverse it. But in this case, our graph has already been built in that way. What I'm saying is, what we thought is that you have to take physics three before you have to take physics two, but this edge actually represents the opposite. This edge is saying that we have to take physics two before we take physics three, and this edge is saying we have to take physics one before we take physics two. So what I'm saying is it's important to recognize like how is the graph built? So if I was given this graph, I would run our post-order DFS and then build the output in that case, we wouldn't even have to reverse the output because this would build it cor because our post order would build this correctly. We'd get to P P3, then we'd get to this layer, then we'd get to this layer, and then we'd add algebra one first, and then maybe we'd add these. You get the idea. So this is one application. I think this is what you'll do in one of the course schedule problems. It's one of the suggested problems that I've linked below. So I just wanted to let you know about this in case it's confusing. Sometimes you'll be given a topological sort problem where you don't actually have to get the topological ordering. What you actually have to do is maybe uh, detect a cycle or something like that. So there can be many open-ended problems when it comes to you know topological sort. You might not necessarily be implementing the topological sort algorithm. So now let's learn some of the most common dynamic programming patterns. And let's start with the zero one knapsack pattern. And we're gonna start with an example that's pretty much the most cookie cutter knapsack example that we could come up with. But there are examples that can get even more complicated than this, but I think understanding the basics will make it a lot easier when you encounter like a more complex version of this problem out in the wild. The idea is that we're given some kind of bag or backpack or knapsack, something with a fixed capacity. Suppose this is our backpack 
And in this example, the capacity of it is eight. It could be, you know, eight pounds, eight kilograms, it, it'd be something. And we're also given some items over here. Each item will correspond to a single index. We have two arrays though, so for each item we have some profit value that we want to maximize. And we have a weight value, and this weight is going to affect how much we can carry in the bag essentially. The bag has a capacity of eight, Eight, but each item has some weight to it so we can't necessarily take every single item and put it in the bag. But this problem is that we want to maximize the total profit that can be contained in this bag. Another variation might be we want to reach, you know, the exact capacity. We want to determine can we reach this capacity or not given these items. But in this case, we just want to maximize the profit while staying within this capacity. The reason this is called the zero one knapsack though is that for every single item, we can either choose to include it, aka we can choose to include one occurrence of that item, or we can uh, choose to not include that item, meaning we include zero copies of that item. There's another variation of the knapsack problem that we'll be talking about later. It's called the unbounded knapsack, and that's because for every item you can include it an infinite number of times, basically as many times as long as we don't go over our capacity. That's the idea at least. But for now, let's focus on the zero one knapsack. Now your first instinct might be to just be greedy. Why not just take the items with the maximal profit and then keep doing that until we fill up our bag? Well, let's see what would happen with this example. We will choose the one with a profit of seven. So our profit so far is seven. Our bag though has a three in it. Next, we'll choose maybe this four. There's a tie between these two, so let's just arbitrarily pick this one. We add four to our profit, but the weight is five. So now we have two items in our bag, weight three and weight five. We filled up the capacity. We can't add anything more. So the total profit we got was 11. Is this the solution? Is that the maximal profit we could have possibly gotten? The answer is no, actually, because we can actually not include that item and include these two items, which will give us a profit of seven plus uh, four plus one, which is 12, that's bigger than 11. And actually these three will stay within our uh, capacity as well. We'll have a total of six, whereas our capacity is eight. So that's why greedy doesn't work. And you can probably think of some other examples where it will fail as well. In some cases it might work, but it's not guaranteed to work. So maybe we need to try a brute force approach. When it comes to dynamic programming, starting out with the brute force is not a bad idea. So let's try to think about this in terms of choices. We initially start out with a capacity of Eight. So for this item, we have two choices. We can include it or not include it. If we do include it, it has a weight of five. So our capacity then will be decremented by five. Our capacity remaining will simply be three. If we don't include it, our capacity will remain the same. So it'll stay eight. But when we include the item, we gain a profit of four. If we don't include the item, we gain a profit of zero. And for every single item remaining, we're gonna do the same thing. We're gonna have a decision to include it or not include it. So this is basically gonna be a binary decision tree, two branches for every node. Now the height of the tree is going to be N because for every single item, we're gonna have a level in the tree. So N is gonna be the size or basically the number of items we have. So the size of the tree is gonna be two to the power of N. So this is not a super efficient solution, but let's just run through it quickly because it will help us get to a more optimal solution. So at the second item, we can choose to include it or not include it. And we can you know do that for both of these branches because we wanna go through every single single possibility. So if we include this item, it has a weight of two, so we would have a weight of one remaining if we chose to include it. If we don't include it, we'll still have a weight uh, or a capacity of three. That's what I meant to say. We'll have a capacity left because we're adding these values to some bag and our bag has a capacity of eight. And we'll make the exact same decision on the right side of our tree as well. If we include it, we'll have a capacity of six left. If we don't include it, we'll still have a capacity of eight left. And if we include the item, we'll gain another profit of four. If we don't include it, 
will gain a profit of zero for that decision. Here, same thing, we'll gain a profit of four or gain a profit of zero. And now at the third item, it has a weight of three. Over here now, if we try to include that item, we will get a weight of negative two. So essentially what that means is we can't do anything. So we're not even gonna put a green value over here. We're not even gonna put a seven over here because that would be misleading. That would mean that this is a valid path, but there's no possible way we can include seven plus four plus four because that would be a profit of 15. We know that the real max profit is 12 in this problem. So recursively, that's how we would handle it. We can also choose to not include that item, which would leave us with a capacity of one still. Here, same decision, but this time we actually can include that value because we have a capacity of three left. We will end with a capacity of zero. There's nothing wrong with having a capacity of zero. It just means our bag is full now. It just means that we can't really continue at this point. But if we don't include it, we would still have a capacity of three. Here, same exact thing. If we include it, we'll decrement our capacity by three. Here, if we don't include it, we'll have a capacity of zero. Same thing here. And for each of these, same thing. We can either gain a profit of seven if we include the value or a profit of zero if we don't include the value. And at this point, you probably get the idea. So I'm gonna run through it quickly. So for this path, we have a capacity of one left. We're at the last item. We can include this item or we can not include it. If we do include it, which we have enough capacity which we have enough capacity for, we will gain a profit of one from that item. So plus one, plus four, plus four. So we're basically we're going through the whole chain now seeing given this possible path, what was the profit that we calculated? It was nine. So nine is our max so far, I guess. Then we'll go down this path here, we have a capacity of zero. So even if we try to include this value, we can't, we don't have enough capacity for a weight of one. So this is the max we can calculate along this path. If you go up the entire chain, you'll get a four plus zero plus seven, that's 11. So that's our max so far now. Going down this chain, we actually do have enough capacity for that item. So that would leave us with a capacity of one. Here, we also have enough capacity for it. For each of these, we will also do the path where we don't include it, but I'm not gonna draw that out because those won't lead us to the solution anyway. Oh, and by the way, this should have been a six over here. Sorry about that. And over here, I'll draw it out. We would have a capacity of four remaining. And for each of these branches, we only drew the ones where we do include the item. So for each of those, we'll gain a profit of one. That was the profit of that item. Now, essentially what this recursive uh, brute force algorithm would do is for each of these, we would just total what was the max we got. So for this one, it was one plus zero plus zero plus four, that's five. For this one though, this is our max actually. We got four plus seven plus one, that's 12. So that actually is the max solution. We would run through all of these branches just to verify that. You know, this one is eight, I think. And, you know, we would have uh, calculated the entire tree. I just wanted to save a bit of space over here. But you can see that when we skip the first item, but we include the other three items, so this one, this one, and this one, that leads us to a max profit. We had to run through every single possible scenario though. So this is what the code for that would look like. Maybe it's a bit shorter than you were expecting, or maybe it's a bit longer, but we're given the array of profits. We're given the array of weights. These are of course gonna be the exact same size because each index corresponds to a single item. We're also given a capacity that's gonna be the size of you know our bag. And basically most of the work is gonna go inside of a recursive helper function. The reason is because we're going through every single position. So we need an extra argument for the function to pass in the index that we're currently at. The rest of the uh, three parameters are gonna be passed into that recursive helper as well. And essentially for every single item, we're gonna have two choices, whether we include it, which is this case, and whether we skip the item, which is this case over here. And the base case, of course, is gonna be when we reach the end of the input over here. And we're handling that over here where you know the index becomes this position over here. So when we skip the item, that's really the simple case. We simply call our DFS helper, our recursive function, and all we do is pass i plus one. We don't have to do anything else. This is the profit, the max profit we can calculate with our helper function when we skip the item. When we include the item is a tiny bit more complicated, and that's because we first have to ensure that we have enough capacity to include the ith 
item. So we take the current capacity that we have that was passed into our function, subtract the weight of the item that we're trying to include, and we get a new capacity. If the new capacity is greater than or equal to zero, then we're allowed to include this item. So that's what we do. We take the profit of that item, add it, uh, with a recursive call and we're passing in i plus one here and also notice how we're passing in the new capacity because we subtracted this weight from the capacity so this is the remaining capacity that we have and we're recursively calculating the max profit with this capacity remaining on the remaining items to the right of this item for example the other parameters are going to stay the exact same. The profit and weight are simply arrays. These are never going to be changing anyway. And so this is the profit, the max profit we could uh, calculate with including this particular item. Now we have to find the maximum. If we couldn't include this item at all, our max profit is going to stay the same. But if we can include this item, then we have to calculate the max profit. We're going to take the maximum of the profit we just calculated and the maximum of the uh, previous profit that we calculated. So these two, and then we'll you know set the max profit to that, and then we would return from there. Now we can actually take this code, even though it's not very efficient, it's two to the power of n, but we can optimize it to actually be big O of n times m time complexity where m actually is the capacity that we're given. It's kind of unusual to have an integer value input to be a part of the big O time complexity, but that is the case here. We can get this to be the time complexity. Let me show you how we would do that. We actually don't have to modify this code very much at all. We know that obviously two to the power of n has the potential to be a really, really large number, especially if you know this input array is really, really large. n times m, you know, could be a large number, but it's not going to be super, super large. It's not growing exponentially. That's the important thing here. For small input sizes, two to the power of n might not be very large, but for super large inputs, it is going to be. When we get really, really large decision trees, it's common that we end up solving the same sub problem multiple times. Like see how big this tree is getting. Isn't it true that there's probably going to be some duplicate work because this level, for example, is going to be maybe the third position over here. It might be true that there's a, you know, we get to this position where our capacity value is something like uh, six and there might be other positions where the exact same thing is happening, right? So we're at index two, right? Let's say this is index two and our capacity is six. Our remaining capacity is six and we might end up solving that same sub problem multiple times and we might have a bunch of other duplicate sub problems in our decision tree. The way we can eliminate this repeated work is by caching that solution. So if we ever call this function where i equals two and capacity equals six, for example, and it's our first time calculating that, we want to store the result. So then if we ever call this function, function with the exact same inputs, because remember these two arrays are never changing. So if we call it with the exact same input, then we don't actually have to do all of this work because we know this could end up being a lot of work because it's not just a few lines of code here. We might end up doing more recursive calls. So if we can save ourselves from doing that, it would be really helpful. So that's how we get to caching. Let me show you what I mean. So this is what the caching solution would look like. It's actually not very different at all. Sometimes it's also called the memoization solution. So this time we can reduce our time complexity and it's because we have a cache. In this case, the cache is a two dimensional array. You could also use a hash map if you'd like. But basically the dimensions of this are going to be the dimensions of our input space. Well, in this case, our inputs I and capacity because we know if you know in this example at least the capacity is eight and the uh, size of our input arrays is four so all possible values that we could pass in to this a function, our helper, our recursive helper function are going to be four by eight. Those are all possible inputs we could pass in. So we're representing those inputs with a two dimensional array with, for example, the row represents 
uh, the item that we're looking at. So the row is the item, the column is going to represent the capacity. And actually in this case, the number of columns we have is not just gonna be eight because eight would be from zero all the way to seven, but we're actually gonna have plus one column here. So we're gonna go all the way from zero to eight. We're pretty much gonna be ignoring this zero column. And this, by the way, is just initializing a two-dimensional array in Python by the, you know, the dimensions I talked about. I'm taking n to be the length of basically the number of items we have and m to be the capacity that we have for shorthand. And we're initializing the array with all negative ones. Negative one is just a default value. That tells us that for this particular position, for example, if we had like a negative one over here and maybe this is where we had a capacity of two and this is for item two, you know, in this position, if it's a negative one, that essentially means that we haven't computed the max profit for, you know, passing in this, these two inputs into our recursive function yet. But if it has some uh, non-negative one value here, that means we have calculated it. So when we run our recursive function now, we have that original base case, but we also have a second base case where if the value in our cache for this input where i is the item and capacity is the remaining capacity, if it's not negative one, that means we've already computed this before. That means we don't have to do that recursive work. We can simply return the value stored in our cache. If we're not doing that though, then we have to calculate that value. Now at that point, this solution is exactly the same as the depth for search brute force solution. The only difference is instead of us just calculating the max profit and returning it, we're actually calculating that max profit and storing it inside of the cache. So uh, we, we store that and then we also return the max profit as well. But notice how the cache is actually another input variable to this function because we want a reference to that two dimensional array. We wanna always pass it in every function call. So we do that when we call this function recursively. Now, this is about as efficient as you can get for this problem. And I think if you're in and I think in a real interview, if your interviewer is fine with the memoization solution, I would recommend doing this because it's usually easier to code up, even though what I'm about to show you, which is the true dynamic programming solution is usually less code. It's usually more unintuitive. It's a pretty abstract solution to come up with but I'm gonna show it to you anyway. Sometimes the true dynamic programming solution can be optimized to reduce the space complexity. So in this case, our two dimensional array is of the dimensions n by m. Sometimes in dynamic programming, you can reduce those dimensions though. So for the true dynamic programming solution, we're gonna skip the recursion altogether. We're going to initialize a two dimensional array of the exact same dimensions typically. So we're gonna have four rows, one for every single item in our input, and we're gonna have nine columns in this case because we're skipping the zeroth column because we still want uh, capacities for one through eight. But in this case, the zeroth column is actually going to be relevant for us. I'm gonna show you why in just a minute. But generally what this algorithm is gonna do is similar to what the memoization solution was doing, the same as the recursive solution, except we're gonna be doing it in a particular order because intelligently we can figure out for this particular position, for example, before we calculate this position, and what this position represents, by the way, is with these three items so far, if we have access to these three items and we have a capacity of five, what's the max profit we could get? Going one step below that is with all of these items with a capacity of five, what's the max profit we could get? Starting at the top left is essentially with only the first item and a capacity of zero, what's the max profit we could get? Well, usually this is gonna be zero because we don't even have any capacity. And actually, if the capacity is zero, then this whole column is going to be zero because we can't include any items. Assuming all of the items have a positive weight, we can't include any items. So our profit is gonna be zero when we have a capacity of zero. Okay, but what about the zeroth item? The, in our case, this is the zeroth item. Can we include it when we have a capacity of one? Nope, because our weight, the weight of that item is five. So here, our capacity will again be zero. And same for this one and same for this one. And we keep doing that 
until we got to the point where we actually do have enough capacity to contain this item. So what would be the max profit in this position, which means if we only have access to this item, what's the max profit we could get with this capacity? Well, of course, we would include that single item. That's all we can do. And that's all we can do for all these positions as well. So we would have a total profit of four. Now, what I just did right now, I'm initializing that with two loops. The first column over here is being initialized to all zeros. And the first row over here is being initialized using that logic. First of all, the reason I'm doing this initialization is because it helps us eliminate edge cases when we do the full solution over here. This is a relatively small amount of code, but if we didn't do this setup, we would have a few extra conditionals over here. And this is a good template to follow for most dynamic programming problems, especially, you know, zero one knapsack and unbounded knapsack. The thing though is when we initialize our two dimensional array, we're not initializing it to negative ones. We're doing all zeros anyway. So we actually didn't need to do this first column. The reason I did it is sometimes I prefer to write out DP solutions using a hash map instead of a two dimensional array that can also help eliminate edge cases. So if you were doing it that way, then you would want to initialize the first column like this. Now we actually get to the full solution and you'll see why we did this initialization in the first place. We're going to essentially go row by row, starting at the first row. We're skipping the zeroth row because we know we already did that over here. And then we're gonna go column by column. We're gonna ask ourselves, if we have access to the first item, but not just the first item, we have access to technically all of these items, every item that came before that one as well. And for this position, we want to choose to include that item or skip that item. What's the max profit we could get if we have a capacity of one? Well, first of all, the item at index one is this item. It has a weight of two and a profit of four. So we have two choices, essentially. We can choose to skip that item. If we skip that item, what's the max profit we could get with skipping this item? And assuming we can't access the other items as well, we're basically saying we only have access to the previous item. Well, we can look directly up here we can see what was the max profit we calculated with a capacity of one that did not include this item and it only included this item. Well, that profit was zero. And that's this is the line of code that we would uh, do that with. If you go back and look at the recursive solution, you'll notice that we actually did this line with a recursive call. We're simply moving it from a recursive call to accessing our DP cache instead. We also have a choice of whether we can include this item or not. We're gonna initialize that value to zero because we don't know if we even have enough capacity to include the item. And in this case, it turns out we don't. We're gonna take the weight of the item, which is two. Our capacity right now is one. We're gonna take one minus two, and that's not greater than or equal to zero, so we can't include this item. So we're gonna skip it. And then we would take you know, the maximum of those two values. They were both zero, so we would you know, set that value to zero as well. And then when we get here though, it's gonna get a bit more interesting because now we actually do have enough capacity to store the second item. But we're gonna look at if we were to skip that item, we would get a maximum profit of zero. So if we skip the item, we get a profit of zero. If we include the item, we have enough capacity to do so, and we get the profit of that item so the profit of that item is four plus we take I plus one. So we still look in the row above. That's what I plus one here means. And we take our capacity, which was two, subtracting the capacity that we had right now, subtracting the weight of the item that we just added, which was two. From this position, we would say four, four was the profit of that item plus the value that's over here. So this is why we had to initialize the first column because we might end up accessing it diagonally. And this line as well is very similar to the recursive solution. I think we had something almost exactly like it except this DP was replaced by a recursive call. So the value here would be zero plus four. So that would end up being four. And that's the main idea behind this. We're gonna keep going value by value in this row, filling it out because to fill out these values, we simply need access to maybe the row above it and values to the left of it and you know values over here. We basically are only gonna look up 
left or top left. So that's why we compute these values in this order. But also notice how we're only going to be going to the I minus one row. So no matter where we are, maybe we're in this position. We're never going to go two rows above. We're only going to go one row above. Same thing over here. We'll only go one row above. So do we really need this entire two dimensional grid to be in memory? Could we have solved this problem with less memory? In this case, the memory complexity complexity was n times m, but it can actually be solved with even less memory. I encourage you to try to take this solution and optimize it to practice it because just reading code sometimes is not enough to really get it inside your brain. So I recommend trying to optimize this code. If you can't figure it out or if you did figure it out, consider posting it on the discord. But this is the main idea behind this problem. I also encourage you to try to fill out this grid using this algorithm. It'll help you kind of understand what exactly is going on. I'll quickly fill it out right now just so you kind of have the information. These, I believe, will be all fours because we can't because we can only include a single item until we get to a capacity of seven. When we have a capacity of seven, we can include both of the first two items. So that will give us a profit of eight. Over here, though, with a capacity of one, we will have nothing with a capacity of two. We can't include the third item, but we can still include the second item. We'll just look up and see, hey, there's a four here. So add that over here, though, we can include the third item. It has a profit of seven or we can choose to include the second item. It has a profit of four. We're, of course, going to choose the one with a higher profit here. I believe it will be seven here. I believe we can include these two items giving us a profit of 11 here. It's also going to be 11. And I think we can't really get any higher than 11 until we get the last item. So here we can include a single item with our capacity of one. So we'll get that here. I think it'll be four again. I think here will be seven here. I think will be eight because we can include both of these items with a weight of four, giving us a profit of set, uh, eight. This I believe will be 11, but when we have a capacity of six, we can actually include all three of these items. That's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to have a profit of 12 and basically what the last position in the grid will represent is using all of these items and a capacity of eight. So we have the max allowed capacity and we have access to all the items. What's the max profit you can get? So the solution is always going to be in the bottom right position. So this is going to be uh, the return value here. You could also, if you forgot that this is where the solution is, you could, you know, can, you could have a single variable that is the result variable and you could, you know, take the maximum of this every single time and assign it to that variable and then return it. But you can also do it like this. So this was a lot to get through. And even if you take a look at this picture and you feel like you know exactly what's going on, when you actually try to code this up on your own, it's really difficult, especially if you haven't practiced it in a while. It can get really, really abstract. There's definitely a lot of edge cases. It's hard to kind of visualize what's going on. Like what's the items? What's the capacity? What direction are we looking in and all that? But as always, practice makes perfect. And dynamic programming is definitely the type of thing that needs a lot of practice. So next, let's look at a very similar pattern to the 01 knapsack. This one's called the unbounded knapsack. This one is so similar that we'll be spending some of this video reviewing the basics that we talked about earlier. Even the problem is actually almost exactly the same. But in my experience, the unbounded knapsack is more common when it comes to interviews. So it's very important to learn. Also, these types of dynamic programming patterns are so complicated that I think as much practice as you can get is really helpful. Also, we'll be going deeper into how to actually think about this type of problem and how to approach it and a bit on why this algorithm works in the first place, which I don't think we got a chance to discuss with 01 Knapsack, even though that lesson was quite long already. So once again, we're given a list of items and a backpack with some limited capacity. These are our items, of course. This item has a profit of four, a weight of five. Again, we're trying to maximize the total profit that can be contained in our backpack that has a fixed capacity. But in this case, we actually have an unlimited quantity of each item. So originally, when we got to the first item, we had a choice. We either include that item or we don't include that item. Originally, our capacity is eight. If we include that item, our capacity becomes five. If we don't include that item, we skip it. Our capacity stays eight. 
So far, this is exactly the same as the 01 knapsack, but here's where it's gonna change. This side is going to stay the same. When we skip the first item, we're gonna assume that we're never gonna use it again. We're only gonna use the next three items. We're gonna go to the second item. We have a choice of whether we include it or not. Actually, I think uh, our capacity over here was actually gonna be three if we choose the first item. But over here, when we choose the second item, our capacity decreases by two because that's the weight of the item. So when we choose that item, we have a weight of six left. We have a capacity of six left. If we don't include it, we'll have a capacity of eight left. Over here though, what do you think is the decision? We chose the first item. So now what's our choice here? Are we choosing to include the second item or not? Well, if we did, then this would be exactly like the zero one knapsack. Is that okay? Not quite. Well, there's actually multiple ways to make this decision tree that's valid. I'll show you the other way, but I prefer this more simple way to do it. But there is a different way and you can kind of choose the one that you prefer. But over here, we chose the first item. Now we have a choice. Do we want to choose that item again? Or now are we going to finally choose to skip that item and possibly move on to the next item? So here we have that choice. We're going to choose the first item again. What's going to happen when we do that? Well, it has a weight of five. So then our capacity will be negative two. We know, of course, that this is not valid. We should not be able to choose the first item multiple times because we get a negative capacity. So we basically don't go down this path anymore. Here, though, we basically choose, okay, finally, we're not going to be including this item anymore. We're not necessarily uh, choosing this item yet. We're just moving to the next position here. So our capacity would stay the exact same. It would stay three. And I'm gonna go one level deeper just to show you the idea behind this, but I encourage you to draw out the entire decision tree. It helps kind of reinforce the ideas that we're learning here. So at here, we're now at the second position. And actually you could even draw this decision tree keeping track of you know what position we're at because we know when we call this recursive function, those are the two variables that are gonna be changing. What's our remaining capacity? And also what index are we at? Initially, we start at index equals zero. Here, we stayed at index equals zero. We're still at the first item. Here, we went to uh, index equals one and continued going like that. But when we're here, we can either choose this item or not choose that item. And also the total profit that we would have gotten from each of these would have been four here, zero here, four here, but we were not allowed to do that zero here. Here we chose the second item, which had a profit of four as well. So we got a four here. Here we skipped it. We got zero. So here we're going to choose the second item. It will leave us with a capacity of one because that item has a weight of two. Here we would choose to not include that item. Our capacity would stay three. Here we chose the second item, right? That's why we have a capacity of six remaining. We chose this item. Now we have a choice to include it again because remember each of these items, we have an unlimited quantity of them. So we can just keep choosing this item if we want to, if that's what's gonna maximize our total profit. So here we'll have a capacity of four remaining. This is not a bad item because its weight is pretty small and the profit is pretty large. But we could also skip that item and you know choose, okay, we've had enough of this guy. We're now gonna start selecting some of these. Skipping it would not actually change our capacity though. It would uh, leave us with six capacity here. We chose to skip the first and second item. So we are at the third item. We can choose to include that item or skip that item. It would leave us with a capacity of five if we chose it, a capacity of eight if we skip it. So the profit we would have gotten here from the second item would have been four. Here we would have gotten zero. Here we would have gotten four again from that second item, here zero. Here we would have gotten a profit of seven because the weight was three. And here we would gotten a profit of zero. So you're probably thinking that this is really, really similar to the zero one knapsack. And that's because it is actually, when we take a look at the code, the code will only be like one or two lines different. The time complexity of the optimized DP solutions are also going to be the same actually, but for this brute force solution that we're doing, this decision tree, actually the time complexity is not going to be the same as the original, even though it kind of looks like we're having two branches every single time. And what's the height of the tree going to be? Maybe it's going to be N that would make it two to the power of N. That's the same that we talked about last time, but it's actually not the height of this tree is going to be potentially larger than n. 
Because with the 0-1 knapsack, for each item, we could have only uh, chose that item a single time or we could have skipped it. So for each level in our tree, we would have had at most one item. So the tree height would have been roughly N. But in this case, we can actually choose each item an unlimited number of times. To illustrate that, let's take a look at the last item we have. If we, have, if we start with a capacity of 8, we choose the first item, we'll have a capacity of 7 remaining. And we can keep choosing that first item an unlimited number of time. The other branch would be maybe we skip that item and then we choose a different item. But going down that item with just a weight of one, we would basically be able to keep choosing it until our capacity reached zero. So basically, in this case, the height would be the total capacity that we started with. Of course, this would only occur if we had an item with a weight of one, but maybe we had an item with a weight of two. In that case, the height of this tree would have been capacity divided by two. We know we don't care about constants when we're talking about big O time complexity. So in this case, the overall size of the tree would be two to the power of C in the worst case. So that's what the time complexity would be. That's the size of our decision tree here. Now, before I jump into the code, I want to talk a bit about what are we doing here? Like conceptually, what is this? It's really abstract. We got numbers, we got choices, we got decision trees. There's a lot going on and this is complicated. How can you reason about this on your own? Like how, what's an easy way to think about this? Well, with dynamic programming, it's all about breaking a big problem into sub problems. The original problem we were given, we have a capacity of four and we have these four items we can choose from and we have an unlimited quantity of each of them. That was the original problem. That's the root node essentially. And with this decision tree, we're trying to calculate all possibilities. And among those possibilities, we're trying to calculate the one that maximizes the profit, of course. When we go left here, we're trying all possibilities where we include at least one occurrence of the first item. That's what this left branch is. And then as we go further, we make another choice. When we go left here, we're saying we're getting all possibilities where we choose two uh, occurrences of the first item. When we go right here, we said we we chose one of these originally, but now we're done. We're basically, this right side here is going to be all possibilities where we only included a single occurrence of this first item and then we stopped. We didn't choose any more and then we started choosing some uh, of the other items essentially. So that's why this left subtree can give us all possibilities where we chose at least one of these because this goes down the path where we choose more than one and this one goes down the path where we chose exactly one. When we go right from our root, of course, we're choosing to not include any of these at all. We took this original problem and created a sub problem where we said we're not going to include any of these. We were given four items, but now we only have three and we're fine with that. It's possible that the solution lies on this side of the tree and that's what we're going to determine whether it does or not. And as we go down this tree, we're going to further break this problem into more sub problems. The left side over here is when we chose at least one of these guys. And the right side of this tree was when we chose none of these guys. So what we're saying is it's possible that the solution contains at least one of these. And it's possible that the solution actually contains none of these. And maybe the solution only contains these two items. So we keep breaking it up into sub problems until we've created all possible sub problems. And then we return the result. By the way, in this case, the solution will be uh, going down the right path. We skip this guy. We choose one of these. So then we go left essentially, and we only chose one of them. So then we go right down our tree and start choosing a few of these. We choose exactly two of them for the last item. We'll actually have zero capacity left because our capacity will be two plus two. We chose two of these items, so plus three, plus three. Our remaining capacity at that point will be zero because we already filled up our bag. And if we try to choose any more of these, we won't be able to. We will end up with a total profit, I believe, of 18 because we chose one of these and two of these. So it totals up to a profit of 18. So this is how I like to think about it. I think this is the simplest way to think about this decision tree in this, uh, the context of this problem. And it usually works for most unbounded knapsack problems. But I'll show you a slightly different template 
which also might work. We'll quickly go through that decision tree because it also does work, but I think the code can get a little bit more confusing because instead of having two branches, we actually have a loop of branches. We will once again start with a total capacity of eight, yeah, right? This is our original problem, but instead of breaking it up into sub problems, we're just gonna go through every possibility out of every item that we can choose. So we're gonna have a branch for every item. If we choose the first item, we'll have a weight of three remaining. If we choose the second item, We'll have a capacity of six. Sorry about that. I keep getting the capacity and weights confused. We can also choose the third item. We'll have a capacity of five left. If we choose the last item, we'll have a capacity of seven. So we're not actually skipping any of these which maybe this is more intuitive for you. And then for each of these branches, actually, we're gonna do the exact same thing. This is also one way to go through every single possibility. So here we would have four branches for every single item. So if we chose the first item, once again, we would get a negative capacity of a negative two, essentially. And we know this is invalid, so we would stop going down the tree at this point. We could choose the second item, which would leave us with a capacity of one. We could choose the third item, which would leave us with a capacity of zero and we could choose the fourth item, which would leave us with a capacity of two. And for each of these, we would do the exact same thing, keeping track of the total profit. So if we chose the first item, we would have given a profit of four. Here, we would have gotten a profit of four, but we couldn't do that. Here, we would have gotten a profit of two from the second item, here three from the third item, and here uh, one from the last item. This might seem more straightforward to you conceptually, but coding this one up is actually a bit more complicated because we need a loop instead of just two cases. But it's up to you which one you prefer. I encourage you to try writing out this solution if you'd like. But now I'm gonna be showing you the code of the first one that I talked about where we only have two branches every time. It's almost exactly the same as the zero one knapsack we showed last time. So here's the code. Now the time complexity is one of the things that changed. Instead of two to the power of n, it's two to the power of c, where c is the capacity. Other than that, it's almost exactly the same. Even if I had the other code over here, I bet you would be hard pressed to find the difference in this code because we are passed in the exact same variables. We have our DFS helper, just like last time, where we add a variable to keep track of which index we're currently at. The base case is where we you know, get out of bounds of the array, in which case we would return zero. We have still two choices. We can choose to skip the first item. If we skip it, we're gonna simply call DFS on I plus one, keeping the rest of these the same because that's our sub problem in this case. We're saying maybe this contains the solution. We can also choose to include the first item. That's our second path over here. And this is where we change things only slightly though. We calculate the new capacity if we you know, took the weight of this item. We wanna make sure that we have enough capacity to even store this item in the first place. If we do, meaning our capacity is greater than or equal to zero, our remaining capacity is greater than or equal to zero, then we're going to include this item. We're gonna take the profit of this item add it with a recursive call to basically the exact same thing. This is the difference. Originally for zero one knapsack, we passed in I plus one over here because we knew that if we included the first item, we can't include it again. So we should pass in I plus one as the parameter. But this is where things are different with unbounded knapsack. We can keep including this item if we want to, as long as we have enough capacity. So we're passing in I here, but you do have to make sure to pass in the new capacity. That's the same as last time though. You pass in the new capacity. So this function call is not the exact same that we just made. Our capacity is the one value that changed here. So that's the sub problem. We started with a capacity of eight, and we had all four of these items. Now we have a capacity of three, but we still have access to all four of these items. That's the idea. That's the one line that we changed here. Now, sometimes the difference between a zero one knapsack and unbounded knapsack is more than just one line of code. So now when we take this and optimize it with memoization, just like we did before, where we cache each possibility that goes into this function. Remember, these two are always gonna stay the same. These are essentially our arrays, but which element we're currently at and what's our remaining capacity is going to change. But we can actually apply caching to this just exactly like we did with zero one knapsack. Let me show you the code for that. 
Even though the brute force solution had a worse time complexity, the uh, memoization solution is actually gonna have the exact same time complexity as the zero one uh, variation that we talked about because the variables that we're passing in are the exact same. The ones that are changing, uh, not that, the capacity and I are the exact same. So the all possibilities that we could pass in for I are from basically zero to three. So there's four possibilities in this example. All possibilities we could pass for capacity is zero through eight. So roughly the capacity that we were given. So when we multiply those two together, we'll get like a two dimensional grid, you know, eight by four, or I guess, you know, nine by four, if you add that zero here to eight. So this is our problem space. This is why when we apply caching to this, the natural next step for us is to go to the true solution, the true dynamic programming solution, because we know our solution space is a two dimensional grid. That's where all of our sub problems are gonna lie. And the bottom right position of the grid is usually where the solution is going to be for the entire problem itself. But taking a look at this code, it's essentially exactly the same where we do initialize that two dimensional grid. We have our recursive helper. We pass in zero as the beginning index. We pass in the input arrays over here. We pass in the initial capacity, which is eight for this problem. Also, we pass in the cache itself, the two dimensional grid. And once again, the only difference is gonna be over here where when we choose to include that item, instead of passing I plus one, we just pass in I because we know that we might be able to include this item multiple times. So now let's move on to the true dynamic programming solution. And this time I'm actually gonna talk about a few of the things that we didn't get to talk about last time. Now, if all you care about is the code, this code is once again, almost exactly the same as the original code. The difference being that over here, where we chose to once again, include the item here, we can choose to include multiple copies of it. So here, when we take the profit of that item and then uh, add to it the calculation of the sub problem, the sub problem is not being passed I plus one. I plus one would mean now we have access to, you know, some of the other items but we're actually passing I because we might be able to include this item multiple times. Other than that, the solution is exactly the same, but I'm gonna be talking about why this whole two dimensional approach works in the first place, because we didn't really get to talk about that last time. First of all, you might've noticed that I have items which keep track of the rows and capacity is uh, the columns. Could we have done it the opposite way? Could we have rotated this grid 90 degrees and had capacity be the row and the items be the column? Well, we definitely could have, and it definitely would have worked for this solution where we actually have a two dimensional grid and that's the time complexity and the memory complexity of what we're doing. But we also talked last time about how you can take this solution and optimize it with the memory at least. And the way we do that actually is instead of having the entire grid, we only keep track of at most two rows of the grid. We just keep track of the previous row that we calculated and the current row that we're currently calculating because that's all we really need. Because we saw that last time, in some cases, if we choose to skip this item, we'll have to go and calculate the max profit where we skip that item, but the capacity stays the exact same. That calculation is happening right over here, where in our two dimensional grid, we go to the I minus one row. So essentially from this position, we end up going up one position. But also last time we saw that we actually end up going top left as well. We end up at most going to the I minus row. That's when this line was changed. It was I minus one, but we also ended up uh, taking the current capacity that we're at and decrementing it, not just by one, but by some variable number, which is the weight of the item that we're adding. So in that case, we saw previously we would go top left. Though in this case, we don't have to go top left because our I in that case is gonna stay the same. So in that that case, we would just go to the left, but it still could be a variable amount. It's not just going to the left by one. That would be pretty simple. It's going to the left multiple spaces. That's why I made this grid in this orientation, because with this, we only have to keep two rows in memory at a time. So I'm going to show you how we can take this solution and optimize it. This is also the reason why we take our grid and fill it from top left 
to uh, and then go to the right and only after we've done this entire row then we start computing the next row because it might happen in some of these positions we have to look up how can we look up if we haven't even computed what goes above in the first place and also why we go left to right how, we might have to look left how can we look left if we haven't computed those yet we can't really go in this order so that's why we're doing it this way also i i want to mention actually it is possible if you modify this solution to instead of filling it from top left filling it from bottom right and going left and doing it like that like that's one variation sometimes i do because this actually matches up more similarly to the memoization solution that we talked about but in terms of code i think most people prefer it this way which is why i'm doing it this way it makes more sense the reason why we can doing uh, can do it in the opposite order like from bottom right and then go up and go to the left is because at the end of the day this is a two-dimensional grid it's symmetrical so if you modified the code you would be able to do it in the opposite way when we do it from top left to bottom right, what we're doing here is saying uh, in this position, for example, if we only have access to this item, what's the max profit we could get when we have a capacity of one? Okay, what's the max profit we could get with a capacity of two, with three, with four? Well, with any of those capacities, we can't get a profit at all. We have zero because the weight of the item is five. But once we finally have a capacity of five, we can include that item and we get a profit of four. And we can keep including that item, but we can only include it one time no matter how high our capacity gets because our max capacity is eight if our capacity got to 10 for example we would be able to include two occurrences of that item we'd have a profit of eight but in this case it doesn't do that and then when we get to the next position over here we have access to two items we have access to the first item and the second item what's the max profit we could get when we have that with just a capacity of one and then we ask what's the max we could get with a capacity of two with three with four etc etc i definitely encourage you to fill out this grid on your own for practice but now i'm going to be moving on to the memory optimized dynamic programming solution so with the most optimized solution, the time complexity is the same, but we save on memory. We only have to keep at most two rows in memory at a time. And ironically, as we keep getting more optimized solutions, it seems like we get less and less code. That doesn't mean that this solution is more simple to come up with though. This time, we actually have a single row. We don't even have this two-dimensional grid. We just have a single row that's the size of the capacity plus one. So we have like one of these rows, uh, not even this row here, but pretend like we had one row over here and we fill it with all zeros. We use zero as a default value essentially because the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna start going row by row for every single item that we have. So now our job is gonna be to build the second row. We're going to create that. We're going to call it current row. It's going to be the same size. It's also going to be all zeros initially. We would go position by position and we would say if we skip this position, if we skip this item, we're going to go to the previous row, which we called DP, and we would go to the same capacity that we had. And that would be our skip value. That's why we default this array to be all zeros because the first value we want this to be is zero if we skip the first item. Because if we skip the first item, then we have no items available and we would want the capacity to be, we would want the profit to be zero in that case. And so we keep doing that and we also uh, do it for these positions where we finally had enough capacity. In that case, we would have gotten a value of four by including this item. Maybe we would have had a capacity of 10 here. In that case, we would have gotten to include two of these. Then the profit would have been eight because from here, we would have looked to the left and saw that even with a capacity of five, we would be able to get an item. So we can say four plus the capacity we have 10 would give us, we would be able to include this item twice. Now, after we've calculated that row, we're going to assign that to DP now. And then we're gonna to go to the next iteration of the loop and create a new row down here. And it's gonna be filled with all zeros. Notice how that first row is no longer in memory. We only have two rows in memory now. And we initialize these to all zeros and then we start computing them. In this position, we have a capacity of one. That's not enough to contain this item or this item. Here we have a capacity of two, that's enough to contain this item. So we have a profit of four here, still only that one item. Here, we 
can include this item. So we include the profit of that, but we also take in the current row, the capacity that we have, which is four minus the weight of including this item, which is two. So basically that's us saying from this position, we're gonna look two positions to the left and take that value and add it with the profit here. We would have also tried doing that from here as well, actually. We would have taken the profit, which is two, added with the profit of the value two spaces to the left. But that value was zero. That tells us that with a capacity of three, we can only include this item once. But when we're over here and we're looking two spots to the left, we can include this item twice with a capacity of four. So here we get a profit of eight. And now can just continuing to fill it out and I encourage you to do this on your own. Here, we would actually be able to do the same thing. We'd get a profit of four from including this item and we'd look two spots to the left and see that we can get a max profit of eight. This is the sub problem that we already computed. Recursively, we would from here, you know, recalculate this entire sub problem and then do all the work that it takes to uh, compute that. But here with dynamic programming, we saved that result. So we don't have to solve that sub problem again. So here we would get a value of 12. I think here we'd also have uh, 12 here. We would have gotten 16 actually, because we can get four of these guys. And then we would take this current row, assign it to DP, and then our current row would be the next row. And we would actually delete this from memory. This is no longer in memory because we only need at most two of these at a time because we know as we compute the values here, we're only gonna have to look one row above. We don't have to look multiple rows above and we'll you know, maybe have to look to the left, but that's okay. So this is the idea behind the most optimal solution. I'll quickly run through the rest of this. With the third item, we can't include anything. With this, we can't include the third item, but we can include the second item. So we'd have a profit of four here. We can include the third item. We'd get a profit of seven. Here we can include the third item, but we can get a higher profit by including two of the previous item. Here we can get a profit of 11 by including this item and including one of these items. Here we can get a profit of 12 by including three of these items. Here we can get a profit of 15, one of these, two of these, and here a profit of 16 by getting four of these. Here we can get a profit of one because the last item actually only takes a capacity of one. It takes a weight of one. Here it would have been four, I believe. Here we would be at seven. Here we would be at eight. There's actually two ways to get this eight. We can get two of these or we can get one of these and one of these. Here, I believe it's also 11. Here, I believe it's also 12. Actually, I just realized we had it wrong over here. We can actually get 14 over here because we can include two of these with a capacity of six. So this, I believe, would also be 14. And actually, this position would uh, be 18, I believe, because if we get two of these, that's 14, and we still have enough weight for this. So that would be 18. Sorry about that confusion. So this is 18, I believe. With this, from here, we can choose to skip the last item, which is basically take the value above, or we can take the profit of this item, which is one, plus uh, the value to the left. Here, we only go to the left by one because the weight of this item was one. So what's higher, 15 or 14 plus one? Well, they both equal 15. So 15 is gonna go here. Here, we can either choose to get the value above, which is 18. We can take the max of that and take the max of this item if we choose to include this item, which is one plus the profit of the current row. Uh, the capacity we had was eight minus the weight of this item, right? The ith item, which is gonna be seven. So we basically look to the left, that's 15. So one plus 15 is 16. Which one of these two is higher? It's 18. So 18 is going to be our result. It's basically us taking two of these items and one of these. So this was a lot to get through, but I hope this is starting to make more and more sense to you. It definitely takes a lot of practice. I encourage practicing these problems on your own. Try writing out the table, try drawing out the decision tree, it helps a lot. Next, let's look at a really famous algorithm called longest common subsequence. There's a lot of dynamic programming problems that fit this exact same pattern. Like you would be surprised how similar they are and how many different variations there are of this problem. And the prompt is pretty basic. We're given two strings, S1 and S2, and we want to find the longest common subsequence between these two strings. First of all, what even is a subsequence? 
Well, it's basically a subset of the characters of a particular string. So a subsequence of this string could be the string itself, or we could remove some character. So this would be a subsequence. It doesn't have to be contiguous. So the difference between a subsequence and like a subarray is that it's not necessarily contiguous. For example, these two characters together are also a subsequence of S2. But the thing about a subsequence is that the relative order does have to be maintained. So for example, here, A, C is a subsequence of S2, but we can't say that C, A is a subsequence. It's a subset of these characters, but it's not a subsequence because the order does matter when we're talking about subsequences. That's the difference between a subset and a subsequence. So in this case, the longest common subsequence between these characters is a subsequence from both strings that is equal. So in this case, the longest subsequence would be AC because both of these strings have that subsequence. It's unfortunate that we can't take ACB to be the subsequence because the order is not matching. The C and B are in, you know, a reverse order. So the longest we can get is AC, even though we have like a potential hole over here, that's perfectly fine. And actually it would be fine if we had like a D over here and we had a C over here we would have a matching A and then we would see, well, there's no matching D and B and over here, this D won't match either, but the C from over here will match this C. They don't necessarily have to be in the same position either for you know a common subsequence. That's the idea here. Now, there are some dynamic programming problems like this one where if you can even figure out the brute force DFS solution, the recursive solution, you can actually come up with the optimized solution relatively easy. But even coming up with a brute force can be kind of tricky. But once you know it, you can apply this pattern that we're going to talk about to any of the problems that fit under this umbrella. There's quite a few. So if you're just looking at this problem, trying to think of what the solution might be, your brain might be going blank and that's perfectly okay. That's how I approached this problem the first time I saw it. But we know at the very least, we're going to have to compare characters between the two strings. I don't think there's any possible solution that we could avoid doing that. So let's start by initializing a pointer at the beginning of each of these strings. I'm going to have one pointer I1 and another pointer I2. Basically by pointer, I mean index. So starting at the beginning of the two strings, one possibility would be that the strings themselves are equal to each other, right? Because that technically counts as a subsequence, having equal strings. So why not start by comparing character by character? So between the first two characters, these characters are equal. So we know at the very least, we're gonna have a subsequence, a common subsequence of length one at the very least. So if we know that, what becomes our sub problem? So if we know that, then we can take our pointers and then shift them by one. So I1 can be over here and I2 can be over here. We know if these characters are common, then there's no need to do anything else with them. Then we only have to compare the remainder of the two strings. So do you kind of see what the sub problem is now? We originally were given two strings, S1 and S2. If we see that the first characters are equal to each other, then we know that now the solution becomes one plus the LCS, the longest common subsequence of the remainder of the two strings. So S1 uh, starting from index one and S2 starting from index one as well. So to represent that with a decision tree, this is what we would do. We would have initialized our I1 and I2 to zero. And if the characters are equal, we actually just have one decision. We don't need to consider any other possibilities because the characters were already equal. We know the long, the LCS of two equal characters is just going to be the characters themselves. So I guess you could say that the next decision that we made or, or the next sub problem that we were trying to solve is where I1 is equal to one and I2 is also equal to one. This is where things are gonna get interesting though. Now we reach the more complicated case where the two characters are not equal to each other. So what should we do now? We know we have to try to find at least some common characters. Just from looking at the drawing, we can see that there are some common characters, but we're gonna have to probably increment our pointers to do that. We see that C's are common, but we also see that B's are common as well. So we don't necessarily know which one is gonna result in the longest common subsequence. But we know at the very least that 
both of these two characters cannot be included in the longest common subsequence. How do we know that? Well, it's sort of a proof by contradiction. We see that obviously these two are not equal. So if we want to find a common character between these two strings, we have to shift one of these pointers. We can leave, maybe we can find a B character, in which case we would take I1 and shift it and try to eventually find a B character so that this character could match with a different character. Or we could do the opposite thing where we keep our I1 pointer over here, but we try to take our I2 pointer and then increment it and try to find something maybe that matches with the D, but we won't be able to match these two together because remember the order of the subsequence matters. We have to take one of these pointers and increment them at the very least. Maybe we'll have to increment both of them. We don't know for sure, but we know at least we have to increment one of them to find a matching character. And because we don't know which one to increment that's gonna result in the longest common subsequence, we try both possibilities. So we try the sub problem where we increment I1, which would mean I1 is gonna be set to two and I2 is gonna be set to one. We try the other sub problem where I1 is set to one, it stays as one and I2 is set to two. This subproblem would be incrementing I1. So we're trying to now find the LCS between these two substrings. We skipped this character over here, but we're trying to find the LCS of the remaining portion of these two. The right branch over here would be we left I1 where it is, and now we incremented I2. So we skipped this character and we're trying to find the LCS of these two strings. And actually in this case, the LCS of both of these subproblems is gonna be equal. So both of these will actually result in the longest common subsequence. But let's run through the logic quickly. For the first choice, we had uh, these two substrings remaining. So here we would check that B and C are not equal to each other. So once again, we're gonna have two branches where we increment I1 and set it to be three now and I2 will stay the same. Or we have the other branch where I1 stays the same and I2 is gonna be incremented to be equal to two. So this left branch would be where I1 is now at three. So it would be this substring, we skipped both of these characters and we would still have this as our S2 substring. And at this point, we would see that Bs are equal to each other. So then we would increment the pointer here. We would increment both pointers actually. So I1 would be equal to four. I2 would be equal to two. So what that means is that we are basically over here now, right? Our I1 pointer is out of bounds, but our I2 pointer is pointing at this character. If one of these are out of bounds, this is the new sub problem essentially. What's the LCS between the string C and an empty string? Well, the empty string doesn't have any character, so probably the LCS is gonna be zero. So that's our base case in this recursive algorithm. If one of the two substrings is empty, AKA we have reached the end of one of them, then the LCS is going to be zero. Maybe we'll reach the end of both of them. That would only occur though if both of the substrings were equal. Because if we were comparing maybe A, B, and AB, we're trying to find the LCS of these two strings, we would see that both of the strings are equal. Both of our pointers would reach the end of both of the strings at the same time. This is just kind of the thought process behind this solution. But going down this path, what we actually found was these two matching pairs. We found this matching character and this matching character. And if you recall, the first pair over here was where we got that one from. And when we did that, we were basically saying, remember, if we find one matching character, then our result is going to be one plus the result of this subproblem. And then uh, when we got to this subproblem, we didn't know, we didn't find any matching characters immediately, but from here we went down to here, and then here we did find matching characters. We said that the result is going to be one plus the result of this, and this was our base case, so this returned zero. So when we pop all the way back up to our root, we counted one, two as our result. So that's the longest common subsequence. Well, the length of it at least, and that's what we cared about in this problem. We care about the length. We don't actually care about building the subsequence itself. Now let's quickly try to explore more of the tree before we move on to the code. This time, let's go down this path over here. 
Oh, I just realized we talked about how these two characters were matching, but when we went down this path, it was actually the bees that were matching over here, and then we ended up going out of bounds on this side. Sorry about the confusion. It's this path over here that's going to have the matching C's as I'm about to show you. Because both of our pointers are at the second index. So that would mean we're comparing this character with this character. If they are both equal, then we shift both of the pointers by one. And we basically say our result is going to be one plus the LCS between the remainder of the two strings. We have a B in the first string, but the second string is empty. So that would essentially be our base case. So that's what this path would end up, you know, resulting in. And so, and that ends up giving us the same length. So we get an LCS of two from this and this. Whereas on the left side, we actually got the same length for the LCS, but there were actually multiple results. So you can see that finding the LCS does not necessarily have a unique solution. It might have multiple solutions. And now let me show you something interesting on the right side over here. If our I1 is at index 1, that means it's at the D. If our I2 is at index 2, that means it's over here. These two are not equal to each other. So we can try incrementing I2. That would be the right path. So I1 stays as 1. I2 would be 3. But if I2 is 3, that means it's out of bounds. So this is basically a base case. We're going to return 0 from here. But going down the other path is going to be a bit more interesting because in that case, we'll take I1 and increment it to be over here. So I1 would be over here. I2 would still be at index 2 over here. So again, we see that we get matching Cs. That's what we also found going down the other path. So we would get to I1 equals 2 and I2 also equals 2 and we would be solving this sub problem. But you notice how we're solving the same sub problem in multiple places in this decision tree. This is kind of a hint at the repeated work that we have to cut down on because you can see that in some cases we won't have two branches in this tree, but in the worst case we'll have two branches on every single position in this tree, meaning the worst case time complexity is going to be 2 to the power of some variable. What's the height of this tree going to be? What's the maximum possible height? Well, in the case where we're branching two times, we're only incrementing one of these two pointers. So how many total times can we increment these two pointers? Well, of course, it's going to be the total length of the two strings combined. So let's say the length of the first string is n and the length of the second string is m. We would say that the time complexity here is going to be 2 to the power of n plus m. That's going to be the time complexity. The memory complexity is going to be n plus m. That's because it's the height of the tree, and that's going to be the height of the recursive call stack. So now let's move on to the code. It's not super complicated, but admittedly, it would be difficult to come up with if this is your first time seeing this problem and this type of pattern. So this is the recursive solution, the most brute force solution. The code is not super complicated. We're given two strings and we also have a helper function. The reason we have a helper function is so we can keep track of the indexes of each string. Instead of doing that, we could have actually passed a substring into each recursive call. So, you know, for example, if our I pointer was over here, we could have passed this substring instead of passing the entire string, but that creates extra memory. So it's easier to just pass the index that we're at. So if we're at the beginning of each string, we would pass zero, zero. That's what the original problem is. And then we break it up into sub problems as we increment our pointers, of course. The base case, what we talked about, is when we reach the end of either of the strings. If that's the case, we know that the longest common subsequence is going to be zero. But if that's not the case, we know that there's two possibilities. These two characters are equal, in which case we would return one. We're getting that one from these two characters being equal because then the LCS becomes one. At the very least, it's one. And we add to it the LCS of the remainder of the two strings. We get that by taking I plus one, moving it to the next position, and I plus two an I2 plus one, which is the second pointer, and moving it to the next position. So this becomes the sub problem. The overall result is gonna be one plus the result of the sub problem. But if the two characters are not equal, which would occur when we get to the second position, then we 
don't know what the solution is. We don't even know if it includes this character or if it includes this character or it might not include either of these characters. So what we do is we try shifting one of the pointers. So we try shifting I by one and seeing maybe the LCS of these two will give us the result. Or we try shifting the other pointer over here and say that maybe these two will give us the result. You might be thinking, what about the third case where we have to possibly uh, shift both of the pointers and maybe these two will give us the result? Well, believe it or not, that case is already handled for us because of the way recursion works. For example, when we only shift the first pointer to this position over here, then we're going to compare these two characters. We're going to see that they're not equal. So what we're going to do is try shifting the first pointer, which would give us this subproblem, and we'll also try shifting the second pointer, which would give us this subproblem. So you can see that all possible subproblems are uh, enumerated basically by just handling these two cases because we know recursively those two cases are going to keep on running as long as we have unequal characters. So this is the idea, and you can see that which variables are changing. The, another reason why instead of passing in substrings, we pass in indices is because we can see exactly what's changing here. We can see that we're moving to different positions of each string. We calculated that the size of the tree, the number of times this recursive function is going to run, is in the worst case two to the power of n plus m because there might be a lot of repeated work in that tree as I kind of talked about. But we know that all possible values that could be passed into this function, like all possible combinations that could be passed, well, we know the two strings are not changing, but we know the indices that we're at are changing. So all possibilities for i1 is basically the length of the first string, which is n. All possibilities for i2 is the length of the second string, which which is M. Multiply those together gives us all possible combinations this could be called with. That's why we can apply caching to this input, because if we calculate the result of this function call once for a certain set of given parameters, maybe 0, 0, or maybe 0, 1, then we don't have to redo all the work, because redoing the work might mean recursive calls. So if we can eliminate that repeated work, then this can be our overall time complexity. Now, once you get pretty familiar with dynamic programming and memoization, you usually don't even need to think that far. Like what I just talked about, you don't really, you don't always need to go through that entire thought process. But as a beginner, I would recommend thinking about it that way. But usually what I do is I just turn my brain off. I just write the DFS solution, the recursive solution. I see which variables are changing. And then I just apply caching to those variables. Usually it's one or two variables. Three variables that are changing is pretty rare for dynamic programming. Those problems can get more difficult those are three-dimensional dynamic programming problems. Usually two dimensions is enough. If you notice you have more than two dimensions, it might be that you're not calculating the brute force solution as efficiently as you could be. So now let's take a look at the caching solution. The good thing about memoization is you can kind of turn your brain off and just apply the same pattern that you usually do, which is create a cache that's of the size of the problem space. We talked about ours is n times m. So I'm basically creating a two dimensional array of that size, m columns and n rows in this case. This is how you do it in Python, but I think most languages you can actually do it more easily. And we call our memoization helper. We pass in the exact same parameters, but this time we're passing in the cache. So we have the same first base case. If we go out of bounds, then we're going to return zero. It's important to put this base case before you put the cache base case, because if we go out of bounds, we want to check that before we try indexing our two dimensional array, because we don't want an index out of bounds error when we try to access this two dimensional array. But if we're not out of bounds, then we're going to check have we already computed the result and put it in our cache. We will know that because we initialized our cache with a negative one. We know negative one is nonsensical in this case. The longest common subsequence between two strings can't be negative one. So we know it's a pretty good default value to use here. So if the value here is not negative one, that means we must have computed it already, in which case we would return that value. We don't need to do these recursive calls. But if we didn't compute it, then we do have to uh, do the recursive calls and we would handle them the exact same way we did with the DFS, passing in the same parameters, except this time we're passing in the cache, of course, into the recursive calls. 
but when we get the result, we're not immediately returning it. We're actually storing it in our cache so that next time we call this function with the exact same parameters, we don't have to do this work again. We can go straight to the value in our cache and then return that. And if I was doing this in a real interview, I would hope that this solution is enough for the interviewer. But if it's not, we pretty much have enough information here to go to the true dynamic programming solution. Because we know the size of our solution space, it's gonna be a two dimensional grid, the dimensions of the two strings, and most importantly, we have these two formulas here. We know when we reach two characters that are equal, the problem becomes one plus the sub problem where we increment both of the pointers. The other uh, case is if the two characters are not equal, then we have to calculate the max of these two sub problems. These equations are the basis of the true dynamic programming solution that we're going to talk about. Though there can be a few more edge cases, which I think can be really confusing. That's why drawing out the grid is really helpful. That's what I'm going to show you. So we have our familiar two dimensional grid. Once again, the dimensions, well, the rows are going to be the number of characters characters in the first string. So we'll have a row for each character, A, D, C, B, and we'll have a column for each character in the second string. In this case, it actually doesn't matter which string we make the row and which string we make the column. You can honestly know that without knowing much about the solution, just by knowing that we're given two strings. We don't necessarily know anything about the two strings, so we can't necessarily know which one to put in the row and which one to put in the column. But there is a slight optimization we can make that we'll talk about later on. But for now, just understanding this solution is complicated, actually. Even though the code is quite short, that doesn't mean it's simple to understand. So you can see that in this case, I'm actually initializing the two dimensional grid with M plus one columns and N plus one rows. So actually we have an extra row and extra column. Now every value in the grid itself is gonna be zero. So we can think of that extra row being over here and it's all zeros essentially. And we have an extra column. We can think of that as being all zeros as well. And you know, we have this corner uh, value as well. Why are our dimensions longer than they need to be? Well, it has to do with how we're going to have to handle some of these edge cases. If we didn't have these extra rows and extra columns, this is the general idea of how the algorithm would work. For this position, for example, we are comparing these two characters, these two C's with each other. They are equal to each other. And what we would want to put in this position is comparing the LCS between these two strings. So we're comparing these characters first so we see that they are equal. So the value we would put here is one plus the result of the sub problem. The sub problem would be the LCS between these two strings. Where would the value be in that case? Well, the value, if we're computing from top left to bottom right, that value should already be computed. It should be stored in this position over here. So to get that value, we're simply going to look top left. And that's perfectly fine when you do it from this position. But when you try doing it from the top left position here, where we're just comparing these two characters, they're equal. So we say that the value we're going to put here is going to be one plus the value top left. Then we would end up going out of bounds. So that's why we have these extra dimensions so that we don't get an out of bounds error. Technically, you don't need that. You could add some extra if conditions to check if we go out of bounds, but that makes the code a bit more messy. So most people prefer writing it this way. It's definitely not super simple to figure this kind of stuff out, this type of optimization, especially when you're new to dynamic programming. But I want to mention it because this is how most people will write these solutions. Also, you might be wondering when we're comparing two substrings and then we're looking at the sub problem, in this case, we're going backwards. We're taking our, you know, I pointer and decrementing it and our, our pointer from here and then decrementing it. But when we were doing the recursive solution, we were actually doing it the opposite way. We were incrementing our pointers to get the result of the sub problem. Well, you could do it that way as well with the dynamic programming solution. But to do that, you would have to compute it from bottom right to top left. So that would basically be iterating through these loops in reverse order. I've done solutions like that. 
before and that's kind of how I prefer it because it's more similar to the memoization solution. So from this position, you would need to go to bottom right instead. So instead of having our extra row and column be here, we would actually have that extra row and column be in the opposite position, which is perfectly fine. But I think most people prefer going from top left to bottom right. So that's why we're doing it this way. Also, if we have our characters basically offset by one, so normally to look at the first character, we would have our eye pointer be at index zero over here, but now we actually have it in the one position and same thing with the columns. So when we're actually reading the characters, we know that the characters are stored in these two strings starting from index zero. So when we actually read the characters, we're going to be using I and J, basically our iterators, which are starting at index zero. That's perfectly fine. But when we're accessing this grid, which I've named DP, when we access the grid and we're storing the value, for example, here, we're storing the LCS between these two substrings, we want to offset it by one. If we're at the second character, we know that this D and B are at index one in the input strings, but when we access the DP grid to store the value here, we're gonna add one to DP and we're gonna add a one in basically both the row and the column. And we're gonna do that here as well. And when we wanna access, uh, you know, read values, if we're trying to compute the value here and we're, and this is I plus one and J plus one, then to get the top left value is going to be I without the plus one and J without the plus one. This is also something that's pretty abstract and confusing, especially when you don't have a picture to kind of visualize it. When you get good enough and you practice this enough and you draw pictures enough, these kind of diagrams are kind of embedded in your head so that you don't need pen and paper to practice with it. But it takes a while to get to that point, which is why I really encourage drawing this type of stuff out. It's really hard to visualize this in your head if you've never seen what it looks like on pen and paper before. But other than that, we will basically have our same DP solution. We'll go uh, top left to bottom right. We'll compare these two characters. They are equal in this case, so we'll execute the first case. Uh, where our result will be one plus the top left value. So the value that goes here will be one here. It'll be similar, but these two characters are not equal. So we're going to get the maximum of the value to the left and the maximum of the value above. We're saying that from this problem, we're gonna look at the subproblem that's this, where we skip the B character, or we're gonna look at the subproblem where we skip the A character and have this substring. We know that the LCS of this is one, so the value we're gonna put here is one. And same thing would happen over here. The LCS here would be one. Then moving on to this position, these two characters are not equal, so we would look to the left and look up, so the value uh, the maximum of those two is going to be one because remember that's what we're doing we're taking the maximum of these two same thing over here these characters are not equal so we would look left or look up take the max of both of them well it's going to be one either way same thing over here it's going to be one over here same exact thing it's going to be one because these two characters are not equal same thing over here these characters are not equal either here we finally get to a couple characters that are equal the result here would be one plus the value that's to the top left. Because if we know these two characters are equal, then we want to look at the sub problem AD and AB. What's the LCS between these two strings? Well, good thing we've already computed that and we put it over here. So the value that goes here is going to be two. Here, we're going to compare A and B. They're not equal. We're going to look left and we're going to look up. The max is one. Here, these two characters, B, are actually equal. So we're going to take one plus the value to the top left and we're going to get a two over here. Now, finally, for the result value, we're going to have B and C. They're not equal. So we're going to look left and look up, take the max of those two. It's two. So we put a two here. So this tells us the LCS between these two strings is going to be two. So that's what we're going to return here. Now, an optimization that you might have noticed is if in the worst case, we're only looking one row up or one row to the left or maybe top left, do we really need to have the entire grid in memory? Basically, by the time we get to the second row, we don't need this row in memory anymore. By the time we get to this row, we don't need this row in memory anymore. We just need two rows in memory at a time because the current row that we're computing, we only need to look at the previous row. We never need to look two rows back or three rows back or anything like that. So we can optimize this to actually 
uh, instead of the memory complexity, instead of being n times m, it can just be big O of n, or we could actually make it big O of m. We can basically choose which one of these dimensions we want to use. Since it doesn't really make a difference which orientation we put this grid, we can do it either way. So taking the most optimized solution, it would be pretty similar to the previous solution we were looking at, but in this case, we're gonna have at most two uh, rows at a time. So we're gonna have our initial DP row, that's gonna basically be all zeros. It's gonna be M plus one though, so we are still gonna have that dummy value uh, in the zeroth position. Then we're going to basically iterate over the array, same as we did before. We're gonna have our current row. So in this case, we would have this row allocated in memory. We're gonna go value by value, computing the value that goes in each position, same as we did before. But uh, after we're done computing this row, for example, we would then initialize DP to be over here. This would go out of memory and our current row would be over here. So then we would have these two rows in memory. And then of course our DP would be shifted to down here. This would go out of memory. Then we'd have these two in memory and we'd basically keep going like that until we finally compute the last row, in which case we would return the last value of the last row. So in this case, we kind of lucked out because if we only have uh, one or two rows in memory at a time, we would prefer to choose the string that has a smaller size and then use that as our row. In this case, we kind of lucked out the way we did it we ended up choosing the string with a smaller size. So since I'm choosing, since with this code, I'm choosing the second string every time, this is our space complexity. But we could intelligently pick the string that has a smaller length and then use that as our row. I think it's a pretty small optimization. Most likely you wouldn't be required to do that in an interview, but that would change the memory complexity from being by picking an arbitrary length of one of the two strings. It would actually be the minimum of the length of those two strings. So the minimum of N and M in this case. Try to figure out how you could modify this code to get that solution. There's a pretty elegant way to do it actually, though it's difficult to come up with, so you might be able to come up with a more traditional approach, but feel free to post about this on the Discord if you're curious. Even though this problem is difficult, the good thing is if you can solve this problem, there's several other problems that are almost exactly the same that you'll also be able to solve. Next, let's talk about palindromes. Palindrome problems can sometimes be efficiently solved with dynamic programming, but they don't usually follow the same pattern of a brute force recursive DFS solution and then memoization and then dynamic programming. They usually don't follow this pattern, but it's still technically dynamic programming. I'll talk about why later on, but I think a lot of people get confused with, does this actually count as dynamic programming? Some people think it doesn't. I would encourage you not to get too caught up in the technicalities and all that, mainly focus on the concepts. Suppose we're given a string S like this one, for example, and we want to return the length of the longest palindromic substring within S. First of all, let's recall what is a palindromic string in the first place. Well, it's a string that once you reverse it, it's the same backwards. For example, ABA, when you reverse it, ABA, it's the same exact string. Same thing with race car. When you reverse it, the characters read backwards are the same. So another way to, instead of reversing the entire string, another way to determine that would be two pointers. If the first and last characters are the same, then we'll look at the next characters, the inner characters. These two are also the same. And then we keep doing that until we finally reach in the middle and if we do end up reaching in the middle, then we know that the string is a substring because instead of reversing the entire string, we actually just compared the first half of the string with the second half of the string. If they're equal, then it is a palindrome. That means if we reversed them, they would be the same. So it might be your first instinct to come up with a brute force solution of this problem. And you probably wouldn't think of doing it recursively because actually there's a better way to do it than you know the, the typical exponential solution that we get with when we try like decision trees, because we don't even need to go that far this time. The brute force solution for this problem is actually a big O of N cubed solution. Let me show you what that is. To find the longest palindromic substring, why don't we just take every single substring? So for example, every substring starting at the first character, that would be this substring, that would be this substring, this substring, and keep 
going like that. So basically there are n substrings starting at this uh, character. We can do that for every single character in the input. So you know this substring, this substring, this substring, etc. So there are in this case n minus one, but let's just round it to n substrings starting at this uh, character as well. And we'll do that for every single character in the input. So if we have n characters, how many substrings do we have? Well, we'll have n squared substrings. So if that's how many substrings we have, shouldn't that be the big O time complexity of finding the longest palindromic substring? Not quite, because this is how many substrings we have, but the algorithm that we talked about earlier for determining if each of these substrings is a palindrome or not is going to require that two-pointer technique we talked about. At least that's the easiest way to do it. So we would start at the end and then work our way inward for every single substring. Now, every substring is going to be a variable length. Like we're going to have uh, for every substring starting here, one is going to be of length one. Another one is going to be of length two, of length three, et cetera, et cetera. But we know that the largest one is going to be roughly n. So in terms of big O time complexity, we assume that an arbitrary substring that we look at is going to have length n. Technically, it could have n divided by two or four or something, but n is a variable in that equation. So that's what we care about. So if this is how many substrings we have, and to find the length of every single substring is n, then the overall time complexity is going to be n cubed to determine the length of the longest uh, palindromic substring. Now, n cubed is not bad, but the question is, can we do better? And the answer is yes. But first, let's analyze how we're solving the problem currently. We're looking for palindromes, but when we start at the character A, we just have a single character. Usually, a single character is pretty much always a palindrome, right? Because if you take a single character and then reverse it, it's the exact same. That's always going to be the case. Now we add a second character here. To check if this is a palindrome, we'll simply compare these two characters if they're equal or not. That's pretty easy. But next, when we add a third character, it starts to get more interesting. Now, we already know whether this substring, these first two characters, whether this makes up a palindrome or not. We already know that. But now, when we try to ask if this substring is a palindrome, we have to start from scratch. Like, this knowing this did not help us at all in determining this entire substring. We still have to do the two-pointer technique and potentially iterate through the entire substring. And then when we add a fourth character, same thing. Whether we know if this or this or this is a palindrome, it doesn't matter. When we get to this substring of four characters, we have to start from scratch, do the two-pointers, and potentially go through the entire substring. Dynamic programming is all about solving sub-problems in an efficient way where we don't have to do repeated work, where the solution of the subproblem will make it easier to solve a bigger problem. But when we solve this problem in the brute force way, the subproblem does not help at all in solving the bigger problem, at least not in the order that we are doing it. Because we know with palindromes, if you have a string, you use two pointers to determine if it's a palindrome. That's like the intuitive way to do it. So if the outermost characters are equal, in this case they're not, but if they were equal, then what becomes the subproblem? If we want to know if this string is a palindrome or not, and it turns out that the two outermost characters are indeed equal, then tell me what becomes the subproblem to figure out if the entire string is equal? Well, simply we ask, is the inner string not including the outer characters that we already know are equal? Is the inner string a palindrome? Because if we know that that this is a palindrome and the outermost characters are equal, then we know the entire string is a palindrome. So this is the subproblem essentially. So how does that information help us? Well, first of all, we know that solving subproblems first before solving bigger problems is better. So if we wanted to know if this entire string is a palindrome, we should solve the subproblem first. In this case, this entire string is an odd length string. It has five characters, that's an odd number. So we should start in the middle, so the middlemost character. And of course we know that's always going to be a palindrome, it's a single character. And then we should start expanding outwards. We know to check if a single string is a palindrome, we usually start at the edges and then work our way inward just because that's more intuitive. But in the context of this problem, if we want to solve the subproblems first, 
then we should start expanding outward. And that's what we're going to do. So in this case, now we would have pointers at this character and this character. If these two are equal, then we're going to continue expanding until we find the longest palindromic substring. In this case, these two characters are not equal. A and B are not equal. Okay, so the longest palindromic substring we found was just this character. But that's definitely not the longest palindromic substring. So what did we do wrong? Well, we only expanded from this character. And what that's going to do is it's only going to give us palindromic substrings where this is the middle character. So that would identify this substring for us. It would also identify this substring for us. And it would also identify this substring for us. But what about this substring or this substring or this substring? It definitely would not identify those. So what should we do now? Well, first of all, let's go through every single character in the string S. But instead of expanding it like this, how we did where we just add a character to the right to find a new substring, how about we expand from the middle in both directions? Like if we want to find the longest palindromic substring where this is the middle character. Well, that's a pretty simple thing because it doesn't have any characters on the left side. So if we take a two pointer approach and we have a left and right pointer at this character and we start expanding outward, we're going to get out of bounds pretty quickly. When you get out of bounds, that's pretty much how you know that we have found the longest palindromic substring. For this character, the longest palindromic substring where this is the middle character is of length one. And then we can try that with every single character in the string S. So for B, we would start at B and then expand outward. So we would compare these two characters, our left pointer would be here, our right pointer would be here, A and A are equal. So first we had a substring of length one. Now that these two characters are equal, we have a substring of length three. So then we try expanding outward again. Our left pointer will be out of bounds. Our right pointer would be here. But when you go out of bounds, if either of these goes out of bounds, then we know we can't really expand anymore. So the longest palindromic substring here was three. That's our longest so far. So we would normally keep track of that. Then do the same thing over here. Here, start at A. I have a left and right pointer over here. They These characters are not equal. So at this point, we don't even need to keep expanding outward because we know for sure if this is not a palindrome, how can it be possible that this is a palindrome? Because the su if the subproblem isn't even a palindrome, then the larger string cannot possibly be a palindrome. Then we would move to this position, left and right pointers here, same thing. These two characters are not equal. So this cannot be a palindrome. And then same thing over here. We'll have a left pointer here, right pointer is here, it's out of bounds, so we can't really expand any more there. So the longest palindromic substring we found was of length three, but hold on, I see one over here that's length four. So what did we do wrong? There's one last tricky thing that you might forget about. As we were starting at individual characters, we had substrings of length one, and then we expanded outward. So we essentially added a character to both sides every time. So we increased this substring of length two every single time. But if you start with a substring of length one and keep adding two to it, that, that total number is always gonna be odd. So basically we found the longest palindromic substring of odd length, but that's not what we wanted. We wanted the longest total whether it's odd or even. So how do we do that? Can we apply the same pattern that I've been talking about, like expanding outwards from a substring? Yes, we can. The easiest way to do it is same thing. For every character in the string, iterate through it. But instead of just starting at a single character, we would uh, have, our, have a pointer here, but we would start at this substring. This would be our base substring. So we'd have a left pointer here and a right pointer here. We'd check, are these two equal? Nope. So there's no need to expand outward anymore. And not only that, but this itself was not a palindrome either. So we can't say that two is a palindrome. This was not a palindrome. So we would say that the longest palindromic substring, I guess you could say starting here in the middle between these two characters was of length zero. Then we try that over here. So starting at these two characters, are they equal? Nope. Then we would try it over here. Are these two equal? Yep. So then we would take our left and right pointers, expand them outward. Our left pointer would be here, right pointer here. Are these two characters equal? Yep. 
So, so far, our longest palindromic substring is of length four. So we try to expand outward again. Our left pointer would be here, right pointer here. Well, it's out of bounds. So can't really do anything anymore. That was the longest palindromic substring we found so far. Now let's try expanding from these two characters. Well, they're not equal in the first place, so can't do anything there. The result in this case we would return is the length. Remember, that's what we care about. So we would return four as the longest palindromic substring. So this can definitely be tricky to come up with, though I think it's not crazy difficult. It's definitely possible to reason about it yourself, but I think it's important to learn this before you start interviews because this can actually be a pretty common pattern that comes up and it doesn't follow the traditional path of most dynamic programming problems. And once you know this sort of trick that I'm talking about, an efficient way to find palindromic substrings, it's a pattern that you can apply to a few different problems. And pretty much once you know the pattern, those problems become a lot easier. So now let's take a look at the code. And by the way, we went through every single character individually first, and then we potentially for that character expanded outwards, maybe for the entire length of the string. So going through every single character is n, expanding about that character is n squared. And we technically did it twice because we did it for an individual character and then we did it for every adjacent pair of characters. So you could say that the total time complexity of this solution is two times n squared, but we know that's definitely more efficient than n cubed. So solving subproblems in an intelligent way can definitely speed up the runtime of our function. Now for the code, given a string s, we initialize the length of the longest palindromic substring as zero. We go through every character in the substring. So zero, one, two, three, four. We know that we kind of have to take a two-phased approach. We have to find the longest palindromic substring of odd length. So if we were at index zero, we would initialize our left and right pointers at this character. And while these two pointers are in bounds, so while left is greater than or equal to zero, and while the right pointer has not gone you know, out of bounds in this direction, and while those two characters are equal that the pointers are pointing at, initially it's just one character, so we know that this, of course, is a palindrome, we're gonna keep uh, expanding our two pointers. So that's this code over here. But, we're, but we also wanna keep track of the longest that we have found so far. So if we see that the length of our current substring is longer than the longest palindromic substring, then we would reassign this. You could also rewrite this code to call max instead. That would probably condense two lines into a single line, but I don't think that's a huge deal or anything. Now, while we're still at index zero, let's also compute the longest substrings of even length, but we know we have to start with an adjacent pair in that case. So we would basically say that we're at this index. We know our I pointer is at this index. So we would initialize our left pointer here, but we would also initialize our right pointer to left plus one, so I plus one, so our right pointer would be here, so we'd start at this adjacent pair, and then we would basically run the exact same loop over here. So you can see we have some duplicate code, like these two blocks are duplicates. In my opinion, in a real interview, I don't think this would be a huge deal because it's not a lot of code anyway, but if you want, you definitely can write a helper function that would eliminate this duplication. But overall, that's how things are gonna go. We're gonna do the same thing at index one, index two, index three. When we get to index four and we try to expand for odd length substrings, we know, of course, we're gonna go out of bounds pretty much immediately. And then we're gonna try the same thing for even length substrings. We're gonna have our left pointer here and our right pointer is gonna be initialized over here. And then immediately the loop is not gonna execute because our right pointer is already out of bounds. So we wouldn't execute that. And at that point, we've gone through every index, and then we can go ahead and return the longest length that we computed. And in case you were interested, this is one way you could rewrite that code to use a helper function. So this is essentially uh, taking that loop, copy and pasting it here, and uh, you know keeping track of a max length, and then returning that max length. Uh, we would call that for odd length by just passing in the left and right pointers would be the same initial index. And for even length, the left pointer would be i, the right pointer would be i plus one. So pretty much the exact same code. You can see we didn't really save a lot of code anyway. That's why I don't think it's a huge deal to even write a helper function in this case, but it's up to you. Maybe it's something you could ask your interviewer about if they wanted you to do that or not.